Note and Preface to the Excursion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Note and Preface to the Excursion by William Wordsworth Something must now be said of this poem, but chiefly, as has been done through the whole of these notes, with reference to my personal friends, and especially to her who has perseveringly taken them down from my dictation. Towards the close of the first book stand the lines that were first written, beginning nine tedious years and ending last human tenant of these ruined walls. These were composed in 95 at Racedown, and for several passages describing the employment and demeanor of Margaret during her affliction, I was indebted to observations made in Dorsetshire, and afterwards at Alfoxden and Somersetshire, where I recited in 97 and 98. The lines towards the conclusion of the fourth book, beginning, For the man who in his spirit, to the words intellectual soul, were in order of time composed the next, either at Racedown or Alfoxden, I do not remember which. The rest of the poem was written in the Vale of Grasmere, chiefly during our residence at Allen Bank. The long poem on my own education was, together with many minor poems, composed while we lived at the cottage at Town End. Perhaps my purpose of giving an additional interest to these my poems, in the eyes of my nearest and dearest friends, may be promoted by saying a few words upon the character of the wanderer, the solitary, and the pastor, and some other of the persons introduced. And first of the principal one, the wanderer, my lamented friend Southey, for this is written a month after his decease, used to say that had he been born a papist, the course of life which would in all probability have been his was the one for which he was most fitted and most to his mind, that of a Benedictine monk in a convent, furnished as many once were and some still are with an inexhaustible library. Books, as appears from many passages in his writings, and as was evident to those who had opportunities of observing his daily life, were in fact his passion, and wandering, I can with truth affirm, was mine. But this propensity in me was happily counteracted by inability from want of fortune to fulfill my wishes. But had I been born in a class which would have deprived me of what is called a liberal education, it is not unlikely that, being strong in body, I should have taken to a way of life such as that in which my peddler passed the greater part of his days. At all events, I am here called upon freely to acknowledge that the character I have represented in his person is chiefly an idea of what I fancied my own character might have become in his circumstances. Nevertheless, much of what he says and does had an external existence that fell under my own youthful and subsequent observation. An individual named Patrick, by birth and education a Scotchman, followed this humble occupation for many years and afterwards settled in the town of Kendal. He married a kinswoman of my wife's, and her sister Sarah was brought up from her ninth year under this good man's roof. My own imaginations I was happy to find clothed in reality, and fresh ones suggested by what she reported of this man's tenderness of heart, his strong and pure imagination, and his solid attainments in literature, chiefly religious, whether in prose or verse. At Hawkshead also, while I was a schoolboy, there occasionally resided a pack-man, the name then generally given to persons of this calling, with whom I had frequent conversations upon what had befallen him and what he had observed during his wandering life. And as was natural, we took much to each other, and upon the subject of peddlerism in general, as then followed, and its favorableness to an intimate knowledge of human concerns, not merely among the humbler classes of society, I need say nothing here in addition to what is to be found in the excursion and a note attached to it. Now for the solitary. Of him I have much less to say. Not long after we took up our abode at Grasmere, came to reside there, from what motive I either never knew or have forgotten, a Scotchman a little past the middle of life, who had for many years been chaplain to a Highland regiment. He was in no respect, as far as I know, an interesting character, though in his appearance there was a good deal that attracted attention, as if he had been shattered in fortune and not happy in mind. Of his quondam position I availed myself to connect with the wanderer also a Scotchman, a character suitable to my purpose, the elements of which I drew from several persons with whom I had been connected, and who fell under my observation during frequent residences in London at the beginning of the French Revolution. 
The chief of these was, one may now say, a Mr. Fawcett, a preacher at a dissenting meeting-house at the Old Jewry. It happened to me several times to be one of his congregation through my connection with Mr. Nicholson of Cat Eaton Street, who at that time, when I had not many acquaintances in London, used often to invite me to dine with him on Sundays, and I took that opportunity, Mr. N. being a dissenter, of going to hear Fawcett, who was an able and eloquent man. He published a poem on war, which had a good deal of merit, and made me think more about him than I should otherwise have done. But his Christianity was probably never very deeply rooted, and like many others in those times of like showy talents, he had not strength of character with, to withstand the effects of the French Revolution, and of the wild and lax opinions which had done so much towards producing it, and far more in carrying it forward in its extremes. Poor Fawcett, I have been told, became pretty much such a person as I have described, and early disappeared from the stage, having fallen into habits of intemperance, which I have heard, though I will not answer for the fact, hastened his death. Of him I need say no more. There were many like him at that time, which the world will never be without, but which were more numerous then for reasons too obvious to be dwelt upon. To what is said of the pastor in the poem I have little to add, but what may be deemed superfluous. It has ever appeared to me highly favorable to the beneficial influence of the Church of England upon all gradations and classes of society, that the patronage of its benefices is in numerous instances attached to the estates of noble families of ancient gentry, and accordingly I am gratified by the opportunity afforded me in the excursion to portray the character of a country clergyman of more than ordinary talents, born and bred in the upper ranks of society so as to partake of their refinements, and at the same time brought by his pastoral office and his love of rural life into intimate connection with the peasantry of his native district. To illustrate the relation which in my mind this pastor bore to the wanderer, and the resemblance between them, or rather the points of community in their nature, I likened one to an oak and the other to a sycamore. And having here referred to this comparison, I need only add, I had no one individual in my mind, wishing rather to embody this idea than to break in upon the simplicity of it by traits of individual character or of any peculiarity of opinion. And now for a few words upon the scene where these interviews and conversations are supposed to occur. The scene of the first book of the poem is, I must own, laid in attractive country not sufficiently near to that which soon comes into view in the second book to agree with the fact. All that relates to Margaret and the ruined cottage, etc., was taken from observations made in the southwest of England, and certainly it would require more than seven league boots to stretch in one morning from a common in Somer Somersetshire or Dorsetshire to the heights of Furnace Fells and the deep valleys they embosom. For thus dealing with space I need make, I trust, no apology, but my friends may be amused by the truth. In the poem I suppose that the peddler and I ascended from a plain country up the Vale of Langdale, and struck off a good way above the chapel to the western side of the Vale. We ascended the hill and thence looked down upon the circular recess in which lies Blee Tarn, chosen by the solitary for his retreat. After we quit his cottage, passing over a low ridge, we descend into another vale, that of Little Langdale, towards the head of which stands, embowered or partly shaded by yews or other trees, something between a cottage and a mansion or gentleman's house, such as they once were in this country. This I convert into the parsonage, and at the same time, and as by the waving of a magic wand, I turn the comparatively confined vale of Langdale, its tarn, and the rude chapel which once adorned the valley, into the stately and comparatively spacious vale of Grasmere, its lake, and its ancient parish church. And upon the side of Luffrig Fell, at the foot of the lake, and looking down upon it and the whole vale and its encompassing mountains, the pastor is supposed by me to stand, when at sunset he addresses his companions in words which I hope my readers will remember, or I should not have taken the trouble of giving so much in detail the materials on which my mind actually worked. Now for a few particulars of fact respecting the persons whose stories are told or characters are described by the different speakers. To Margaret I have already alluded. I will add here that the lines beginning, She was a woman of a steady mind, faithfully delineate, as far as they go, the character possessed in common by many women whom it has been my happiness to know in humble life, 
and that several of the most touching things which she is represented as saying and doing are taken from actual observation of the distresses and trials under which different persons were suffering, some of them strangers to me and others daily under my notice. I was born too late to have a distinct remembrance of the origin of the American War, but the state in which I represent Robert's mind to be, I had frequent opportunities of observing, at the commencement of our rupture with France in 93, opportunities of which I availed myself in the story of the female vagrant as told in the poem on guilt and sorrow. The account given by the solitary towards the close of the second book, in all that belongs to the character of the old man, was taken from a Grasmere pauper, who was boarded in the last house, quitting the vale on the road to Ambleside. The character of his hostess and all that befell that poor man upon the mountain belonged to Patterdale. The woman I know well, her name was J, and she was exactly such a person as I describe. The ruins of the old chapel, among which the man was found lying, may yet be traced, and stood upon the ridge that divides Patterdale from Boredale and Martindale, having been placed there for the convenience of both districts. The glorious appearance disclosed above and among the mountains was described partly from what my friend Mr. Luff, who then lived in Patterdale, witnessed upon that melancholy occasion, and partly from what Mrs. Wordsworth and I had seen in company with Sir George and Lady Beaumont above Hartshope Hall on our way from Patterdale to Ambleside. And now for a few words upon the church its monuments, and the deceased who are spoken of as lying in the surrounding churchyard. But first for the one picture given by the pastor and the wanderer of the living. In this nothing is introduced but what was taken from nature in real life. The cottage is called Hackett, and stands as described on the southern extremity of the ridge which separates the two Langdales. The pair who inhabited it were called Jonathan and Betty Udale. Once when our children were ill, of whooping cough, I think, we took them for change of air to this cottage, and were in the habit of going there to drink tea upon fine summer afternoons, so that we became intimately acquainted with the characters, habits, and lives of these good, and let me say, in the main, wise people. The matron had, in her early youth, been a servant in a house at Hawkshead, where several boys boarded, while I was a schoolboy there. I did not remember her as having served in that capacity, but we had many little anecdotes to tell to each other of remarkable boys, incidents and adventures which had made a noise in their day in that small town. These two persons afterwards settled at Rydal, where they both died. The church, as already noticed, is that of Grasmere. The interior of it has been improved lately, made warmer by underdrawing the roof and raising the floor, but the rude and antique majesty of its former appearance has been impaired by painting the rafters, and the oak benches with a simple rail at the back dividing them from each other have given way to seats that have more the appearance of pews. It is remarkable that, excepting only the pew belonging to Rydal Hall, that to Rydal Mount, the one to the parsonage, and I believe another, the men and women still continue, as used to be the custom in Wales, to sit separate from each other. Is this practice as old as the Reformation, and when and how did it originate? In the Jewish synagogues and in Lady Huntingdon's chapels, the sexes are divided in the same way. In the adjoining churchyard, greater changes have taken place. It is now not a little crowded with tombstones, and near the schoolhouse which stands in the churchyard is an ugly structure built to receive the hearse, which has recently come into use. It would not be worth while to allude to this building or the hearse vehicle it contains, but the, the latter has been the means of introducing a change much to be lamented in the mode of conducting funerals among the mountains. Now the coffin is lodged in the hearse at the door of the house of the deceased, and the corpse is so conveyed to the churchyard gate. All the solemnity which formerly attended its progress, as described in the poem, is put an end to. So much do I regret this, that I beg to be excused for giving utterance here to a wish that, should it befall me to die at Rydal Mount, my own body may be carried to Grasmere Church after the manner in which, till lately, that of every one was born to that place of sepulture, namely on the shoulders of neighbors, no house being passed without some words of a funeral psalm being sung at the time by the attendants. When I put into the mouth of the wanderer, many precious rites and customs of our rural ancestry are gone or stealing from us. This, I hope, will last forever. And what follows, 
little did I foresee that the observance and mode of proceeding, which had often affected me so much, would soon be superseded. Having said much of the injury done to this churchyard, let me add that one is at liberty to look forward to a time when, by the growth of the yew trees thriving there, a solemnity will be spread over the place that will in some degree make amends for the old simple character which has already been so much encroached upon, and will be still more every year. I will here set down, more at length, what has been mentioned in a previous note, that my friend Sir George Beaumont, having long ago purchased the beautiful piece of water called Luffrig Tarn, on the banks of which he intended to build, I told him that a person in Kendal who was attached to the place wished to purchase it. Sir George, finding the possession of no use to him, consented to part with it, and placed the purchase money, twenty pounds, at my disposal for any local use which I thought proper. Accordingly, I resolved to plant yew trees in the churchyard, and had four pretty strong large oak enclosures made, in each of which was planted under my own eye, and principally, if not entirely by my own hand, two young trees, with the attention of leaving the one that throve best to stand. Many years after, Mr. Barber, who will long be remembered in Grasmere, Mr. Greenwood, the chief landed proprietor, and myself, had four other enclosures made in the churchyard at our own expense, in each of which was planted a tree taken from its neighbor, and they all stand thriving admirably, the fences having been removed as no longer necessary. May the trees be taken care of hereafter when we are all gone, and some of them will perhaps at some far distant time rival in majesty the yew of Lorton, and those which I have described as growing in Borrowdale, where they are still to be seen in grand assemblage. And now for the persons that are selected as lying in the churchyard but first for the individual whose grave is prepared to receive him. His story is here truly related. He was a schoolfellow of mine for some years. He came to us when he was at least seventeen years of age, very tall, robust, and full-grown. This prevented him from falling into the amusements and games of the school. Consequently, he gave more time to books. He was not remarkably bright or quick, but by industry he made a progress more than respectable. His parents, not being wealthy enough to send him to college, when he left Hawkshead, he became a schoolmaster, with a view to prepare himself for holy orders. About this time he fell in love, as related in the poem, and everything followed as there described, except that I do not know when and where he died. The number of youths that came to Hawkshead School from the families of the humble yeomanry, to be educated to a certain degree of scholarship as a preparation for the church, was considerable, and the fortunes of these persons in after life various, of course, and of some not a little remarkable. I have now one of this class in my eye, who became an usher in a preparatory school and ended in making a large fortune. His manners when he came to Hawkshead were as uncouth as well could be, but he had good abilities, with skill to turn them to account, and when the master of the school to which he was usher died, he stepped into his place and became proprietor of the establishment. He contrived to manage it with such address, and so much to the taste of what is called high society in the fashionable world, that no school of the kind, even till he retired, was in such high request. Ministers of state, the wealthiest gentry, and nobility of the first rank, vied with each other in bespeaking a place for their sons in the seminary of this fortunate teacher. In the solitude of Grasmere, while living as a married man in a cottage of eight pounds per annum rent, I often used to smile at the tales which reached me of his brilliant career. Not two hundred yards from the cottage in Grasmere, just mentioned, to which I retired, this gentleman, who many years afterwards purchased a small estate in the neighborhood, is now erecting a boathouse, with an upper story to be resorted to as an entertaining room when he and his associates may feel inclined to take their pastime on the lake. Every passenger will be disgusted with the sight of this edifice, not merely as a tasteless thing in itself, but as utterly out of place, and peculiarly fitted, as far as it is observed, and it intrudes itself on notice at every point of view, to mar the beauty and destroy the pastoral simplicity of the veil. For my own part, and that of my household, it is our utter detestation, standing by a shore to which, before the high road was made to pass that way, we used daily and hourly to repair for seclusion and for the shelter of a grove under which I composed many of my poems, the brothers especially, and for this reason we gave the grove that name. 
That which each man loved and prized in his peculiar nook of earth dies with him or is changed. So much for my old schoolfellow and his exploits. I will only add that the foundation has twice failed, from the lake no doubt being intolerant of the intrusion. The miner, next described as having found his treasure after twice ten years of labor, lived in Patterdale, and the story is true to the letter. It seems to me, however, rather remarkable that the strength of mind which had supported him through this long, unrewarded labor did not enable him to bear its successful issue. Several times in the course of my life I have heard of sudden influxes of great wealth being followed by derangement, and in one instance the shock of good fortune was so great as to produce absolute idiocy. But these all happened where there had been little or no previous effort to acquire the riches, and therefore such a consequence might be more naturally expected than in the case of the solitary miner. In reviewing his story, one cannot but regret that such perseverance was not sustained by a worthier object. Archimedes leaped out of his bath and ran about the streets proclaiming his discovery in a transport of joy, but we are not told that he lost either his life or his senses in consequence. The next character, to whom the priest is led by contrast with the resoluteness displayed by the foregoing, is taken from a person born and bred in Grasmere by name Dawson, and whose talents, disposition, and way of life were such as are here delineated. I did not know him but all was fresh in memory when we settled at Grasmere in the beginning of the century. From this point, the conversation leads to the mention of two individuals who, by their several fortunes, were at different times driven to take refuge at the small and obscure town of Hawkshead on the skirt of these mountains. Their stories I had from the dear old dame with whom, as a schoolboy and afterwards, I lodged for the, nearly the space of ten years. The elder, the Jacobite, was named Drummond and was of a high family in Scotland. The Hanoverian Whig bore the name of Van de Put, and might perhaps be a descendant of some Dutchman who had come over in the train of King William. At all events, his zeal was such that he ruined himself by a contest for the representation of London or Westminster, undertaken to support his party, and retired to this corner of the world, selected as it had been by Drummond for that obscurity which, since visiting the lakes became fashionable, it has no longer retained. So much was the region considered out of the way till a late period that persons who had fled from justice used often to resort hither for concealment, and some were so bold as to not infrequently make excursions from the place of their retreat for the purpose of committing fresh offenses. Such was particularly the case of two brothers of the name of Weston, who took up their abode at Old Brathe, I think about seventy years ago. They were highwaymen, and lived there for some time without being discovered, though it was known that they often disappeared in a way and upon errands which could not be accounted for. Their horses were noticed as being of a choice breed. And I have heard from the Ralph family, one of whom was a saddler in the town of Kendall, that they were curious in their saddles and housings and accoutrements of their horses. They, as I have heard, and as was universally believed, were in the end both taken and hanged. Tall was her stature, her complexion dark and saturnine. This person lived at Town End, and was almost our next neighbor. I have little to notice concerning her beyond what is said in the poem. She was a most striking instance how far a woman may surpass in talent, in knowledge, and culture of mind, those with and among whom she lives, and yet fall below them in Christian virtues of the heart and spirit. It seemed almost, and I say it with grief, that in proportion as she excelled in the one, she failed in the other. How frequently has one to observe in both sexes the same thing, and how mortifying is the reflection. As on a sunny bank a tender lamb lurks in safe shelter from the winds of March. The story that follows was told to Mrs. Wordsworth and my sister by the sister of this unhappy young woman, and every particular was exactly as I have related. The party was not known to me, though she lived at Hawkshead, but it was after I left school. The clergyman who administered comfort to her in her distress I knew well. Her sister who told the story was the wife of a leading yeoman in the Vale of Grasmere, and they were an affectionate pair and greatly respected by everyone who knew them. Neither lived to be old, and their estate, which was perhaps the most considerable then in the Vale, and was endeared to them by many remembrances of a salutary character not easily understood or sympathized with by those who are born to great affluence, 
passed to their eldest son according to the practices of these veils who died soon after he came into possession. He was an amiable and promising youth, but was succeeded by an only brother, a good-natured man, who fell into habits of drinking, by which he gradually reduced his property. And the other day the last acre of it was sold, and his wife and children and he himself, still surviving, have very little left to live upon, which it would not perhaps have been worthwhile to record here, but that through all trials this woman has proved a model of patience, meekness, affectionate forbearance, and forgiveness. Their eldest son, who through the vices of his father has thus been robbed of an ancient family inheritance, was never heard to murmur or complain against the cause of their distress, and is now, 1843, deservedly the chief prop of his mother's hopes. The clergyman and his family, described at the beginning of the seventh book, were, during many years, our principal associates in the Vale of Grasmere, unless I were to accept our very nearest neighbors. I have entered so particularly into the main points of their history that I will barely testify in prose that, with the single exception of the particulars of their journey to Grasmere, which, however, was exactly copied from in another instance, the whole that I have said of them is as faithful to the truth as words can make it. There was much talent in the family. The eldest son was distinguished for poetical talent, of which a specimen is given in my notes to the sonnets to the Dudden. Once, when in our cottage at Town End I was talking with him about poetry, in the course of conversation I presumed to find fault with the versification of Pope, of whom he was an enthusiastic admirer. He defended him with a warmth that indicated much irritation. Nevertheless, I would not abandon my point, and said, In compass and variety of sound, your own versification surpasses his. Never shall I forget the change in his countenance and tone of voice. The storm was laid in a moment. He no longer disputed my judgment, and I passed immediately in his mind, no doubt, for as great a critic as ever lived. I ought to add, he was a clergyman and a well-educated man, and his verbal memory was the most remarkable of any individual I have known except a Mr. Archer, an Irishman who lived several years in this neighborhood, and who, in this faculty, was a prodigy. He afterwards became deranged, and I fear continues so, if alive. Then follows the character of Robert Walker, for which see notes to the Dudden. Then that of the deaf man, whose epitaph may be seen in the churchyard at the head of Hawswater, and whose qualities of heart and mind and their benign influence in conjunction with his privation I had from his relatives on the spot. The blind man, next commemorated, was John Goff of Kendall, a man known far beyond his neighborhood for his talents and attainments in natural history and science. Of the infant's grave, next noticed, I will only say it is an exact picture of what fell under my own observation. And all persons who are intimately acquainted with cottage life must often have observed like instances of the working of the domestic affections. A volley thrice repeated o'er the course let down into the hollow of that grave. This young volunteer bore the name of Dawson, and was younger brother, if I am not mistaken, to the prodigal of whose character and fortunes an account is given towards the beginning of the preceding book. The father of the family I knew well. He was a man of literary education and of experience in society much beyond what was common among the inhabitants of the Vale. He had lived a good while in the highlands of Scotland as a manager of ironworks at Bunaw, and had acted as clerk to one of my predecessors in the office of distributor of stamps, when he used to travel round the country collecting and bringing home the money due to government in gold, which it may be worth while to mention for the sake of my friends, was deposited in the cell or iron closet under the west window of the long room at Rydal Mount, which still exists with the iron doors that guarded the property. This, of course, was before the time of bills and notes, the two sons of this person had no doubt been led by the knowledge of their father to take more delight in scholarship, and had been accustomed in their own minds to take a wider view of social interests than was usual among their associates. The premature death of this gallant young man was much lamented, and as an attendant at the funeral I myself witnessed the ceremony and the effect of it as described in the poem. Tradition tells that in Eliza's golden days a knight came on a war horse. The house is gone. The pillars of the gateway in front of the mansion remained, where we first took up our abode at Grasmere. Two or three cottages still remain, which are called not houses from the name of the gentleman, I have called him a knight, concerning whom these traditions survive. 
He was the ancestor of the Knott family, formerly considerable proprietors in the district. What follows in the discourse of the wanderer upon the changes he had witnessed in rural life by the introduction of machinery is truly described from what I myself saw during my boyhood and early youth and from what was often told me by persons of this humble calling. Happily, most happily for these mountains, the mischief was diverted from the banks of their beautiful streams and transferred to open and flat countries abounding in coal, where the agency of steam was found much more effectual for carrying on these demoralizing works. Had it not been for this invention, long before the present time every torrent and river in this district would have had its factory, large and populous in proportion to the power of the water, could there have been commanded. Parliament has interfered to prevent the night work which was once carried on in these mills as actively as during the daytime, and by necessity still more perniciously, a sad disgrace to the proprietors and to the nation which could so long tolerate such unnatural proceedings. Reviewing at this late period, 1843, what I put into the mouths of my interlocutors a few years ago, after the commencement of the century, I grieve that so little progress has been made in diminishing the evils deplored or promoting the benefits of education which the wanderer anticipates. The results of Lord Ashley's labors to defer the time when children might legally be allowed to work in factories, and his endeavors to limit still farther the hours of permitted labor, have fallen far short of his own humane wishes, and those of every benevolent and right-minded man who has carefully attended to this subject. And in the present session of Parliament, 1843, Sir James Graham's attempt to establish a course of religious education among the children employed in factories has been abandoned, in consequence of what might easily have been foreseen, the vehement and turbulent opposition of the dissenters, so that for many years to come it may be thought expedient to leave the religious instruction of children entirely in the hands of the several denominations of Christians in the island, each body to work according to its own means and its own way. Such is my own confidence, a confidence I share with many others of my most valued friends, in the superior advantages, both religious and social, which attend a course of instruction presided over and guided by the clergy of the Church of England, that I have no doubt that if but once its members, lay and clerical, were duly sensible of those benefits, their church would daily gain ground, and rapidly upon every shape and fashion of dissent. And in that case, a great majority of Parliament, being sensible of these benefits, the ministers of the country might be emboldened, were it necessary, to apply funds of the state to the support of education on church principles. Before I conclude, I cannot forbear noticing the strenuous efforts made at this time in Parliament by so many persons to extend manufacturing and commercial industry at the expense of agricultural, though we have recently had abundant proofs that the apprehensions expressed by the wanderer were not groundless. I spake of mischief by the wise diffused with gladness, thinking that the more it spreads, the healthier, the securer we become, delusion which a moment may destroy. The Chartists are well aware of this possibility and cling to it with an ardor and perseverance which nothing but wiser and more brotherly dealing towards the many on the part of the wealthy few can moderate or remove. While from the grassy mountain's open side we gazed in silence hushed. The point here fixed upon in my imagination is halfway up the northern side of Luffrig Fell, from which the pastor and his companions were supposed to look upwards to the sky and mountain tops and round the vale with the lake lying immediately be beneath them. But turned not without welcome promise made, that he would share the pleasures and pursuits of yet another summer's day consumed in wandering with us. When I reported this promise of the solitary, and long after, it was my wish, and I might say intention, that we should resume our wanderings and pass the borders into his native country, whereas I hoped he might witness in the society of the wanderer some religious ceremony, a sacrament, say, in the open fields or a preaching among the mountains, which, by recalling to his mind the days of his early childhood, when he had been present on such occasions, in company with his parents and nearest kindred, might have dissolved his heart into tenderness, and so have done more towards restoring the Christian faith in which he had been educated, and with that the contentedness and even cheerfulness of mind than all that the wanderer and pastor, by their several effusions and addresses, had been able to effect. 
an issue like this was in my intentions. But alas, mid the wreck of is and was, things incomplete and purposes betrayed make sadder transits or thoughts optic glass than noblest objects utterly decayed. Dedication to the Right Honorable William, Earl of Lonsdale, K.G., etc., etc. Oft through thy fair domains, illustrious peer, in youth I roamed on youthful pleasures bent, and mused in rocky cell or sylvan tent, beside swift-flowing Lowther's current clear. Now, by thy care befriended, I appear before thee, Lonsdale, and this work present, a token, may it be a monument of high respect and gratitude sincere. Gladly would I have waited till my task had reached its close, but life is insecure and hopeful oft fallacious as a dream. Therefore, for what is here produced, I ask thy favor, trusting that thou wilt not deem the offering, though imperfect, premature. William Wordsworth, Rydal Mount, Westmoreland, July 29, 1814. Preface to the edition of 1814. The title page announces that this is only a portion of a poem, and the reader must be here apprised that it belongs to the second part of a long and laborious work, which is to consist of three parts. The author will candidly acknowledge that, if the first of these had been completed, and in such a manner as to satisfy his own mind, he should have preferred the natural order of publication, and have given that to the world first. But as the second division of the work was designed to refer more to passing events and to an existing state of things than the others were meant to do, more continuous exertion was naturally bestowed upon it, and greater progress made here than in the rest of the poem. And as this part does not depend upon the preceding to a degree which will materially injure its peculiar interest, the author, complying with the earnest entreaties of some valued friends, presents the following pages to the public. It may be proper to state whence the poem, of which the excursion is a part, derives its title of The Recluse. Several years ago, when the author retired to his native mountains with the hope of being enabled to construct a literary work that might live, it was a reasonable thing that he should take a review of his own mind and examine how far nature and education had qualified him for such employment. As subsidiary to this preparation, he undertook to record in verse the origin and progress of his own powers, as far as he was acquainted with them. That work, addressed to a dear friend, most distinguished for his knowledge and genius, and to whom the author's intellect is deeply indebted, has been long finished, and the result of the investigation which gave rise to it was a determination to compose a philosophical poem containing views of man, nature, and society and to be entitled The Recluse, as having for its principal subject the sensations and opinions of a poet living in retirement. The preparatory poem is biographical and conducts the history of the author's mind to the point where he was emboldened to hope that his faculties were sufficiently matured for entering upon the arduous labor which he had proposed to himself. And the two works have the same kind of relation to each other, if he may so express himself, as the anti-chapel has to the body of a Gothic church. Continuing this illusion, he may be permitted to add that his minor pieces, which have been long before the public, when they shall be properly arranged, will be found by the attentive reader to have such a connection with the main work as may give them claim to be likened to the little cells, oratories, and sepulchral recesses ordinarily included in those edifices. The author would not have deemed himself justified in saying upon this occasion so much of performances either unfinished or unpublished, if he had not thought that the labor bestowed by him upon what he has heretofore and now laid before the public entitled him to candid attention for such a statement as he thinks necessary, to throw light upon his endeavors to please, and, he would hope, to benefit his countrymen. Nothing further need be added than that the first and third parts of the recluse will consist chiefly of meditations in the author's own person, and that the intermediate part, the excursion, the intervention of characters speaking is employed, and something of a dramatic form adopted. It is not the author's intention formally to announce a system. It was more animating to him to proceed in a different course. 
And if he shall succeed in conveying to the mind clear thoughts, lively images, and strong feelings, the reader will have no difficulty in extracting the system for himself. And in the meantime, the following passage, taken from the conclusion of the first book of The Recluse, may be acceptable as a kind of prospectus to the design and scope of the whole poem. End of the Note and Preface to the Excursion by William Wordsworth Book One of the Excursion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Excursion by William Wordsworth. Book One The Wanderer. Twas summer and the sun had mounted high. Southward the landscape indistinctly glared through a pale steam. But all the northern downs in clearest air ascending showed far off a surface dappled o'er with shadows flung from brooding clouds, shadows that lay in spots determined and unmoved, with steady beams of bright and pleasant sunshine interposed. To him most pleasant, who on soft cool moss extends his careless limbs along the front of some huge cave, whose rocky ceiling casts a twilight of its own, an ample shade, where the wren warbles while the dreaming man half conscious of the soothing melody, with sidelong eye looks out upon the scene by power of that impending covert, thrown to finer distance. Mine was at that hour far other lot, yet with good hope that soon under a shade as grateful I should find rest and be welcomed there to livelier joy. Across a bare wide common I was toiling with languid steps that by the slippery turf were baffled, nor could my weak arm disperse the host of insects gathering round my face, and ever with me as I paced along. Upon that open moorland stood a grove, the wished-for port to which my course was bound. Thither I came, and there, amid the gloom spread by a brotherhood of lofty elms, appeared a roofless hut, four naked walls that stared upon each other. I looked round, and to my wish and to my hope espied the friend I sought, a man of reverend age, but stout and hale for travel unimpaired. There was he seen upon the cottage bench, recumbent in the shade as if asleep, an iron-pointed staff lay at his side. Him had I marked the day before, alone and stationed in the public way, with face turned toward the sun then setting, while that staff afforded to the figure of the man, detained for contemplation or repose, graceful support. His countenance, as he stood, was hidden from my view, and he remained unrecognized. But stricken by the sight, with slackened footsteps I advanced, and soon a glad congratulation we exchanged at such unthought-of meeting. For the night we parted, nothing willingly, and now he by appointment waited for me here under the covert of these clustering elms. We were tried friends, amid a pleasant vale in the antique market village, where was past my school time an apartment he had owned, to which at intervals the wanderer drew, and found me a kind of home or harbor there. He loved me from a swarm of rosy boys, singled out me, as he in sport would say, for my grave looks too thoughtful for my years. As I grew up, it was my best delight to be his chosen comrade. Many a time on holidays we rambled through the woods, we sat, we walked. He pleased me with report of things which he had seen, and often touched abstrusest matter, reasonings of the mind turned inward, or at my request would sing old songs, the product of his native hills, a skillful distribution of sweet sounds, feeding the soul and eagerly imbibed as cool, refreshing water by the care of the industrious husbandman, diffused through a parched meadow ground in time of drought. Still deeper welcome found his pure discourse. How precious when in riper days I learned to weigh with care his words and to rejoice in the plain presence of his dignity. Oh, many are the poets that are sown by nature, men endowed with highest gifts, the vision and the faculty divine, yet wanting the accomplishment of verse which in the docile season of their youth it was denied them to acquire, through lack of culture and the inspiring aid of books, or haply by a temper too severe, or a nice backwardness afraid of shame. 
nor having air as life advanced been led by circumstance to take unto the height the measure of themselves, these favored beings, all but a scattered few, live out their time, husbanding that which they possess within, and go to the grave unthought of. Strongest minds are often those of whom the noisy world hears least, else surely this man had not left his graces unrevealed and unproclaimed. But as the mind was filled with inward light, so not without distinction had he lived, beloved and honored, far as he was known, and some small portion of his eloquent speech and something that may serve to set in view the feeling pleasures of his loneliness, his observations, and the thoughts his mind had dealt with, I will here record in verse, which, if with truth it correspond and sink or rise as venerable nature leads, the high and tender muses shall accept with gracious smile, deliberately pleased and listening time, to his household, though exceeding poor. Pure livers were they all, austere and grave, and fearing God. The very children taught stern self-respect, a reverence for God's word, and an habitual piety, maintained with strictness scarcely known on English ground. From his sixth year, the boy of whom I speak in summer tended cattle on the hills, but through the inclement and perilous days of long-continuing winter he repaired, equipped with satchel to a school, it stood soul-building soul on a mountain's dreary edge, remote from view of city spire or sound of minster clock. From that bleak tenement he, many an evening to his distant home in solitude returning, saw the hills grow larger in the darkness. All alone beheld the stars come out above his head and traveled through the wood with no one near to whom he might confess the things he saw. So the foundations of his mind were laid in such communion, not from terror free while yet a child, and long before his time had he perceived the presence and the power of greatness. And deep feelings had impressed so vividly great objects that they lay upon his mind like substances whose presence perplexed the bodily sense. He had received a precious gift, for as he grew in years, with these impressions would he still compare all his remembrances, thoughts, shapes, and forms, and being still unsatisfied with aught of dimmer character, he thence attained an active power to fasten images upon his brain, and on their pictured lines intensely brooded, even till they acquired the liveliness of dreams." Nor did he fail while yet a child, with a child's eagerness incessantly to turn his ear and eye on all things which the moving seasons brought to feed such appetite. Nor this alone appeased his yearning. In the after day of boyhood, many an hour in caves forlorn and mid the hollow depths of naked crags, he sat. And even in their fixed lineaments, or from the power of a peculiar eye, or by creative feeling overborn, or by predominance of thought oppressed, even in their fixed and steady lineaments, he traced an ebbing and a flowing mind, expression ever varying. Thus informed, he had small need of books, for many a tale traditionary, round the mountains hung, and many a legend peopling the dark woods nourished imagination in her growth, and gave the mind that apprehensive power by which she is made quick to recognize the moral properties and scope of things." But eagerly he read and read again, whate'er the minister's old shelf supplied, the life and death of martyrs who sustained with will inflexible those fearful pangs triumphantly displayed in records left of persecution, and the covenant times whose echo rings through Scotland to this hour. And there, by lucky hap, had been preserved a straggling volume, torn and incomplete, that left half told the preternatural tale, romance of giants, chronicle of fiends, profuse and garniture of wooden cuts, strange and uncouth, dire faces, figures dire, sharp kneed, sharp elbowed, and lean ankled too, with long and ghostly shanks, forms which once seen could never be forgotten. In his heart, where fear sat thus, a cherished visitant, was wanting yet the pure delight of love by sound diffused, or by the breathing air, or by the silent looks of happy things, or flowing from the universal face of earth and sky. But he had felt the power of nature, and already was prepared by his intense conceptions to receive deeply the lesson deep of love, which he whom nature, by whatever means, has taught to feel intensely, cannot but receive. Such was the boy, but for the growing youth, 
What soul was his when, from the naked top of some bold headland, he beheld the sun rise up and bathe the world in light? He looked, ocean and earth, the solid frame of earth and ocean's liquid mass, in gladness lay beneath him. Far and wide the clouds were touched, and in their silent faces could he read unutterable love. Sound needed none, nor any voice of joy. His spirit drank the spectacle. Sensation, soul, and form all melted into him. They swallowed up his animal being. In them did he live, and by them did he live. They were his life. In such access of mind, in such high hour of visitation from the living God, thought was not. In enjoyment it expired. No thanks, he breathed. He proffered no request. Wrapped into still communion that transcends the imperfect offices of prayer and praise, his mind was a thanksgiving to the power that made him. It was blessedness and love. A herdsman on the lonely mountaintops, such intercourse was his, and in this sort was his existence oftentimes possessed. Oh, then, how beautiful, how bright appeared the written promise. Early had he learned to reverence the volume that displays the mystery the life which cannot die. But in the mountains did he feel his faith. All things responsive to the writing there breathed immortality, revolving life and greatness still revolving, infinite. Their littleness was not. The least of things seemed infinite. And there his spirit shaped her prospects, nor did he believe he saw. What wonder if his being thus became sublime and comprehensive. Low desires, low thoughts, had there no place, yet was his heart lowly, for he was meek in gratitude, oft as he called those ecstasies to mind, and whence they flowed. And from them he acquired wisdom, which works through patience. Thence he learned in oft-recurring hours of sober thought to look on nature with a humble heart, self-questioned where it did not understand, and with a superstitious eye of love. So passed the time, yet to the nearest town he duly went with what small overplus his earnings might supply, and brought away the book that most had tempted his desires while at the stall he read. Among the hills he gazed upon that mighty orb of song, the divine Milton. Lore of different kind, the annual savings of a toilsome life his schoolmaster supplied, books that explain the purer elements of truth involved in lines and numbers, and by charms severe, especially perceived where nature droops and feeling is suppressed, preserve the mind busy in solitude and poverty. These occupations oftentimes deceived the listless hours, while in the hollow vale, hollow and green, he lay on the green turf in pensive idleness. What could he do? thus daily thirsting in that lonesome life with blind endeavors. Yet still uppermost, nature was at his heart as if he felt, though yet he knew not how, a wasting power in all things that from her sweet influence might tend to wean him. Therefore, with her hues, her forms, and with the spirit of her forms, he clothed the nakedness of austere truth. While yet he lingered in the rudiments of science and among her simplest laws, his triangles, they were the stars of heaven, the silent stars. Oft did he take delight to measure the altitude of some tall crag that is the eagle's birthplace or some peak familiar with forgotten years that shows, inscribed upon its visionary sides, the history of many a winter storm or obscure records of the path of fire. And thus, before his eighteenth year was told, accumulated feelings pressed his heart with still increasing weight. He was o'erpowered by nature, by the turbulence subdued of his own mind, by mystery and hope, and the first virgin passion of a soul communing with the glorious universe. Full often wished he that the winds might rage when they were silent. Far more fondly now than in his earlier season did he love tempestuous nights, the conflict and the sounds that live in darkness. From his intellect and from the stillness of abstracted thought he asked repose, and failing off to win the peace required, he scanned the laws of night amid the roar of torrents, where they send from hollow clefts up to the clearer air a cloud of mist that, smitten by the sun, varies its rainbow hues. 
But vainly thus, and vainly by all other means, he strove to mitigate the fever of his heart. In dreams, in study, and in ardent thought, thus was he reared, much wanting to assist the growth of intellect, yet gaining more. And every moral feeling of his soul strengthened and braced by breathing in content the keen, the wholesome air of poverty and drinking from the well of homely life. But from past liberty and tried restraints, he now was summoned to select the course of humble, uh, humble industry that promised best to yield him no unworthy maintenance. Urged by his mother, he essayed to teach a village school, but wandering thoughts were then a misery to him, and the youth resigned a task he was unable to perform. That stern yet kindly spirit who constrains the Savoyard to quit his naked rocks, the freeborn Swiss to leave his narrow veils, spirit attached to regions mountainous like their own steadfast clouds, did now impel his restless mind to look abroad with hope. An irksome drudgery seems it to plod on through hot and dusty ways or pelting storm, a vagrant merchant under a heavy load, bent as he moves and needing frequent rest. Yet do such travelers find their own delight, and their hard service, deemed debasing now, gained merited respect in simpler times, when squire and priest, and they who round them dwelt in rustic sequestration, all dependent upon the peddler's toil, supplied their wants, or pleased their fancies with the wares he brought. Not ignorant was the youth that still no few of his adventurous countrymen were led by perseverance in this track of life to competence and ease. To him it offered attractions manifold, and this he chose. His parents on the enterprise bestowed their farewell benediction, but with hearts foreboding evil. From his native hills he wandered far. Much did he see of men, their manners, their enjoyments and pursuits, their passions and their feelings, chiefly those essential and eternal in the heart, that mid the simpler forms of rural life exist more simple in their elements and speak a plainer language. In the woods, a lone enthusiast and among the fields itinerant in this labor, he had passed the better portion of his time, and there spontaneously had his affections thriven amid the bounties of the year, the peace and liberty of nature. There he kept in solitude and solitary thought his mind in a just equipoise of love. Serene it was, unclouded by the cares of ordinary life, unvexed, unwarped by partial bondage. In his steady course, no piteous revolutions had he felt, no wild varieties of joy and grief. Unoccupied by sorrow of its own, his heart lay open, and by nature tuned and constant disposition of his thoughts to sympathy with man, he was alive to all that was enjoyed where'er he went, and all that was endured. For in himself, happy and quiet in his cheerfulness, he had no painful pressure from without that made him turn aside from wretchedness with coward fears. He could afford to suffer with those whom he saw suffer. Hence it came that in our best experience he was rich, and in the wisdom of our daily life. For hence, minutely, in his various rounds, he had observed the progress and decay of many minds, of minds and bodies too, the history of many families, how they had prospered, how they were o'erthrown by passion or mischance, or such misrule among the unthinking masters of the earth as makes the nations groan. This active course he followed till provision for his wants had been obtained, the wanderer then resolved to pass the remnant of his days untasked with needless services from hardship free. His calling laid aside, he lived at ease, but still he loved to pace the public roads and the wild paths, and by the summer's warmth invited, often would he leave his home and journey far, revisiting the scenes that to his memory were most endeared. Vigorous in health, of hopeful spirits, undamped by worldly-mindedness or anxious care, observant, studious, thoughtful, and refreshed by knowledge gathered up from day to day. Thus had he lived a long and innocent life. The Scottish Church, both on himself and those with whom from childhood he grew up, had held the strong hand of her purity, and still had watched him with an unrelenting eye. This he remembered in his riper age with gratitude and reverential thoughts. 
but by the native vigor of his mind, by his habitual wanderings out of doors, by loneliness and goodness and kind works, whate'er in docile childhood or in youth he had imbibed of fear or darker thought, was melted all away. So true was this, that sometimes his religion seemed to me self-taught, as of a dreamer in the woods, who to the model of his own pure heart shaped his belief as grace divine inspired, and human reason dictated with awe. And surely never did there live on earth a man of kindlier nature. The rough sports and teasing ways of children vexed him not. Indulgent listener was he to the tongue of garrulous age. Nor did the sick man's tale, to his fraternal sympathy addressed, obtain reluctant hearing. Plain his garb, such as might suit a rustic sire, prepared for Sabbath duties, Yet he was a man whom no one could have passed without remark. Active and nervous was his gait, his limbs, and his whole figure breathed intelligence. Time had compressed the freshness of his cheek into a narrower circle of deep red, but had not tamed his eye. That underbrows shaggy and gray had meanings which it brought from years of youth, which, like a being made of many beings, he had a wondrous skill to blend with knowledge of the years to come, human or such as lie beyond the grave. So he was framed, and such his course of life, who now, with no appendage but a staff, the prized memorial of relinquished toils, upon that cottage bench reposed his limbs, screened from the sun. Supine the wanderer lay, his eyes as if in drowsiness half shut, the shadows of the breezy elms above dappling his face. He had not heard the sound of my approaching steps, and in the shade unnoticed did I stand some minutes' space. At length I hailed him, seeing that his hat was moist with water drops, as if the brim had newly scooped a running stream. He rose, and ere our lively greeting into peace had settled, "'Tis,' said I, "'a burning day. "'My lips are parched with thirst, "'but you, it seems, have found somewhere sweet relief.' "'He, at the word, pointing towards the sweet briar, "'bade me climb the fence "'where that aspiring shrub looked out upon the public way. "'It was a plot of garden ground run wild, "'its matted weeds marked with the steps of those whom, as they passed, "'the gooseberry trees that shot in long, lank slips of or currants hanging from their leafless stems and scanty strings, had tempted to o'erleap the broken wall. I looked around, and there were two tall hedgerows of thick alder boughs joined in a cold, damp nook, espied a well shrouded with willow flowers and plumy fern. My thirst I slaked, and from the cheerless spot withdrawing straightway to the shade returned where sat the old man on the cottage bench. And while beside him with uncovered head I was standing freely to respire and cool my temples in the fanning, fanning air, thus did he speak. I see around me here things which you cannot see. We die, my friend, nor we alone, but that which each man loved and prized in his peculiar nook of earth dies with him or is changed. And very soon even of the good is no memorial left. The poets, in their elegies and songs, lamenting the departed, call the groves. They call upon the hills and streams to mourn and senseless rocks, nor idly. For they speak in these their invocations with a voice obedient to the strong creative power of human passion. Sympathies there are, more tranquil, yet perhaps of kindred birth, that steal upon the meditative mind and grow with thought. Beside yon spring I stood and eyed its waters till we seemed to feel one sadness, they and I. For them, bond of brotherhood is broken. Time has been when every day the touch of human hand dislodged the natural sleep that binds them up in mortal stillness. And they ministered to human comfort. Stooping down to drink upon the slimy footstone, I espied the useless fragment of a wooden bowl green with the moss of years, and subject only to the soft handling of the elements. There let it lie. How foolish are such thoughts. Forgive them. Never, never did my steps approach this door, but she who dwelt within a daughter's welcome gave me, and I loved her as my own child. Oh, sir, the good die first, and they whose hearts are dry as summer dust burn to the socket. 
Many a passenger hath blessed poor Margaret for her gentle looks, when she upheld the cool refreshment drawn from that forsaken spring. And no one came, but he was welcome. No one went away, but that it seemed she loved him. She is dead, the light extinguished of her lonely hut, the hut itself abandoned to decay, and she forgotten in the quiet grave. I speak, continued he, of one whose stock of virtues bloomed beneath this lonely roof. She was a woman of a steady mind, tender and deep in her excess of love, not speaking much, pleased rather with the joy of her own thoughts, by some especial care her temper had been framed, as if to make a being who by adding love to peace might live on earth a life of happiness. Her wedded partner lacked not on his side the humble worth that satisfied her heart, frugal, affectionate, sober, and withal keenly industrious. She with pride would tell that he was often seated at his loom in summer, ere the mower was abroad among the dewy grass, in early spring ere the last star had vanished. They who passed at evening from behind the garden fence might hear his busy spade, which he would ply, after his daily work, until the light had failed, and every leaf and flower were lost in the dark hedges. So their days were spent in peace and comfort, and a pretty boy was their best hope next to God in heaven. Not twenty years ago, but you, I think, can scarcely bear it now in mind, there came two blighting seasons when the fields were left with half a harvest. It pleased heaven to add a worse affliction in the plague of war. This happy land was stricken to the heart. A wanderer then among the cottages, I, with my freight of winter raiment, saw the hardships of that season. Many rich sank down as in a dream among the poor, and of the poor did many cease to be, and their place knew them not. Meanwhile, abridged of daily comforts, gladly reconciled to numerous self-denials, Margaret went struggling on through those calamitous years with cheerful hope, until the second autumn, when her life's helpmate on a sickbed lay, smitten with perilous fever. In disease he lingered long, and when his strength returned, he found the little he had stored to meet the hour of accident or crippling age was all consumed. A second infant now was added to the troubles of a time laden for them and all of their degree with care and sorrow. Shoals of artisans from ill-requited labor turned adrift, sought daily bread from public charity. They and their wives and children, happier far could they have lived as do the little birds that peck along the hedgerows or the kite that makes her dwelling on the mountain rocks. A sad reverse it was for him who long had filled with plenty and possessed in peace this lonely cottage. At the door he stood and whistled many a snatch of merry tunes that had no mirth in them, or with his knife carved uncouth figures on the heads of sticks. Then, not less idly, sought through every nook in house or garden any casual work of use or ornament. And with a strange, amusing, yet uneasy novelty, he mingled where he might and the various tasks of summer, autumn, winter, and of spring. But this endured not. His good humor soon became a weight in which no pleasure was, and poverty brought on a petted mood and a sore temper. Day by day he drooped, and he would leave his work, and to the town would turn without an errand his slack steps, or wander here and there among the fields. One while he would speak lightly of his babes, and with a cruel tongue, at other times he tossed them with a false, unnatural joy. And t'was a rueful thing to see the looks of the poor, innocent children. Every smile, said Margaret to me, here beneath these trees, made my heart bleed. At this the wanderer paused, and looking up to those enormous elms, he said, "'Tis now the hour of deepest noon, and this still season of repose and peace this hour when all things which are not at rest are cheerful, while this multitude of flies with tuneful hum is filling all of the air. Why should a tear be on an old man's cheek? Why should we thus, with an untoward mind and in the weakness of humanity, from natural wisdom turn our hearts away? To natural comfort shut our eyes and ears, and feeding on disquiet, thus disturb the calm of nature with our restless thoughts. 
He spake with somewhat of a solemn tone, but when he ended, there was in his face such easy cheerfulness, a look so mild, that for a little time it stole away all recollection, and that simple tale passed from my mind like a forgotten sound. A while on trivial things we held discourse, to me soon tasteless. In my own despite, I thought of that poor woman as of one whom I had known and loved. He had rehearsed her homely tale with such familiar power, with such an active countenance, and I so busy that the things of which he spake seemed present, and, attention now relaxed, a heartfelt chillness crept along my veins. I rose, and having left the breezy shade, stood drinking comfort from the warmer sun that had not cheered me long. Ere looking round upon that tranquil ruin, I returned and begged of the old man that for my sake he would resume his story. He replied, It were a wantonness, and would demand severe reproof, if we were men whose hearts could hold vain dalliance with the misery even of the dead, contented thence to draw a momentary pleasure, never marked by reason, barren of all future good. But we have known that there is often found in mournful thoughts, and always might be found, a power to virtue friendly. Were it not so, I am a dreamer among men, indeed an idle dreamer. It is a common tale, an ordinary sorrow of man's life, a tale of silent suffering, hardly clothed in bodily form. But without further bidding I will proceed. While thus it fared with them, to whom this cottage till those hapless years had been a blessed home, it was my chance to travel in a country far remote. And when these lofty elms once more appeared, what pleasant expectations lured me on, or the flat common. With quick step I reached the threshold, and lifted with light hand the latch. But when I entered, Margaret looked at me a little while, and turned her head away speechless and sitting down upon a chair, wept bitterly. I wist not what to do, nor how to speak to her. Poor wretch! At last she lo rose from off her seat, and then, Oh, sir, I cannot tell how she pronounced my name. With fervent love, and with a face of grief unutterably helpless, and a look that seemed to cling upon me as she inquired if I had seen her husband. As she spake, a, a strange surprise and fear came to my heart. Nor had I power to answer ere she told that he had disappeared not two months gone. He left his house. Two wretched days had passed, and on the third, as wistfully she raised her head from off her pillow to look forth, like one in trouble, for returning light within her chamber casement, she espied a folded paper, lying as if placed to meet her waking eyes. This tremblingly she opened, found no writing, but beheld pieces of money carefully enclosed, silver and gold. I shuddered at the sight, said Margaret, for I knew it was his hand that must have placed it there. And ere that day was ended, that long anxious day, I learned from one who by my husband had been sent with the sad news that he had joined a troop of soldiers going to a distant land. He left me thus. He could not gather heart to take a farewell of me, for he feared that I should follow with my babes and sink beneath the misery of that wandering life. This tale did Margaret tell with many tears, and when she ended I had little power to give her comfort, and was glad to take such words of hope from her own mouth as served to cheer us both. But long we had not talked ere we built up a pile of better thoughts. And with a brighter eye, she looked around as if she had been shedding tears of joy. We parted. T'was the time of early spring. I left her busy with her garden tools, and well remember o'er that fence she looked, and while I paced along the footway path, called out and sent a blessing after me with tender cheerfulness, and with a voice that seemed the very sound of happy thoughts. I roved o'er many a hill and many a dale with my accustomed load in heat and cold, through many a wood and many an open ground, in sunshine and in shade, in wet and fair, drooping or blithe of heart as might befall, my best companions now the driving winds and the trotting brooks and whispering trees, and now the music of my own sad steps, and with many a short-lived thought that passed between and disappeared. 
I journeyed back this way when in the warmth of midsummer the wheat was yellow and the soft and bladed grass springing afresh had o'er the hayfields spread its tender verdure. At the door I arrived, I found that she was absent. In the shade where we now sit, I waited her return. Her cottage, then a cheerful object, wore its customary look. Only it seemed the honeysuckle crowding round the porch hung down in heavier tufts. And that bright weed, the yellow stone crop, suffered to take root along the window's edge, profusely grew, blinding the lower panes. I turned aside and strolled into her garden. It appeared to lag behind the season and had lost its pride of neatness. Daisy flowers and thrift had broken their trim borderlines and straggled o'er past they used to deck. Carnations once prized for surpassing beauty and no less for the peculiar gains they had required declined their languid heads, wanting support. The cumbrous bindweed, with its wreaths and bells, had twined about her two small rows of peas and dragged them to the earth. Ere this an hour was wasted, back I turned to my restless steps, a stranger passed, and guessing whom I sought, he said that she was used to ramble far. The sun was sinking in the west, And now I sat with sad impatience. From within her solitary infant cried aloud. Then, like a blast that dies away self-stilled, the voice was silent. From the bench I rose, but neither could divert nor soothe my thoughts. The spot, though fair, was very desolate. The longer I remained, the more desolate. And looking round me, now I first observed the cornerstones on either side of the porch. With dull red stains discolored and stuck o'er with tufts and hairs of wool as if the sheep that fed upon the common thither came familiarly and found a couching place even at her threshold. Deeper shadows fell from these tall elms. The cottage clock struck eight. I turned and saw her distant a few steps. Her face was pale and thin. Her figure, too, was changed. As she unlocked the door, she said, It grieves me you have waited here so long. But in good truth I've wandered much of late, and sometimes, to my shame I speak, have need of my best prayers to bring me back again. While on the board she spread our evening meal, she told me, interrupting not the work, which gave employment to her listless hands, that she had parted with her elder child to a kind master on a distant farm, now happily apprenticed. I perceive you look at me, and you have cause. Today I have been traveling far, and many days about the fields I wander, knowing this only, that what I seek I cannot find. And so I waste my time, for I am changed. And to myself, said she, have done much wrong, and to this helpless infant. I have slept weeping, and weeping have I waked. My tears have flowed as if my body were not such as others are, and I could never die. But I am now in mind and in my heart more easy, and I hope, said she, that God will give me patience to endure the things which I behold at home. It would have grieved your very soul to see her. Sir, I feel the story linger in my heart. I fear tis long and tedious, but my spirit clings to that poor woman. So familiarly do I perceive her manner and her look and presence, and so deeply do I feel her goodness that not seldom in my walks a momentary trance comes over me. And to myself I seem to muse on one by sorrow laid asleep or borne away, a human being destined to awake to human life, or something very near to human life, when he shall come again for whom she suffered. Yes, it would have grieved your very soul to see her. Evermore her eyelids drooped, her eyes downward were cast. And when she at her table gave me food, she did not look at me. Her voice was low, her body was subdued. In every act pertaining to her house affairs appeared the careless stillness of a thinking mind self-occupied, to which all outward things are like an idle matter. Still she sighed, but yet no motion of the breast was seen, no heaving of the heart. While by the fire we sat together, sighs came on my ear. I knew not how and hardly whence they came. Ere my departure to her care, I gave for her son's use some tokens of regard, which with a look of welcome she received. And I exhorted her to place her trust in God's good love and seek his help by prayer. 
I took my staff, and when I kissed her babe, the tears stood in her eyes. I left her then with the best hope and comfort I could give. She thanked me for my wish. But for my hope, it seemed, she did not thank me. I returned and took my rounds along this road again, when on its sunny bank the primrose flower peeped forth to give an earnest of the spring. I found her sad and drooping. She had learned the tidings of her husband. If he lived, she knew not that he lived. If he were dead, she knew not he was dead. She seemed the same in person and appearance, but her house bespake a sleepy hand of negligence. The floor was neither dry nor neat, the hearth was comfortless, and her small lot of books, which in the cottage window heretofore had been piled up against the corner panes in seemly order, now with straggling leaves lay scattered here and there, open or shut, as if they had chanced to fall. Her infant babe had from his mother caught the trick of grief and sighed among its playthings. I withdrew, and once again entering the garden, saw more plainly still that poverty and grief were now come nearer to her. Weeds defaced the hardened soil and knots of withered grass. No ridges there appeared of clear black mold, no winter greenness. Of her herbs and flowers, it seemed the better part was gnawed away or trampled into earth. A chain of straw which had been twined about the slender stem of a young apple tree, lay at its root. The bark was nibbled round by truant sheep. Margaret stood near, her infant in her arms, and noting that my eye was on the tree, she said, I fear it will be dead and gone ere Robert come again. When to the house we had returned together, she inquired if I had any hope. But for her babe and for her little orphan boy, she said she had no wish to live that she must die of sorrow. Yet I saw the idol loom still in its place, his Sunday garments hung upon the selfsame nail, his very staff stood undisturbed behind the door. And when in bleak December I retraced this way, she told me that her little babe was dead, and she was left alone. She now, released from her maternal cares, had taken up the employment common through these wilds and gained by spinning hemp a pittance for herself, and for this end had hired a neighbor's boy to give her needful help. That very time, most willingly, she put her work aside and walked with me along the miry road, heedless how far, and in such piteous sort that any heart had ached to hear her, begged that wheresoe'er I went, I still would ask for him whom she had lost. We parted then, our final parting. For from that time forth did many seasons pass ere I returned into this tract again. Nine tedious years from their first separation. Nine long years she lingered in unquiet widowhood, a wife and widow. Needs must it have been a sore heart-wasting. I have heard, my friend, that in yon arbor oftentimes she sat alone through half the vacant Sabbath day. And if a dog passed by, she still would quit the shade and look abroad. On this old bench for hours she sat, and evermore her eye was busy in the distance, shaping things that made her, her heart beat quick. You see that path, now faint. The grasses crept o'er its gray line. There, to and fro, she paced through many a day of the warm summer, from a belt of hemp that girt her waist, spinning the long-drawn thread with backward steps. Yet ever as there passed a man whose garments showed the soldier's red or crippled mendicant in a sailor's garb, the little child who sat to turn the wheel ceased from his task, and she with faltering voice made many a fond inquiry. And when they whose presence gave no comfort were gone by, her heart was still more sad. And by yon gate that bars the traveler's road she often stood, and when a stranger horseman came, the latch would lift, and in his face looked wistfully, most happy if from aught discovered there of tender feeling she might dare repeat the same sad question. Meanwhile, her poor hut sank to decay, for he was gone whose hand at the first nipping of October frost closed up each chink, and with fresh bands of straw checkered the green-grown thatch. And so she lived through the long winter, reckless and alone, until her house by frost and thaw and rain was sapped. And while she slept, the nightly damps did chill her breast. And in the stormy day, her tattered clothes were ruffled by the wind, even at the side of her own fire. Yet still she loved this wretched spot, 
No wood for worlds have parted hence. And still that length of road and this rude bench, one torturing hope endeared, fast rooted at her heart. And here, my friend, in sickness she remained. And here she died, last human tenant of these ruined walls. The old man ceased. He saw that I was moved. From that low bench, rising instinctively, I turned aside in weakness, nor had power to thank him for the tale which he had told. I stood and, leaning o'er the garden wall, reviewed that woman's sufferings. And it seemed to comfort me, while with a brother's love I blessed her in the impotence of grief. Then towards the cottage I returned and traced fondly, though with an interest more mild, that secret spirit of humanity which mid the calm, oblivious tendencies of nature, mid her plants and weeds and flowers and silent overgrowings, still survived. The old man, noting this, resumed and said, My friend, enough to sorrow you have given. The purposes of wisdom ask no more. No more would she have craved as due to one who, in her worst distress, had oft times felt the unbounded might of prayer, and learned with soul fixed on the cross that consolation springs from sources deeper far than deepest pain for the meek sufferer. Why then should we read the forms of things with an unworthy eye? She sleeps in the calm earth, and peace is here. I well remember that those very plumes, those weeds, at the high spear grass on that wall, by mist and silent raindrops silvered o'er, as once I passed into my heart conveyed so still an image of tranquility, so calm and still, and looked so beautiful amid the uneasy thoughts which filled my mind that what we feel of sorrow and despair from ruin and from change, and all the grief that passing shows of being loved behind, appeared an idle dream that could maintain nowhere dominion or the enlightened spirit whose meditative sympathies repose upon the breast of faith. I turned away and walked along my road in happiness. He ceased. Ere the long sun declining shot to slant and mellow radiance, which began to fall upon us, while beneath the trees we sat on that low bench, and now we felt, admonished thus, the sweet hour coming on. A linnet warbled from those lofty elms, a thrush sang loud, and other melodies at distance heard, peopled the mild air. The old man rose, and with a sprightly mien of hopeful preparation, grasped his staff. Together casting then a farewell look upon those silent walls, we left the shade, and ere the stars were visible, had reached the village inn, our evening resting place. End of Book One of The Excursion by William Wordsworth Book Two of The Excursion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Excursion by William Wordsworth. Book Two The Solitary. In days of yore, how fortunately fared the minstrel! Wandering on from hall to hall, baronial court or royal, Cheered with gifts munificent and love and ladies' praise, Now meeting on his road an armed knight, Now resting with a pilgrim by the side of a clear brook, Beneath an abbey's roof one evening sumptuously lodged, The next humbly in a religious hospital, or With some merry outlaws of the wood, Or happily shrouded in a hermit's cell. Him sleeping or awake the robber spared, he walked, protected from the sword of war by virtue of that sacred instrument, his harp, suspended at the traveler's side, his dear companion wheresoe'er he went, opening from land to land an easy way by melody and by the charm of verse. Yet not the noblest of that honored race drew happier, loftier, more impassioned thoughts from his long journeyings and eventful life than this obscure itinerant had skill to gather, Ranging through the tamer ground of these our unimaginative days, Both while he trod the earth in humblest guise, Accoutred with his burthen and his staff, And now, 
when free to move with lighter pace. What wonder, then, if I, whose favorite school hath been the fields, the roads, and rural lanes, looked on this guide with reverential love. Each with the other pleased, we now pursued our journey under favorable skies. Turn wheresoe'er we would. He was a light unfailing. Not a hamlet could we pass, rarely a house that did not yield to him remembrances, or from his tongue call forth some way-beguiling tale. Nor less regard accompanied those strains of apt discourse which nature's various objects might inspire, and in the silence of his face I read his overflowing spirit. Birds and beasts and the mute fish that glances in the stream, and harmless reptile coiling in the sun, and gorgeous insect hovering in the air, the foul domestic and the household dog, in his capacious mind, he loved them all. Their rights acknowledging he felt for all. Oft was occasion given to me to perceive how the calm pleasures of the pasturing herd to happy contemplation soothed his walk, how the poor brute's condition, forced to run its course of suffering in the public road, sad contrast, all too often smote his heart with unavailing pity. Rich in love and sweet humanity he was, himself to the degree that he desired, beloved. Smiles of goodwill from faces that he knew greeted us all day long. We took our seats by many a cottage hearth, where he received the welcome of an inmate from afar, and I at once forgot I was a stranger. Nor was he loath to enter ragged huts, huts where his charity was blessed, his voice heard as the voice of an experienced friend, and sometimes where the poor man held dispute with his own mind, unable to subdue impatience through inaptness to perceive general distress in his particular lot, or cherishing resentment, or in vain struggling against it, a soul perplexed, and finding in herself no steady power to draw the line of comfort that divides calamity, the chastisement of heaven from the injustice of our brother men. To him appeal was made as to a judge, who with an understanding heart allayed the perturbation, listened to the plea, resolved the dubious point, and sentence gave so grounded, so applied, that it was heard with softened spirit, even when it condemned. Such intercourse I witnessed while we roved, now as his choice directed, now as mine, or both with equal readiness of will, our course submitting to the changeful breeze of accident. But when the rising sun had three times called us to renew our walk, my fellow traveler, with earnest voice, as if the thought were but a moment old, claimed absolute dominion for the day. We started, and he led me toward the hills, up through an ample vale with higher hills before us, mountains stern and desolate, but in the majesty of distance now set off, and to our ken appearing fair of aspect, with aerial softness clad, and beautified with morning's purple beams. The wealthy, the luxurious, by the stress of business roused or pleasure, ere their time may roll in chariots, or provoke the hoofs of the fleet coursers they bestride, to raise from earth the dust of morning, slow to rise. And they, if blessed with health and hearts at ease, shall lock not their enjoyment. But how faint compared with ours, who, pacing side by side, could, with an eye of leisure, look on all that we beheld, and lend the listening sense to every grateful sound of earth and air, pausing at will, our spirits braced, our thoughts pleasant as roses in the thickets blown, and pure as dew bathing their crimson leaves. Mount slowly, son, that we may journey long, by this dark hill protected from thy beams. Such is the summer pilgrim's frequent wish, but quickly from among our morning thoughts t'was chased away. For toward the western side of the broad vale, casting a casual glance, we saw a throng of people. Wherefore met? Blithe notes of music suddenly let loose on the thrilled ear, and flags uprising yield prompt answer. They proclaim the annual wake, which the bright season favors, tabor and pipe in purpose join to hasten or reprove the laggard rustic, and repay with boons of merriment a party-colored knot already formed upon the village green. Beyond the limits of the shadow cast by the broad hill, glistened upon our sight that gay assemblage. Round them and above, glitter with dark recesses interposed, casement and cottage roof, and stems of trees half-veiled in vapory cloud. The silver steam of dews fast melting on their leafy boughs 
by the strong sunbeams smitten. Like a mast of gold, the maypole shines, as if the rays of morning, aided by exhaling dew with gladsome influence, could reanimate the faded garlands dangling from its sides. Said I, the music and the sprightly scene invite us. Shall we quit our road and join these festive matins? He replied, not loath to linger, I would here with you partake. Not one hour merely, but till evening's close, the simple pastimes of the day and place. By the fleet racers, ere the sun be set, the turf of yon large pasture will be skimmed. There, too, the lusty wrestlers shall contend. But know we not that he who intermits the appointed task and duties of the day, untunes full oft the pleasures of the day, checking the finer spirits that refuse to flow when purposes are lightly changed? A length of journey yet remains untraced. Let us proceed. Then, pointing with his staff raised toward those craggy summits, his intent he thus imparted. In a spot that lies among yon mountain fastnesses concealed, you will receive before the hour of noon good recompense, I hope, for this day's toil. From sight of one who lives secluded there, lonesome and lost, of whom and whose past life, not to forestall such knowledge as may be more faithfully collected from himself, this brief communication shall suffice. Though now sojourning there, he, like myself, sprang from a stock of lowly parentage among the wilds of Scotland, in a tract where many a sheltered and well-tended plant bears, on the humblest ground of social life, blossoms of piety and innocence. Such grateful promises his youth displayed, and having shown in study forward zeal, he to the ministry was duly called, and straight, incited by a curious mind filled with vague hopes, he undertook the charge of chaplain to a military troop cheered by the highland bagpipe as they marched in plated vest his fellow countrymen. This office filling, yet by native power and force of native inclination made an intellectual ruler in the haunts of social vanity, he walked the world, gay, and affecting graceful gaiety, lax, buoyant, less a pastor with his flock than a soldier among soldiers, lived and roamed where fortune led, and fortune, who oft proves the careless wanderer's friend, to him made known a blooming lady, a conspicuous flower, admired for beauty, for her sweetness praised, whom he had sensibility to love, ambition to attempt, and skill to win. For this fair bride, most rich in gifts of mind, nor sparingly endowed with worldly wealth, his office he relinquished, and retired from the world's notice to a rural home. Youth's season yet with him was scarcely past, and she was in youth's prime. How free their love, how full their joy, till pitiable doom, in the short course of one undreaded year, death blasted all. Death suddenly or through two lovely children, all that they possessed. The mother followed, miserably bare the one survivor stood. He wept, he prayed for his dismissal day and night, compelled to hold communion with the grave and face with pain the regions of eternity. An uncomplaining apathy displaced this anguish, and indifferent to delight, to aim and purpose, he consumed his days to private interest dead and public care. So lived he, so he might have died. But now, to the wide world's astonishment, appeared a glorious opening, the unlooked-for dawn, that promised everlasting joy to France. Her voice of social transport reached even him. He broke from his contracted bounds, repaired to the great city, an emporium then of golden expectations, and receiving freights every day from a new world of hope. Thither his popular talents he transferred, and from the pulpit zealously maintained the cause of Christ and civil liberty as one, and moving to one glorious end, intoxicating service, I might say a happy service, for he was sincere as vanity and fondness for applause, and new and shapeless wishes would allow. That righteous cause, such power hath freedom bound. For one hostility in friendly league, ethereal natures and the worst of slaves, was served by rival advocates that came from regions opposite as heaven and hell. One courage seemed to animate them all. 
and from the dazzling conquests they daily gained by their united efforts, there arose a proud and most presumptuous confidence in the transcendent wisdom of the age and her discernment. Not alone in rights and in the origin and bounds of power, social and temporal, but in laws divine, deduced by reason or to faith revealed. An overweening trust was raised and fear cast out, alike of person and of thing. Plague from this union spread, whose subtle bane the strongest did not easily escape, and he, what wonder, took a mortal taint. How shall I trace the change? How bear to tell that he broke faith with them whom he had laid in earth's dark chambers with a Christian's hope? An infidel contempt of holy writ stole by degrees upon his mind, and hence life, like that Roman Janus double-faced, vilest hypocrisy, the laughing gay hypocrisy, not leagued with fear, but pride. Smooth words he had to wheedle simple souls, but for dis disciples of the inner school, old freedom was old servitude, and they the wisest whose opinions stooped the least to known restraints, and who most boldly drew hopeful prognostications from a creed that in light of false philosophy spread like a halo round a misty moon, widening its circle as the storms advance. His sacred function was at length renounced, and every day and every place enjoyed the unshackled layman's natural liberty. Speech, manners, morals, all without disguise. I do not wish to wrong him. Though the course of private life licentiously displayed at unhallowed actions, planted like a crown upon the insolent, aspiring brow of spurious notions, worn as open signs of prejudice subdued, Still he retained, mid much abasement, what he had received from nature, an intense and glowing mind. Wherefore, when humble liberty grew weak and mortal sickness on her face appeared, he colored objects to his own desire as with a lover's passion. Yet his moods of pain were keen as those of better men, nay, keener as his fortitude was less. And he continued, when worse days were come, to deal about his sparkling eloquence struggling against the strange reverse with zeal that showed like happiness. But in despite of all this outside bravery within, he neither felt encouragement nor hope, for moral dignity and strength of mind were wanting and simplicity of life and reverence for himself and last and best confiding thoughts through love and fear of him before whose sight the troubles of this world are vain as billows in a tossing sea. The glory of the times fading away, the splendor which had given a festal air to self-importance hallowed it and veiled from his own sight. This gone, he forfeited all joy in human nature, was consumed and vexed and chafed by levity and scorn and fruitless indignation. Galled by pride, made desperate by contempt of men who throve before his sight in power or fame, and won without desert what he desired. Weak men, too weak even for his envy or his hate, tormented thus after a wandering course of discontent, and inwardly oppressed with malady, in part, I fear, provoked by weariness of life, he fixed his home, or rather say, sat down by very chance among these rugged hills, where now he dwells and wastes the sad remainder of his hours, steeped in a self-indulging spleen that wants not its own voluptuousness. On this resolved, with this content, that he will live and die forgotten at a safe distance from a world not moving to his mind. These serious words closed the preparatory notices that served my fellow traveler to beguile the way while we advanced up that wide vale. Diverging now, as if his quest had been some secret of the mountains, cavern, fall of water, or some lofty eminence, renowned for splendid prospect far and wide, we scaled, without a track to ease our steps, a steep ascent, and reached a dreary plain, with a tumultuous waste of huge hilltops before us, a savage region, which I paced dispirited, when all at once, behold, beneath our feet, a little lowly vale, a lowly vale, and yet uplifted high among the mountains. 
even as if the spot had been from eldest time by wish of theirs so placed to be shut out from all the world. Urn-like it was in shape, deep as an urn, with rocks encompassed, save to, that to the south was one small opening, where a heath-clad ridge supplied a boundary less abrupt and close, a quiet treeless nook with two green fields, a liquid pool that glittered in the sun, and one bare dwelling, one abode, no more. It seemed the home of poverty and toil, though not of want. The little fields made green by husbandry of many thrifty years pay cheerful tribute to the moorland house. There crows the cock, single in his domain, the small birds find in spring no thicket there to shroud them. Only from the neighboring vales the cuckoo, straggling up to the hilltops, shouteth faint tidings of some gladder place. Ah, what a sweet recess, thought I, is here. Instantly throwing down my limbs at ease upon a bed of heath, full many a spot of hidden beauty have I chanced to espy among the mountains, never one like this, so lonesome and so perfectly secure. Not melancholy, no, for it is green and bright and fertile, furnished in itself with the few needful things that life requires. In rugged arms, how softly does it lie, how tenderly protected. Far and near we have an image of the pristine earth, the planet in its nakedness. Were this man's only dwelling, soul-appointed seat, first, last, and single in the breathing world, it could not be more quiet. Peace is here or nowhere. Days unruffled by the gale of public news or private, years that pass forgetfully, uncalled upon to pay the common penalties of mortal life, sickness or accident, or grief or pain. Of these and kindred thoughts intent, I lay in silence, musing by my comrade's side, he also silent, when from out the heart of that profound abyss a solemn voice, or several voices in one solemn sound, was heard ascending, mournful, deep, and slow the cadence, as of psalms, a funeral dirge. We listened, looking down upon the hut, but seeing no one. Meanwhile, from below the strain continued, spiritual as before, and now distinctly could I recognize these words. Shall in the grave thy love be known, in death thy faithfulness? God rest his soul, said the old man, abruptly breaking silence. He is departed, and finds peace at last. This scarcely spoken, and those holy strains not ceasing, forth appeared in view a band of rustic persons, from behind the hut bearing a coffin in the midst, with which they shaped their course along the sloping side of that small valley, singing as they moved. A sober company and few, the men bareheaded and all decently attired. Some steps when they had thus advanced, the dirge ended, and from the stillness that ensued, recovering to my friend, I said, You spake, methought, with apprehension that these rites are paid to him upon whose shy retreat this day we propose to intrude. I did so, but let us hence, that we may learn the truth. Perhaps it is not he, but someone else, for whom this pious service is performed, some other tenant of the solitude. So to a steep and difficult descent trusting ourselves, we wound from crag to crag, where passage could be won. And as the last of the mute train behind the healthy top of that off-sloping outlet, disappeared, I, more impatient in my downward course, had landed upon easy ground, and there stood waiting for my comrade, when behold an object that enticed my steps aside. A narrow winding entry opened out into a platform that lay sheepfold-wise enclosed between an upright mass of rock and one old moss-grown wall, a cool recess and fanciful, for where the rock and wall met in an angle hung a penthouse framed by thrusting two rude staves into the wall and overlaying them with mountain sods, to weather-fend a little turf-built seat whereon a full-grown man might rest, nor dread the burning sunshine or a transient shower, but the whole plainly wrought by children's hands, whose skill had thronged the floor with a proud show of baby-houses cur curiously arranged, nor wanting ornament of walks between, with mimic trees inserted in the turf and gardens interposed. 
pleased with the sight, I could not choose but beckon to my guide, who entering round him through a careless glance, impatient to pass on, when I exclaimed, Lo, what is here? And stooping down, drew forth a book, that in the midst of stones and moss and wreck of party-colored earthenware, aptly disposed, had lent its help to raise one of those petty structures. His it must be, exclaimed the wanderer, cannot be but his. And he is gone. The book, which in my hand had opened of itself, for it was swollen with searching damp, and seemingly had lain to the injurious elements exposed from week to week, I found to be a work in the French tongue, a novel of Voltaire, his famous optimist. Unhappy man, exclaimed my friend. Here then has been to him retreat within retreat, a sheltering place within how deep a shelter. He had fits even to the last of genuine tenderness, and loved the haunts of children. Here, no doubt, pleasing and pleased, he shared their simple sports, or sat companionless. And here the book, left and forgotten in his careless way, must by the cottage children have been found. Heaven bless them and their inconsiderate work. To what odd purpose have the darlings turned this sad memorial of their hapless friend? Me, said I, most doth it surprise to find such a book in such a place. A book it is, he answered, to the person suited well, the little suited to surrounding things. To strange, I grant, and stranger still had been to see the man who owned it dwelling here with one poor shepherd far from all the world. Now, if our errand hath been thrown away, as from these intimations I forebode, grieved shall I be, less for my sake than yours, and least of all for him who is no more. By this the book was in the old man's hand, and he continued glancing on the leaves and eye of scorn. The lover, said he, Doomed to love when hope hath failed him, whom no depth of privacy is deep enough to hide, hath yet his bracelet or his lock of hair, and that is joy to him. When change of times hath summoned kings to scaffold, do but give the faithful servant who must hide his head henceforth in whatsoever nook he may, a kerchief sprinkled with his master's blood, and he too hath his comforter. How poor! Beyond all poverty, how destitute must that man have been left who, hither driven, flying or seeking, could yet bring with him no dearer relic and no better stay than this dull product of a scoffer's pen, impure conceits discharging from a heart hardened by impious pride. I did not fear to tax you with this journey, mildly said my venerable friend, as forth we stepped into the presence of the cheerful light. For I have knowledge that you do not shrink from moving spectacles. But let us on. So speaking, on he went. And at the word I followed, till he made a sudden stand. For full in view, approaching through a gate that opened from the enclosure of green fields into the rough, uncultivated ground, behold the man whom he had fancied dead. I knew from his deportment, mien, and dress that it could be no other a pale face, a meager person, tall, and in a garb not rustic, dull and faded like himself. He saw us not, though distant but few steps, for he was busy dealing from a store upon a broadleaf carried choicest strings of red ripe currants, gift by which he strove with intermixture of endearing words to soothe a child who walked beside him, weeping as if disconsolate. They to the grave are bearing him, my little one, he said, to the dark pit. But he will feel no pain. His body is at rest, his soul in heaven. More might have followed, but my honored friend broke in upon the speaker with a frank and cordial greeting. Vivid was the light that flashed and sparkled from the other's eyes. He was all fire. No shadow on his brow remained, nor sign of sickness on his face. Hands joined he with his visitant, a grasp, an eager grasp, and many moments' space, when the first glow of pleasure was no more, and of the sad appearance which at once had vanished, much was come and coming back, an amicable smile retained the life which it had unexpectedly received upon his hollow cheek. How kind, he said, nor could your coming have been better timed, for this, you see, is in our narrow world a day of sorrow. I have here a charge, 
and speaking thus, he patted tenderly the sunburnt forehead of the weeping child, a little mourner whom it is yet my task to comfort. But how came ye, if yon track with Dutch at once befriend us and betray, conducted hither your most welcome feet, you could not miss the funeral train, they yet have scarcely disappeared. This blooming child, said the old man, is of an age to weep at any grave or solemn spectacle, inly distressed or overpowered with awe. He knows not wherefore. But the boy today perhaps is shedding orphan's tears. You also must have sustained a loss. The hand of death, he answered, has been here, but could not well have fallen more lightly if it had not fallen upon myself. The other left these words unnoticed, thus continuing. From yon crag, down whose steep sides we dropped into the vale, we heard this hymn they sang, a solemn sound heard anywhere. But in a place like this, tis more than human. Many precious rites and customs of our rural ancestry are gone and stealing from us. This, I hope, will last forever. Oft on my way have I stood still, though but a casual passenger. So much I felt the awfulness of life. In that one moment when the course is lifted in silence with a hush of decency, then from the threshold moves with song of peace and confidential yearnings towards its home, its final home on earth. What traveler, who, how far soever a stranger, does not own the bond of brotherhood when he sees them go, a mute procession on the houseless road, or passing by some single tenement or clustered dwellings, where again they raise the monitory voice? But most of all, it touches, it confirms, and elevates. Then, when the body, soon to be consigned, ashes to ashes, dust bequeathed to dust, is raised from the church aisle and forward borne upon the shoulders of the next in love, the nearest in affection or in blood, yea, by the very mourners who had knelt beside the coffin, resting on its lid in silent grief their uplifted heads, and heard, meanwhile, the psalmist's mournful plaint, and that most awful scripture which declares, We shall not sleep, but we shall all be changed. Have I not seen, ye likewise may have seen, son, husband, brothers, brothers side by side, and son and father also side by side, rise from that posture, and in concert move, on the green turf following the vested priest, four dear supporters of one senseless weight from which they do not shrink and under which they faint not but advance towards the open grave step after step together with their firm unhidden faces he that suffers most he outwardly and inwardly perhaps the most serene with most undaunted eye oh blessed are they who live and die like these loved with such love and with such sorrow mourned that poor man taken hence today, replied the solitary, with a faint sarcastic smile which did not please me, must be deemed, I fear, of the unblessed, for he will surely sink into his mother earth without such pomp of grief, depart without occasion given by him for such a ray of fortitude. Full seventy winters hath he lived, and mark, this simple child will mourn this one short hour, and I shall miss him scanty tribute. Yet this wanting, he would leave the sight of men if love were his sole claim upon their care like a ripe date which in the desert falls without a hand to gather it. At this I interposed, though loath to speak, and said, Can it be thus among so small a band as ye must needs be here? In such a place I would not willingly, methinks, lose sight of a departing cloud. "'Twas not for love,' answered the sick man with a careless voice, "'that I came hither. "'Neither have I found among associates who have power of speech, "'nor in other such converse as is here, "'temptation so prevailing as to change that mood "'or undermine my first resolve.' "'Then speaking in like careless sort, he said to my benign companion, "'Pity tis that fortune did not guide you to this house a few days earlier.' Then you would have seen what stuff the dwellers in a solitude that seems by nature hollowed out to be the seat and bosom of pure innocence are made of, an ungracious matter this. Which, for truth's sake, yet in remembrance, too, of past discussions with this zealous friend and advocate of humble life, I now will force upon his notice, 
undeterred by the example of his own pure course and that respect and deference which a soul may fairly claim by niggard age enriched in what she most doth value love of God and his frail creature man but ye shall hear I talk and ye are standing in the sun without refreshment quickly had he spoken and with light steps still quicker than his words led toward the cottage Homely was the spot, and to my feeling ere we reached the door had almost a forbidding nakedness. Less fair, I grant, even painfully less fair than it appeared when from the beetling rock we had looked down upon it. All within, as left by the departed company, was silent, save the solitary clock that on mine ear ticked with a mournful sound. Following our guide, we clomb the cottage stairs and reached a small apartment, dark and low, which was no sooner entered than our host said gaily, This is my domain, my cell, my hermitage, my cabin, what you will. I love it better than a snail his house. But ye shall be feasted with our best. So with more ardor than an unripe girl left one day mistress of her mother's stores, he went about his hospitable task. My eyes were busy and my thoughts no less, and pleased I looked upon my gray-haired friend as if to thank him. He returned that look, cheered, plainly and yet serious. What a wreck had we about us. Scattered was the floor, and in like sort chair, window seat and shelf, with books, maps, fossiled, withered plants and flowers, and tufts of mountain moss. Mechanic tools lay intermixed with scraps of paper, some scribbled with verse, a broken angling rod and shattered telescope, together linked by cobwebs, stood within a dusty nook, and instruments of music, some half-made, some in disgrace, hung dangling from the walls. But speedily the promise was fulfilled, a feast before us and a courteous host inviting us in glee to sit and eat, a napkin white as foam, as of that rough brook by which it had been bleached or spread the board was itself half covered with a store of dainties, oaten bread, curd, cheese, and cream, and cakes of butter curiously embossed, butter that had imbibed from mountain meadows a golden hue, delicate as their own faintly reflected in a lingering stream. Nor lacked for more delight on that warm day our table, small parade of garden fruits and whortleberries from the mountainside. The child, who long ere this had stilled his sobs, was now a help to his late comforter, and moved a willing page as he was bid, ministering to our need. In genial mood, while at our pastoral banquet thus we sat fronting the window of that little cell, I could not, ever and anon, forbear to glance an upward look on two huge peaks that from some other vale peered into this. Those lusty twins, exclaimed our host. If here it were your lot to dwell, would soon become your prized companions. Many are the notes which in his tuneful course the wind draws forth from rocks, woods, caverns, heaths, and dashing shores. And well those lofty brethren bear their part in the wild concert, chiefly when the storm rides high. Then all the upper air they fill with roaring sound that ceases not to flow like smoke along the level of the blast and mighty current. Theirs, too, is the song of stream and headlong flood that seldom fails. And in the grim and breathless hour of noon, methinks that I have heard them echo back the thunder's greeting. Nor have nature's laws left them ungifted with a power to yield music of finer tone, a harmony. So do I call it, though it be the hand of silence, though there be no voice. The clouds, the mist, the shadows, light of golden suns, Motions of moonlight all come thither, touch and have an answer. Thither come and shape a language not unwelcome to sick hearts and idle spirits. There the sun himself, at the calm close of summer's longest day, rests his substantial orb. Between those heights and on the top of either pinnacle, more keenly than elsewhere in night's blue vault, sprinkle the stars as of their station proud. Thoughts are not busier in the mind of man than the mute agents stirring there, alone. Here do I sit and watch, a fall of voice, regretted like the nightingale's last note, had scarcely closed this high-wrought strain of rapture. Ere with inviting smile the wanderer said, Now for the tale with which you threatened us. 
In truth, the threat escaped me unawares. Should the tale tire you, let this challenge stand for my excuse. Dissevered from mankind, as to your eyes and thoughts we must have seen when ye looked down upon us from the crag, islanders mid a stormy mountain sea, we are not so. Perpetually we touch upon the vulgar ordinances of the world. And he whom this our cottage hath today relinquished lived dependent for his bread upon the laws of public charity. The housewife, tempted by such slender gains as might from that occasion be distilled, opened, as she before had done for me, her doors to admit this homeless pensioner. The portion gave, of course, but wholesome fare which appetite required. A blind, dull nook, such as she had, not the kennel of his rest. This, in itself not ill, would yet have been ill-born in earlier life, but his was now the still contentedness of seventy years. Calm did he sit under the widespread tree of his old age, and yet less calm and meek, winningly meek or venerably calm than slow and torpid, paying in this wise a penalty, if penalty it were, for spendthrift feats, excesses of his prime. I loved the old man, for I pitied him. A task it was, I own, to hold discourse with one so slow in gathering up his thoughts. But he was a cheap pleasure to my eyes, mild, inoffensive, ready in his way, and helpful to his utmost power, and there our housewife knew full well what she possessed. He was her vassal of all labor, tilled her garden, from the pasture fetched her kine, and one among the orderly array of haymakers beneath the burning sun maintained his place, or heedfully pursued his course on errands bound to other vales, leading sometimes an inexperienced child too young for any profitable task. So moved he like a shadow that performed substantial service. Mark me now, and learn for what reward the moon her monthly round had not completed since our dame, the queen of this one cottage and this lonely dale, into my little sanctuary rushed, voice to a rueful treble humanized, and features in deplorable dismay. I treat the matter lightly, but alas, it is most serious. Persevering rain had fallen in torrents. All the mountain tops were hidden, and black vapors coursed their sides. Thus had I seen and saw, but till she spake was wholly ignorant that my ancient friend, who at her bidding early and alone had clomb aloft to delve the moorland turf for winter fuel, to his noontide meal returned not, and now haply on the heights lay at the mercy of this raging storm. Inhuman, said I, was an old man's life not worth the trouble of a thought? Alas, this notice comes too late. With joy I saw her husband enter from a distant vale. We sallied forth together, found the tools which the neglected veteran had dropped, but through all quarters looked for him in vain. We shouted, but no answer. Darkness fell without remission of the blast or shower, and fears for our own safety drove us home. I, who weep little, did, I will confess, the moment I was seated here alone, honor my little cell with some few tears which anger and resentment could not dry. All night the storm endured, and soon as help had been collected from the neighboring vale, with morning we renewed our quest. The wind was fallen, the rain abated, but the hills lay shrouded in impenetrable mist, and long and hopelessly we sought in vain, till chancing on that lofty ridge to pass a heap of ruin, almost without walls and wholly without roof, the bleached remains of a small chapel where in ancient time the peasants of these lonely valleys used to meet for worship on that central height. We there espied the object of our search, lying full three parts buried among tufts of heath plant, under and above him strewn, to baffle as he might the watery storm. And there we found him breathing peaceably, snug as a child that hides itself in sport mid a green haycock in a sunny field. We spake, he made reply, but would not stir at our entreaty, less from want of power than apprehension and bewildering thoughts. So he was lifted gently from the ground. And with their freight homeward, the shepherds moved through the dull mist, I following, when a step, a single step, it freed me from the skirts of the blind vapor, open to my view, glory beyond all glory ever seen by waking sense or by the dreaming soul. The appearance, instantaneously disclosed, was of a mighty city, boldly say a wilderness of building, sinking far and self-withdrawn into a boundless depth, 
far sinking into splendor without end. Fabric, it seemed, of diamond and of gold, with alabaster domes and silver spires, and blazing terrace upon terrace high uplifted, here serene pavilions bright in avenues disposed, there towers begirt with battlements that on their restless fronts bore stars, illumination of all gems. By earthly nature had the effect been wrought upon the dark materials of the storm now pacified, on them, and on the coves and mountain steeps and summits, whereunto the vapors had receded, taking there their station under a cerulean sky. Oh, t'was an unimaginable sight, clouds, mists, streams, watery rocks and emerald turf, clouds of all tincture, rocks and sapphire sky, confused, commingled, mutually inflamed, molten together, and composing thus each lost in each, that marvelous array of temple, palace, citadel, and huge, fantastic pomp of structure without name, in fleecy folds voluminous and wrapped. Right in the midst, where inner space appeared of an open court, an object like a throne under a shining canopy of state stood fixed, and fixed resemblances were seen to implements of ordinary use, but vast in size, in substance glorified, such as by Hebrew prophets were beheld in vision, forms uncouth of mightiest power for admiration and mysterious awe. This little veil, a dwelling place of man, lay low beneath my feet. T'was visible, I saw not, but I felt that it was there. That which I saw was the revealed abode of spirits in beatitude. My heart swelled in my breast. I have been dead, I cried, and now I live. Oh, wherefore do I live? And with that pang I prayed to be no more. But I forget our charge, as utterly I then forgot him. There I stood and gazed. The apparition faded not away, and I descended. Having reached the house, I found its rescued inmate safely lodged, and in serene possession of himself, beside a fire whose genial warmth seemed met by a faint shining from the heart, a gleam of comfort spread over his pallid face. Great show of joy the housewife made, and truly was glad to find her conscience set at ease. And not less glad, for sake of her good name, that the poor sufferer had escaped with life. But though he seemed at first to have received no harm, and uncomplaining as before went through his usual tasks, a silent change soon showed itself. He lingered three short weeks, and from the cottage hath been born today. So ends my dolorous tale, and glad I am that it is ended. At these words he turned, and with blithe air of open fellowship, brought from the cupboard wine and stouter cheer, like one who would be merry. Seeing this, my gray-haired friend said courteously, Nay, nay, you have regaled us as a hermit ought. Now let us forth into the sun. Our host rose, though reluctantly, and forth we went. End of Book Second of The Excursion by William Wordsworth The Excursion, Book Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Excursion, by William Wordsworth. Book Third, Despondency. A humming bee, a little tinkling rill, a pair of falcons wheeling on the wing. In clamorous agitation, round the crest of a tall rock, their airy citadel. By each and all of these, the pensive ear was greeted in the silence that ensued. When through the cottage threshold we had passed, and deep within that lonesome valley, stood once more beneath the concave of a blue and cloudless sky. Anon exclaimed our host, triumphantly dispersing with the taunt the shade of discontent which on his brow had gathered. Ye have left my cell, but see how nature hems you in with friendly arms. And by her help, ye are my prisoners still. But which way shall I lead you? How contrive in spots so parsimoniously endowed? 
that the brief hours which yet remain may reap some recompense of knowledge or delight. So saying, round he looked as if perplexed, and to remove those doubts, my gray-haired friend said, Shall we take this pathway for our guide? Upward it winds, as if in summer heats its line had first been fashioned by the flock seeking a place of refuge at the root of yon black yew tree, whose protruded boughs darken the silver bosom of the crag from which she draws her meager sustenance. There, in commodious shelter, may we rest. Or let us trace this streamlet to its source. Feebly it tinkles with an earthly sound, and a few steps may bring us to the spot where, haply crowned with flowerets and green herbs, the mountain infant to the sun comes forth, like human life from darkness. A quick turn through a straight passage of encumbered ground proved that such hope was vain, for now we stood shut out from prospect of the open vale, and saw the water that composed this rill descending, disembodied and diffused o'er the smooth surface of an ample crag, lofty and steep, and naked as a tower. All further progress here was barred, and who thought I, if master of a vacant hour, here would not linger willingly detained? Whether to such wild objects he were led, when copious rains have magnified the stream into a loud and white-robed waterfall, or introduced at this more quiet time. Upon a semicirc of turf-clad ground, the hidden nook discovered to our view a mass of rock, resembling as it lay right at the foot of that moist precipice a stranded ship with keel upturned that rests fearless of winds and waves. Three several stones stood near of smaller size, and not unlike two monumental pillars. And from these some little space disjoined a pair were seen, that with united shoulders bore aloft a fragment, like an altar flat and smooth. Barren the tablet, yet thereon appeared a tall and shining holly that had found an hospitable chink, and stood upright, as if inserted by some human hand in mockery, to wither in the sun or lay its beauty flat before a breeze, the first that entered. But no breeze did now find entrance. High or low appeared no trace of motion, save the water that descended, diffused adown that barrier of steep rock, and softly creeping like a breath of air, such as is sometimes seen and hardly seen to brush the still breast of a crystal lake. Behold a cabinet for sages built, which kings might envy, Praise to this effect broke from the happy old man's reverend lip, who to the solitary turned and said, In sooth, with love's familiar privilege, you have decried the wealth which is your own. Among these rocks and stones, methinks, I see more than the heedless impress that belongs to lonely nature's casual work. They bear a semblance strange of power intelligent, and of design not wholly worn away. Boldest of plants that ever faced the wind, how gracefully that slender shrub looks forth from its fantastic birthplace. And I own some shadowy intimations haunt me here, that in these shows a chronicle survives of purposes akin to those of man, but wrought with mightier arm than now prevails. Voiceless the stream descends into the gulf with timid lapse, and lo, while in this strait I stand, the chasm of sky above my head, is heaven's profoundest azure, no domain for fickle, short-lived clouds to occupy or to pass through, but rather an abyss in which the everlasting stars abide, and whose soft gloom and boundless depth might tempt the curious eye to look for them by day. Hail contemplation from the stately towers reared by the industrious hand of human art to lift thee high above the misty air and turbulence of murmuring cities vast, from academic groves that have for thee been planted, hither come and find a lodge to which thou mayst resort for holier peace, from whose calm center thou, through height or depth, mayst penetrate wherever truth shall lead, measuring through all degrees until the scale of time and unconscious nature disappear, lost in unsearchable eternity. A pause ensued, and with minuter care we scanned the various features of the scene, and soon the tenant of that lonely vale with courteous voice thus spake. 
I should have grieved hereafter, not escaping self-reproach, if from my poor retirement ye had gone leaving this nook unvisited. But in sooth your unexpected presence had so roused my spirits that they were bent on enterprise, and like an ardent hunter I forgot, or shall I say disdained, the game that lurks at my own door. The shapes before our eyes and their arrangement doubtless must be deemed the sport of nature, aided by blind chance rudely to mock the works of toiling man. And hence this upright shaft of unhewn stone from fancy, willing to set off her stores by sounding titles, hath acquired the name of Pompey's Pillar, that I gravely style my Theban obelisk, and there behold a druid cromlech, Thus I entertain the antiquarian humor, and am pleased to skim along the surfaces of things, beguiling harmlessly the listless hours. But if the spirit be oppressed by sense of instability, revolt, decay, and change and emptiness, these freaks of nature and her blind helper chance do then suffice to quicken and to aggravate, to feed pity and scorn and melancholy pride, not less than that huge pile from some abyss of mortal power unquestionably sprung, whose hoary diadem of pendant rocks confines the shrill-voiced whirlwind, round and round eddying within its vast circumference on Sarum's naked plains. Then Pyramid of Egypt, unsubverted, undissolved, or Syria's marble ruins towering high above the sandy desert in the light of sun or moon. Raised your minds to an exalted pitch, the selfsame cause different effect producing, is for me fraught rather with depression than delight. Though shame it were, could I not look around by the reflection of your pleasure, pleased. Yet happier in my judgment, even than you with your bright transports, fairly may be deemed the wandering herbalist, who clear alike from vain and that worse evil vexing thoughts, casts if he ever chanced to enter here, upon these uncouth forms a slight regard of transitory interest, and peeps round for some rare floweret of the hills, or plant of craggy fountain, what he hopes for wins or learns, at least, that tis not to be won. Then keen and eager as a fine-nosed hound, by soul-engrossing instinct driven along through wood or open field, the harmless man departs, intent upon his onward quest. Nor is that fellow wanderer so deem I less to be envied. You may trace him off by scars which his activity has left beside our roads and pathways, though, thank heaven, this covert nook reports not of his hand. He who with pocket hammer smites the edge of luckless rock or prominent stone, disguised in weather stains or crusted ore by nature with her first growths, detaching by the stroke a chip or splinter, to resolve his doubts, and with that ready answer satisfied, the substance classes by some barbarous name and hurries on, or from the fragments picks his specimen, if but haply interveined with sparkling mineral, or should crystal cube lurk in its cells and thinks himself enriched, wealthier and doubtless wiser than before, entrusted safely each to his pursuit, earnest alike, let both from hill to hill range, if it please them, speed from climb to climb. The mind is full and free from pain, their pastime. Then said I, interposing, one is near, who cannot but possess in your esteem place worthier still of envy. May I name without offense that fair-faced cottage boy, Dame Nature's pupil of the lowest form, youngest apprentice in the school of art. Him, as we entered from the open glen, you might have noticed, busily engaged, heart, soul, and hands, in mending the defects left in the fabric of a leaky dam, raised for enabling this penurious stream to turn a slender rill, that new-made plaything for his delight, the happiest, he of all. Far happiest, answered the desponding man. If such as now he is, he might remain. Ah, what avails imagination high or question deep? What profits all that earth or heaven's blue vault is suffered to put forth of impulse or allurement for the soul to quit the beaten track of life and soar far as she finds a yielding element in past or future? 
far as she can go through time or space, if neither in the one nor in the other region, nor in aught that fancy, dreaming or the map of things hath placed beyond these penetrable bounds, words of assurance can be heard, if nowhere a habitation for consummate good or for progressive virtue by the search can be attained, a better sanctuary from doubt and sorrow than the senseless grave. Is this, the gray-haired wanderer mildly said, the voice which we so lately overheard to that same child addressing tenderly the consolations of a hopeful mind? His body is at rest, his soul in heaven. These were your words, and verily methinks wisdom is oft times nearer when we stoop than when we soar. The other, not displeased, promptly replied, My notion is the same. And I, without reluctance, could decline all active inquisition once we rise, and what, when breath has ceased, we may become. Here are we in a bright and breathing world. Our origin, what matters it? In lack of worthier explanation, say at once with the American, a thought which suits the place where now we stand, that certain men leaped out together from a rocky cave, and these were the first parents of mankind. Or if a different image be recalled by the warm sunshine and the jocund voice of insects chirping out their careless lives on these soft beds of time-besprinkled turf, choose with the gay Athenian a conceit a sound, blithe race, whose mantles were bedecked with golden grasshoppers, in sign that they had sprung like those bright creatures from the soil whereon their endless generations dwelt. But stop. These theoretic fancies jar on serious minds. Then as the Hindus draw their holy Ganges from a skyey fount, even so deduce the stream of human life from seats of power divine, and hope or trust that our existence winds her stately course beneath the sun like Ganges to make part of a living concern, or to sink engulfed like Niger, in impenetrable sands and utter darkness, thought which may be faced, though comfortless. Not of myself I speak, such acquiescence neither doth imply in me a meekly bending spirit soothed by natural piety, nor a lofty mind, by philosophic discipline prepared for calm subjection to acknowledged law, pleased to have been, contented not to be. Such palms I boast not, no, to me who find reviewing my past way much to condemn, little to praise, and nothing to regret, save some resemblances of dreamlike joys that scarcely seem to have belonged to me. If I must take my choice between the pair that rule alternately the weary hours, night is than day more acceptable. Sleep doth in my estimate of good appear a better state than waking, death than sleep. Feelingly sweet is stillness after storm, though under covert of the wormy ground. Yet be it said in justice to myself, that in more genial times, when I was free to explore the destiny of humankind, not as an intellectual game pursued with curious subtlety, from wish to cheat irksome sensations, but by love of truth urged on, or haply by intense delight in feeding thought, wherever thought could feed, I did not rank with those too dull or nice, for, for to my judgment such they then appeared, or too aspiring, thankless at the best. Who in this frame of human life perceive an object whereunto their souls are tied in discontented wedlock? Nor did e'er from me those dark impervious shades that hang upon the region whither we are bound exclude a power to enjoy the vital beams of present sunshine. Deities that float on wings, angelic spirits, I could muse o'er what from eldest time we have been told of your bright forms and glorious faculties, and with the imagination rest content, not wishing more, repining not to tread the little sinuous path of earthly care, by flowers embellished and by springs refreshed. Blow, winds of autumn, let your chilling breath take the live herbage from the mead and strip the shady forest of its green attire. And let the bursting clouds to fury rouse the gentle brooks. Your desolating sway sheds, I exclaimed, no sadness upon me, and no disorder in your rage, I find. 
What dignity, what beauty in this change from mild to angry and from sad to gay, alternate and revolving. How benign, how rich in animation and delight. How bountiful these elements, compared with aught, as more desirable and fair, devised by fancy for the golden age, or the perpetual warbling that prevails in Arcady, beneath unaltered skies. Through the long year in constant quiet bound, night hushed as night and day serene as day. But why this tedious record? Age, we know, is garrulous, and solitude is apt to anticipate the privilege of age. From far ye come, and surely with a hope of better entertainment, let us hence. Loath to forsake the spot, and still more loath to be diverted from our present theme, I said, My thoughts agreeing, sir, with yours would push this censure farther. For if smiles of scornful pity be the just reward of poesy, thus courteously employed in framing models to improve the scheme of man's existence, and recast the world, why should not grave philosophy be styled herself a dreamer of a kindred stock, a dreamer yet more spiritless and dull? Yes, shall the fine immunities she boasts establish sounder titles of esteem for her, who all too timid and reserved for onset, for resistance too inert, too weak for suffering, and for hope too tame, placed among flowery gardens curtained round with world-excluding groves, the brotherhood of soft Epicureans, taught, if they the ends of being would secure and win the crown of wisdom, to yield up their souls to a voluptuous unconcern, preferring tranquility to all things. Or is she, I cried, more worthy of regard, the power who for the sake of sterner quiet closed the Stoic's heart against the vain approach of admiration and all sense of joy? His countenance gave notice that my zeal accorded little with his present mind. I ceased, and he resumed. Ah, gentle sir, slight, if you will, the means, but spare to slight the end of those who did by system rank as the prime object of a wise man's aim, security from shock of accident, release from fear, and cherished peaceful days for their own sakes, as mortal life's chief good and only reasonable felicity. What motive drew, what impulse, I would ask, through a long course of later ages, drove the hermit to his cell in forest wide? Or what detained him till his closing eyes took their last farewell of the sun and stars fast anchored in the desert? Not alone dread of the persecuting sword, remorse, wrongs unredressed, or insults unavenged and unavengeable, Defeated pride, prosperity subverted, maddening want, friendship betrayed, affection unreturned, love with despair or grief and agony. Not always from intolerable pangs he fled, but compassed round by pleasure, sighed for independent happiness, craving peace, the central feeling of all happiness, not as a refuge from distress or pain, a breathing time, vacation or a truce, but for its absolute self, a life of peace, stability without regret or fear, that hath been, is, and shall be evermore, such the reward he sought, and wore out his life there, where on few external things his heart was set, and those his own, or if not his, subsisting under nature's steadfast law. What other yearning was the master tie of the monastic brotherhood, upon rock aerial or in green secluded vale, one after one collected from afar an undissolving fellowship. What but this, the universal instinct of repose, the longing for confirmed tranquility inward and outward, humble yet sublime, the life where hope and memory are as one, where earth is quiet and her face unchanged, save by the simplest toil of human hands or season's difference, the immortal soul consistent in self-rule, and heaven revealed to meditation in that quietness. Such was their scheme, and though the wished-for end by multitudes was missed, perhaps attained by none, they for the attempt and pains employed do in my present censure stand redeemed from the unqualified disdained that once would have been cast upon them by my voice delivering her decisions from the seat of forward youth, 
that scruples not to solve doubts and determine questions by the rules of inexperienced judgment, ever prone to overweening faith, and is inflamed by courage to demand from real life the test of act and suffering, to provoke hostility, how dreadful when it comes, whether affliction be the foe or guilt. A child of earth I rested, in that stage of my past course to which these thoughts advert, upon earth's native energies, forgetting that mine was a condition which required nor energy nor fortitude, a calm without vicissitude, which if the like had been presented to my view elsewhere, I might have even been tempted to despise. But no, for the serene was also bright, enlivened happiness with joy or flowing with joy, and oh, that memory should survive to speak the word with rapture, nature's boon, life's genuine inspiration, happiness above what rules can teach or fancy feign, abused as all possessions are abused that are not prized according to their worth. And yet what worth, what good is given to men more solid than the gilded clouds of heaven? What joy more lasting than a vernal flower? None. Tis the general plaint of humankind in solitude and mutually addressed from each to all for wisdom's sake. This truth the priest announces from his holy seat and crowned with garlands in the summer grove, the poet fits it to his pensive lyre. Yet ere that final resting place be gained, sharp contradictions may arise by doom of this same life, compelling us to grieve that the prosperities of love and joy should be permitted oft times to endure so long and be at once cast down forever. O oh, tremble ye, to whom hath been assigned a course of days composing happy months, and they as happy years. The present still so like the past, and both so firm a pledge of a congenial future, that the wheels of pleasure move without the aid of hope, for mutability is nature's bane, and slighted hope will be avenged. And when ye need her favors, ye shall find her not, but in her stead fear, doubt, and agony. This was the bitter language of the heart. But while he spake, look, gesture, tone of voice, though discomposed and vehement, were such as skill and graceful nature might suggest to a proficient of the tragic scene standing before the multitude, beset with dark events. Desirous to divert or stem the current of the speaker's thought, we signified a wish to leave that place of stillness and close privacy, a nook that seemed for self-examination made, or for confession in the sinner's need hidden from all men's view. To our attempt he yielded not, but pointing to a slope of mossy turf defended from the sun and on that couch inviting us to rest, full on that tender-hearted man he turned a serious eye and his speech thus removed. You never saw, your eyes never did look on the bright form of her whom once I loved. Her silver voice was heard upon the earth, a sound unknown to you. Else, honored friend, your heart had borne a pitiable share of what I suffered when I wept that loss, and suffer now not seldom from the thought that I remember and can weep no more. Stripped as I am of all the golden fruit of self-esteem, and by the cutting blasts of self-reproach familiarly assailed, yet would I not be of such wintry barrenness but that some leaf of your regard should hang upon my naked branches. Lively thoughts give birth full often to unguarded words. I grieve that in your presence, from my tongue too much of frailty hath already dropped, but that too much demands still more. You know, reverend compatriot, and to you, kind sir, not to be deemed a stranger as you come following the guidance of these welcome feet to our secluded vale, that my demerits did not sue in vain to one on whose mild radiance many gazed with hope and all with pleasure. This fair bride, in the devotedness of youthful love, preferring me to parents and the choir of gay companions to the natal roof, at all known places and familiar sights, resigned with sadness gently weighing down her trembling expectations, but no more than did to her due honor 
and to me yielded that day a confidence sublime in what I had to build upon. This bride, young, modest, meek, and beautiful, I led to a low cottage in a sunny bay, where the salt sea innocuously breaks, and the sea breeze as innocently breathes on Devon's leafy shores, a sheltered hold in a soft clime encouraging the soil to a luxuriant bounty. As our steps approached the embowered abode, our chosen seat, sea rooted in the earth her kindly bed, the unendangered myrtle decked with flowers before the threshold stands to welcome us. While in the flowering myrtle's neighborhood, not overlooked but courting no regard, those native plants, the holly and the yew, gave modest intimation to the mind how willingly their aid they would unite with the green myrtle to endear the hours of winter and protect that pleasant place. Wild were the walks upon those lonely downs, track leading into track, how marked, how worn into bright verdure between fern and gorse, winding away its never-ending line on their smooth surface, evidence was none. But there lay open to our daily haunt a range of unappropriated earth, where youth's ambitious feet might move at large. Whence unmolested wanderers we beheld the shining giver of the day diffuse his brightness or attract of sea and land gay as our spirits, free as our desires, as our enjoyments boundless. From those heights we dropped at pleasure into sylvan combs where arbors of impenetrable shade and mossy seats detained us side by side with hearts at ease and knowledge in our hearts that all the grove and all the day was ours. Oh, happy time! Still happier was at hand, for nature called my partner to resign her share in the pure freedom of that life enjoyed by us in common. To my hope, to my heart's wish, my tender mate became the thankful captive of maternal bonds, and those wild paths were left to me alone. There could I meditate on folly's past, and like a weary voyager escaped from risk and hardship, inwardly retrace a course of vain delights and thoughtless guilt and self-indulgence without shame pursued. There undisturbed could think of and could thank her whose submissive spirit was to me rule and restraint, my guardian. Shall I say that earthly providence, whose guiding love within a port of rest had lodged me safe, safe from temptation and from danger far? Strains followed of acknowledgment, addressed to an authority, enthroned above the reach of sight, from whom, as from their source, proceed all visible ministers of good that walk the earth, father of heaven and earth, father and king and judge, adored and feared. These acts of mind and memory and heart and spirit, interrupted and relieved by observations transient as the glance of flying sunbeams, or to the outward form cleaving with power inherent and intense, as the mute insect fixed upon the plant on whose soft leaves it hangs and from whose cup it draws its nourishment imperceptibly, endeared my wanderings and the mother's kiss and infant's smile awaited my return. In privacy we dwelt a wedded pair, companions daily, often all day long, not placed by fortune within easy reach of various intercourse, nor wishing aught beyond the allowance of our own fireside, the twain within our happy cottage born, inmates and heirs of our united love, graced mutually by difference of sex, and with no wider interval of time between their several births than served for one to establish something of a leader's sway, yet left them joined by sympathy and age, equals in pleasure, fellows in pursuit. On these two pillars rested as in air our solitude. It soothes me to perceive your courtesy withholds not from my words attentive audience. But, oh, gentle friends, as times of quiet and unbroken peace Though for a nation times of blessedness give back faint echoes from the historian's page, so in the imperfect sounds of this discourse, depressed I hear, how faithless is the voice which those most blissful days reverberate. What special record can or need be given to rules and habits whereby much was done, but all within the sphere of little things, 
of humble though to us important cares and precious interests. Smoothly did our life advance, swerving not from the path prescribed, her annual, her diurnal, round alike, maintained with faithful care. And you divine the worst effects that our condition saw, if you imagine changes slowly wrought, and in their progress unperceivable, not wished for, sometimes noticed with a sigh, what air of good or lovely they might bring, sighs of regret, for the familiar good and loveliness endeared which they removed. Seven years of occupation, undisturbed, established seemingly a right to hold that happiness, and use and habit gave to what an alien spirit had acquired a patrimonial sanctity. And thus, with thoughts and wishes bounded to this world, I lived and breathed, most grateful, if to enjoy without repining or desire for more, for different lot or change to higher sphere, only accept some impulses of pride with no determined object, though upheld by theories with suitable support, most grateful. If in such wise to enjoy be proof of gratitude for what we have, else I allow most thankless. But at once, from some dark seat of fatal power, was urged a claim that shattered all. Our blooming girl, caught in the grip of death, with such brief time to struggle in as scarcely would allow her cheek to change its color, was conveyed from us to inaccessible worlds, to regions where height or depth admits not the approach of living man, though longing to pursue. With even as brief a warning, and how soon, with what short interval of time between, I tremble yet to think of, our last prop, our happy life's only remaining stay, the brother followed, and was seen no more. Calm as a frozen lake when ruthless winds blow fiercely, agitating earth and sky, the mother now remained, as if in her, who to the lowest region of the soul had been erewhile unsettled and disturbed this second visitation, had no power to shake, but only to bind up and seal, and to establish thankfulness of heart in heaven's determinations ever just. The eminence whereon her spirit stood, mine was unable to attain immense the space that severed us. But as the sight communicates with heaven's ethereal orbs incalculably distant, so I felt that consolation may descend from far, and that is intercourse and union too, while overcome with speechless gratitude and with a holier love inspired, I looked on her, at once superior to my woes and partner of my loss. Oh, heavy change! Dimness o'er this clear luminary crept insensibly. The immortal and divine yielded to mortal reflux. Her pure glory, as from the pinnacle of worldly state wretched ambition drops astounded, fell into a gulf obscure of silent grief and keen heart anguish, of itself ashamed, yet obstinately cherishing itself. And so consumed, she melted from my arms and left me on this earth disconsolate. What followed cannot be reviewed in thought, much less retraced in words. If she of life blameless, so intimate with love and joy and all the tender motions of the soul had been supplanted, could I hope to stand infirm, dependent, and now destitute? I called on dreams and visions to disclose that which is veiled from waking thought, conjured eternity, as men constrain a ghost to appear and answer. To the grave I spake imploringly, looked up and asked the heavens if angels traversed their cerulean floors, if fixed or wandering star could tidings yield of the departed spirit, what abode it occupies, what consciousness retains of former loves and interests. Then my soul turned inward to examine of what stuff time's fetters are composed and life was put to inquisition long and profitless. By pain of heart, now checked and now impelled, the intellectual power, through words and things, went sounding on a dim and perilous way. And from those transports and these toils abstruse, some trace and I, am I enabled to retain of time else lost, existing unto me only by records in myself not found. From that abstraction I was roused, 
and how? Even as a thoughtful shepherd by a flash of lightning startled in a gloomy cave of these wild hills. For lo, the dread Bastille, with all the chambers in its horrid towers, fell to the ground by violence overthrown of indignation, and with shouts that drowned the crash it made in falling. From the wreck a golden palace rose, or seemed to rise, the appointed seat of equitable law and mild paternal sway. The potent shock I felt, transformation I perceived, as marvelously seized as in that moment when, from the blind mist issuing, I beheld glory beyond all glory ever seen, confusion infinite of heaven and earth, dazzling the soul. Meanwhile, prophetic harps in every grove were ringing, War shall cease. Did ye not hear that conquest is abjured? Bring garlands, bring forth choicest flowers to deck the tree of liberty. My heart rebounded. My melancholy voice the chorus joined. Be joyful, all ye nations, in all lands, ye that are capable of joy. Be glad. Henceforth, whate'er is wanting to yourselves, in others ye shall promptly find. And all enriched by mutual and reflected wealth shall with one heart honor their common kind. Thus was I reconverted to the world. Society became my glittering bride, and airy hopes, my children. From the depths of natural passion, seemingly escaped my soul, diffused herself in wide embrace of institutions and the forms of things, as they exist in mutable array upon life's surface. What though in my veins there flowed no Gallic blood, nor had I breathed the air of France, not less than Gallic zeal kindled and burnt among the sapless twigs of my exhausted heart. If busy men in sober conclave met to weave a web of amity, whose living threads should stretch beyond the seas and to the farthest pole, there did I sit assisting. If with noise and acclamation crowds in open air express the tumult of their minds, my voice there mingled, heard or not, the powers of song I left not uninvoked, and in still groves where mild enthusiasts tuned a pensive lay of thanks and expectation, in accord with their belief, I sang Saturnian rule returned, a progeny of golden years permitted to descend and bless mankind. With promises the Hebrew scriptures teem, I felt their invitation and resumed a long suspended office in the house of public worship, where the glowing phrase of ancient inspiration serving me, I promised also with undaunted trust foretold an added prayer to prophecy, the admiration winning of the crowd, the help desiring of the pure devout. Scorn and contempt forbid me to proceed. But history, time's slavish scribe, will tell how rapidly the zealots of the cause disbanded or in hostile ranks appeared. Some tired of honest service, these outdone, disgusted therefore, or appalled by aims of fiercer zealots. So confusion reigned, and the more faithful were compelled to exclaim, as Brutus did to virtue, Liberty, I worship thee, and find thee but a shade. Such recantation had for me no charm, nor would I bend to it. Who should have grieved at aught, however fair, that bore the mean of a conclusion or catastrophe? Why then conceal that when the simply good and timid selfishness withdrew, I sought other support, not scrupulous where it, whence it came, and by what compromise it stood, not nice, even if notions seemed to be high-pitched and quantities determined? Among men so character did I maintain a strife hopeless, and still more hopeless every hour. But in the process I began to feel that if the emancipation of the world were missed, I should at least secure my own and be in part compensated. For rights widely, inveterately usurped upon, I spake with vehemence, and promptly seized all that abstraction furnished for my needs and purposes, nor scrupled to proclaim and propagate by liberty of life those new persuasions. Not that I rejoiced or even found pleasure in such vagrant course for its own sake, but farthest from the walk which I had trod in happiness and peace was most inviting to a troubled mind, that in a struggling and distempered world saw a seductive image of herself. 
yet mark the contradictions on which man is still the sport. Here nature was my guide, the nature of the dissolute. But thee, O oh fostering nature, I rejected, smiled at others' tears in pity and in scorn at those which thy soft influence sometimes drew from my unguarded heart. The tranquil shores of Britain circumscribed me, else perhaps I might have been entangled among deeds which now, as infamous, I should abhor, despise as senseless. For my spirit relished strangely the exasperation of that land, which turned an angry beak against the down of her own breast, confounded into hope of disencumbering thus her fretful wings. But all was quieted by iron bonds of military sway. The shifting aims, the moral interests, the creative might, the varied functions and high attributes of civil action yielded to a power formal and odious and contemptible. In Britain ruled a panic dread of change. The weak were praised, rewarded, and advanced. And from the impulse of a just disdain, once more did I retire into myself. There, feeling no contentment, I resolved to fly for safeguard to some foreign shore, remote from Europe, from her blasted hopes, her fields of carnage and polluted air. Fresh blew the wind, when o'er the Atlantic main the ship went gliding with her thoughtless crew, and who among them but an exile, freed from discontent, indifferent, pleased to sit among the busily employed, not more with obligation charged, with service taxed, than the loose pendant, to the idle wind upon the tall mast streaming. But ye powers of soul and sense mysteriously allied, oh, never let the wretched, if a choice be left him, trust the freight of his distress to a long voyage on the silent deep. For like a plague will memory break out, and in the blank and solitude of things upon his spirit with a fever strength will conscience pray. Feebly must they have felt who in old time attired with snakes and whips the vengeful furies. Beautiful regards were turned on me, the face of her I loved, the wife and mother pitifully fixing tender reproaches, insupportable, where now that boasted liberty no welcome from unknown objects I received, and those known and familiar which the vaulted sky did in the placid clearness of the night disclose had accusations to prefer against my peace. Within the cabin stood that volume as a compass for the soul revered among the nations. I implored its guidance, but the infallible support of faith was wanting. Tell me, why refuse to one by storms annoyed and adverse winds perplexed with currents, of his weakness sick, of vain endeavors tired, and by his own and by his nature's ignorance dismayed. Long wished for sight, the western world appeared. And when the ship was moored, I leaped ashore indignantly, resolved to be a man who, having o'er the past no power, would live no longer in subjection to the past with abject mind. From a tyrannic lord inviting penance, fruitlessly endured, so like a fugitive whose feet have cleared some boundary which his followers may not cross in prosecution of their deadly chase. Respiring, I looked round. How bright the sun, the breeze, how soft! Can anything produced in the old world compare, thought I, for power and majesty with this gigantic stream sprung from the desert? And behold a city fresh, youthful, and aspiring. What are these to me or I to them? As much at least as he desires that they should be, whom winds and waves have wafted to this distant shore in the condition of a damaged seed whose fibers cannot, if they would, take root. Here may I roam at large. My business is roaming at large. To observe and not to feel and therefore not to act, convinced that all which bears the name of action, howsoe'er beginning, ends in servitude, still painful and mostly profitless. And sooth to say, on nearer view, a motley spectacle appeared of high pretensions, unreproved, but by the obstreperous voice of higher still, big passions strutting on a petty stage, which a detached spectator may regard not unamused. But ridicule demands quick change of objects. And to laugh alone at a composing distance from the haunts of strife and folly, though it be a treat as choice as musing leisure can bestow, 
yet in the very center of the crowd, to keep the secret of a poignant scorn, howe'er to airy demons suitable of all unsocial courses is least fit for the gross spirit of mankind, the one that soonest fails to please and quickliest turns into vexation. Let us then, I said, leave this unknit republic to the scourge of her own passions and to regions haste whose shades have never felt the encroaching axe or soil endured a transfer in the mart of dire rapacity there man abides primeval nature's child a creature weak in combination wherefore else driven back so far and of his old inheritance so easily deprived but for that cause more dignified and stronger in himself whether to act judge suffer or enjoy True, the intelligence of social art hath overpowered his forefathers, and soon will sweep the remnant of his line away. But contemplations, worthier and nobler far than her destructive energies, attend his independence, but along the side of Mississippi, or that northern stream that spreads into successive seas he walks, pleased to perceive his own unshackled life and his innate capacities of soul there imaged. Or when, having gained the top of some commanding eminence, which yet intruder ne'er beheld, he thence surveys regions of wood and wide savanna, vast expanse of unappropriated earth, with mind that sheds a light on what he sees, free as the sun and lonely as the sun, pouring above his head its radiance down upon a living and rejoicing world. So westward toward the unviolated woods I bent my way, and roaming far and wide failed not to greet the merry mockingbird. And while the melancholy Muckawis, the sportive bird's companion in the grove, repeated o'er and o'er with his plaintive cry, I sympathized at leisure with the sound. But that pure archetype of human greatness, I found him not. There in his stead appeared a creature, squalid, vengeful, and impure remorseless and submissive to no law but superstitious fear and abject sloth. Enough is told. Here am I. Ye have heard what evidence I seek and vainly seek. What from my fellow beings I require, and either they have not to give, or I lack virtue to receive, what I myself too oft by willful forfeiture have lost, nor can regain. How languidly I look upon this visible fabric of the world, may be divined. Perhaps it hath been said, but spare your pity, if there be in me aught that deserves respect, for I exist within myself, not comfortless. The tenor which my life holds, he readily may conceive, who e'er hath stood to watch a mountain brook in some still passage of its course, and seen within the depths of its capacious breast inverted trees, rocks, clouds, and azure sky or on its glassy surface specks of foam and congobulated blubbles undissolved. Numerous as stars, that by their onward lapse betray to sight the motion of the stream, else imperceptible. Meanwhile is heard a softened roar or murmur, and the sound, though soothing, and the little floating isles, though beautiful, are both by nature charged with the same pensive office, and make known through what perplexing labyrinths, abrupt precipitations, and untoward straits the earth-born wanderer hath passed, and quickly that respite o'er like traverses and toils he must again encounter. Such a stream is human life, and so the spirit fares in the best quiet to her course allowed, and such is mine, save only for a hope, that my particular current will soon reach the unfathomable gulf where all is still. End of Book 3 of The Excursion Book Four of The Excursion by William Wordsworth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Book Four Despondency Corrected. 
Here closed the tenant of that lonely vale, his mournful narrative commenced in pain, in pain commenced and ended without peace, yet tempered not unfrequently with strains of native feeling, grateful to our minds and yielding surely some relief to his, while we sat listening with compassion due. A pause of silence followed, then with a voice that did not falter, though the heart was moved, the wanderer said, one adequate support for the calamities of mortal life exists, one only, an assured belief that the procession of our fate, howe'er sad or disturbed, is ordered by a being of infinite benevolence and power, whose everlasting purposes embrace all accidents, converting them to good. The darts of anguish fix not where the seat of suffering hath been thoroughly fortified by acquiescence in the will supreme for time and for eternity, by faith, faith absolute in God, including hope, and the defense that lies in boundless love of his perfections, with habitual dread of aught unworthily conceived, endured impatiently, ill done or left undone to the dishonor of his holy name. Soul of our souls and safeguard of the world, sustain Thou only canst the sick of heart, restore their languid spirits, and recall their lost affections unto thee and thine. Thus, as we issued from that covert nook, he thus continued, lifting up his eyes to heaven. How beautiful this dome of sky, and the vast hills in fluctuation fixed at thy command, how awful! Shall the soul, human and rational, report of thee even less than these? Be mute who will, who can, yet I will praise thee with impassioned voice. My lips that may forget thee in the crowd cannot forget thee here, where thou hast built for thy own glory in the wilderness. Me didst thou constitute a priest of thine in such a temple as we now behold reared for thy presence. Therefore am I bound to worship here and everywhere, as one not doomed to ignorance, though forced to tread from childhood up the ways of poverty, from unreflecting ignorance preserved, and from debasement rescued. By thy grace the particle divine remained unquenched, amid the wild weeds of a rugged soil, thy bounty caused to flourish deathless flowers from paradise transplanted. Wintry age impends, the frost will gather round my heart, if the flowers wither, I am worse than dead. Come, labor, when the worn-out frame requires perpetual Sabbath. Come, disease and want, and sad exclusion through decay of sense. But leave me unabated trust in thee, and let thy favor to the end of life inspire me with ability to seek repose and hope among eternal things, Father of heaven and earth. And I am rich, and will possess my portion in content. And what are things eternal? Powers depart, the gray-haired wanderer steadfastly replied, answering the question which himself had asked. Possessions vanish, and opinions change, and passions hold a fluctuating seat. But by the storms of circumstance unshaken, and subject neither to eclipse nor wane, duty exists immutably survive for our support the measures and the forms which an abstract intelligence supplies, whose kingdom is where time and space are not. Of other converse, which mind, soul, and heart do with united urgency require, what more that may not perish? Thou, dread source, prime, self-existing cause, and end of all that in the scale of being fill their place, above our human region, or below, set and sustained, thou who didst wrap the cloud of infancy around us, that thyself, therein, with our simplicity a while, mightst hold on earth communion undisturbed, who from the anarchy of dreaming sleep, or from its death-like void, with punctual care, and touch as gentle as the morning light, restorest us daily to the powers of sense, and reason's steadfast rule, Thou, thou alone art everlasting, and the blessed spirits which thou includest as the sea her waves, for adoration thou endurest, endure for consciousness the motions of thy will, for apprehension those dis transcendent truths of the pure intellect that stand as laws submission constituting strength and power, even to thy being's infinite majesty. 
this universe shall pass away, a work glorious because the shadow of thy might, a step or link for intercourse with thee. Ah, if the time must come in which my feet no more shall stray where meditation leads, by flowing stream, through wood or craggy wild, love haunts like these, the unimprisoned mind may yet have scope to range among her own, her thoughts, her images, her high desires. If the dear faculty of sight should fail, still it may be allowed me to remember what visionary powers of eye and soul in youth were mine. When stationed on the top of some huge hill, expectant, I beheld the sun rise up, from distant climes returned darkness to chase and sleep, and bring the day his bounteous gift, or saw him toward the deep sink, with a retinue of flaming clouds attended, then my spirit was entranced with joy exalted to beatitude. The measure of my soul was filled with bliss and holiest love, as earth, sea, air, with light, with pomp, with glory, with magnificence. Those fervent raptures are forever flown, and since their date my soul hath undergone change manifold, for better or for worse. Yet cease I not to struggle and aspire heavenward, and chide the part of me that flags, through sinful choice or dread necessity on human nature from above imposed. Tis by comparison an easy task earth to despise, but to converse with heaven, this is not easy. To relinquish all we have or hope of happiness and joy, and stand in freedom loosened from this world, I deem not arduous, but must needs confess that tis a thing impossible to frame conceptions equal to the soul's desires, and the most difficult of tasks to keep heights which the soul is competent to gain. Man is of dust, ethereal hopes are his, which when they should sustain themselves aloft want due consistence, like a pillar of smoke that with majestic energy from earth rises, but having reached the thinner air melts and dissolves and is no longer seen. From this infirmity of mortal kind sorrow proceeds, which else were not. At least if grief be something hallowed and ordained, if in proportion it will be just and meet. Yet, through this weakness of the general heart, is it enabled to maintain its hold in that excess which conscience disapproves? For who could sink and settle to that point of selfishness? So senseless, who could be as long and perseveringly to mourn for any object of his love, removed from this unstable world, if he could fix a satisfying view upon that state of pure, imperishable blessedness, which reason promises and holy writ ensures to all believers? Yet mistrust is of such incapacity, methinks, no natural branch, despondency far less, and least of all is absolute despair. And if there be whose tender frames have drooped even to the dust, apparently, through weight of anguish unrelieved and lack of power and agonizing sorrow to transmute, deem not that proof is here of hope withheld when wanted most, a confidence impaired so pitiably that having ceased to see with bodily eyes, they are borne down by love of what is lost and perish through regret. Oh no, the innocent sufferer often sees too clearly, feels too vividly, and longs to realize the vision with intense and over-constant yearning. There, there lies the excess by which the balance is destroyed. Too, too contracted are these walls of flesh, this vital warmth too cold, these visual orbs, though inconceivably endowed, too dim for any passion of the soul that leads to ecstasy. And all the crooked paths of time and change disdaining takes its course along the line of limitless desires. I, speaking now from such disorder free, nor rapt nor craving, but in settled peace, I cannot doubt that they whom you deplore are glorified or, if they sleep, shall wake from sleep, and dwell with God in endless love. Hope below this consists not with belief in mercy, carried infinite degrees beyond the tenderness of human hearts. Hope below this consists not with belief in perfect wisdom, guiding mightiest power that finds no limits but her own pure will. Here, then, we rest not fearing for our creed the worst that human reasoning can achieve to unsettle or perplex it, yet with pain acknowledging and grievous self-reproach that though immovably convinced, 
we want zeal and the virtue to exist by faith as soldiers live by courage as by strength of heart the sailor fights with roaring seas alas the endowment of immortal power is matched unequally with custom time and domineering faculties of sense in all in most with superadded foes idle temptations open vanities ephemeral offspring of the unblushing world and in the private regions of the mind ill-governed passions ranklings of despite immoderate wishes pining discontent distress and care what then remains to seek those helps for his occasions ever near who lacks not will to use them vows renewed on the first motion of a holy thought vigils of contemplation praise and prayer a stream which from the fountain of the heart issuing however feebly nowhere flows without access of unexpected strength but above all the victory is most sure for him who seeking faith by virtue strives to yield entire submission to the law of conscience conscience reverenced and obeyed as God's most intimate presence in the soul and his most perfect image in the world endeavor thus to live these rules regard these helps solicit and a steadfast seat shall then be yours among the happy few who dwell on earth yet breathe imperial air sons of the morning for your nobler part ere disencumbered of her mortal chains doubt shall be quelled and trouble chased away with only such degree of sadness left as may support longings of pure desire and strength and love rejoicing secretly in the sublime attractions of the grave while in this strain the venerable sage poured forth his aspirations and announced his judgments near that lonely house we paced a plot of greensward seemingly preserved by nature's care from wreck of scattered stones and from encroachment of encircling heath small space but for reiterated steps smooth and commodious as a stately deck which to and fro the mariner is used to tread for pastime talking with his mates or haply thinking of far distant friends while the ship glides before a steady breeze stillness prevailed around us and the voice that spake was capable to lift the soul toward regions yet more tranquil but methought that he whose fixed despondency had given impulse and motive to that strong discourse was less upraised in spirit than abashed shrinking from admonition like a man who feels that to exhort is to reproach yet not to be diverted from his aim the sage continued for that other loss the loss of confidence in social man by the unexpected transports of our age carried so high that every thought which looked beyond the temporal destiny of the kind to many seemed superfluous as no cause could e'er for such exalted confidence exist so none is now for fixed despair the two extremes are equally disowned by reason if with sharp recoil from one you have been driven far as its opposite between them seek the point whereon to build sound expectations so doth he advise who shared at first the illusion but was soon cast from the pedestal of pride by shocks which nature gently gave in in woods and fields nor unreproved by providence thus speaking to the inattentive children of the world vain glorious generation what new powers on you have been conferred what gifts withheld from your progenitors have ye received fit recompense of new desert what claim are ye prepared to urge that my decrees for you should undergo a sudden change and the weak functions of one busy day reclaiming and extirpating perform what all the slowly moving years of time with their united force have left undone by nature's gradual processes be taught by story be confounded ye aspire rashly to fall once more and that false fruit which to your overweening spirits yields hope of a flight celestial will produce misery and shame but wisdom of her sons shall not the less though late be justified such timely warning said the wanderer gave that visionary voice and at this day when a tartarian darkness overspreads the groaning nations when the impious rule by will or by established ordinance their own dire agents and constrain the good to acts which they abhor 
Though I bewail this triumph, yet the pity of my heart prevents me not from owning that the law by which mankind now suffers is most just. For by superior energies, more strict affiance in each other, faith more firm in their unhallowed principles, the bad have fairly earned a victory o'er the weak, the vacillating, inconsistent good. Therefore, not unconsoled, I wait, in hope to see the moment when the righteous cause shall gain defenders zealous and devout as they who have opposed her, in which virtue will to her efforts tolerate no bounds that are not lofty as her rights, aspiring by impulse of her own ethereal zeal. That spirit only can redeem mankind, and when that sacred spirit shall appear, then shall our triumph be complete as theirs. Yet should this confidence prove vain, the wise have still the keeping of their proper peace, are guardians of their own tranquility. They act, or they recede, observe, and feel, knowing the heart of man is set to be the center of this world, about the which those revolutions of disturbances still roll, where all the aspects of misery predominate, whose strong effects are such as he must bear, being powerless to redress, and that unless above himself he can erect himself, how poor a thing is man. Happy is he who lives to understand, not human nature only, but explores all natures, to the end that he may find the law that governs each, and where begins the union, the partition where that makes kind and degree among all visible beings, the constitutions, powers, and faculties which they inherit, cannot step beyond and cannot fall beneath, that do assign to every class its station and its office, through all the mighty commonwealth of things, up from the creeping plant to sovereign man. Such converse, if directed by a meek, sincere, and humble spirit, teaches love, for knowledge is delight, and such delight breeds love. Yet, suited as it rather is to thought and to the climbing intellect, it teaches less to love than to adore, if that be not indeed the highest love. Yet, said I, tempted here to interpose, the dignity of life is not impaired by aught that innocently satisfies the humbler cravings of the heart. And he is still a happier man who, for those heights of speculation not unfit, descends. And such benign affections cultivates among the inferior kinds, not merely those that he may call his own, and which depend as individual objects of regard upon his care, from whom he also looks for signs and tokens of a mutual bond, but others far beyond this narrow sphere, whom, for the very sake of love, he loves. Nor is it a mean praise of rural life and solitude, that they do favor most, most frequently call forth and best sustain these pure sensations, that can penetrate the obstreperous city, on the barren seas are not unfelt, and much might recommend how much they might inspirit and endear the loneliness of this sublime retreat. Yes, said the sage, resuming the discourse again directed to his downcast friend. If with the froward will and groveling soul of man offended, liberty is here, an invitation every hour renewed to mark their placid state, who never heard of a command which they have power to break, or rule which they are tempted to transgress. These, with a soothed or elevated heart, may we behold, their knowledge register, observe their ways, and free from envy, find complacence there. But wherefore this to you? I guess that, welcome to your lonely hearth, the red breast, ruffled up by winter's cold into a feathery bunch, feeds at your hand. A box, perchance, is from your casement hung for the small wren to build in. Not in vain, the barriers disregarding that surround this deep abiding place before your sight mounts on the breeze the butterfly and soars, small creature as she is, from earth's bright flowers into the dewy clouds. Ambition reigns in the waste wilderness. The soul ascends drawn towards her native firmament of heaven, when the fresh eagle in the month of May, upborne at evening on replenished wing the shaded valley leaves, and leaves the dark empurpled hills, conspicuously renewing a proud communication with the sun low sunk beneath the horizon. List I heard from yon huge breast of rock a voice sent forth as if the visible mountain made the cry. Again, 
the effect upon the soul was such as he expressed. From out the mountain's heart the solemn voice appeared to issue, startling the blank air, for the region all around stood empty of all shape of life, and silent, save for that single cry, the unanswered bleat of a poor lamb, left somewhere to itself the plaintive spirit of the solitude. He paused, as if unwilling to proceed, through consciousness that silence in such place was best, the most affecting eloquence. But soon his thoughts returned upon themselves, and in soft tone of speech thus he resumed. Ah, if the heart too confidently raised, perchance too lightly occupied, or lulled too easily, despise or overlook the vassalage that binds her to the earth, her sad dependence upon time, and all the trepidations of mortality, what place so destitute and void, but there the little flower her vanity shall check, the trailing worm reprove her thoughtless pride? These craggy regions, these chaotic wilds, does that benignity pervade that warms the mole contented with her darksome walk in the cold ground, and to the emmet gives her foresight and intelligence that makes the tiny creatures strong by social league? supports the generations, multiplies their tribes, till we behold a spacious plain or grassy bottom, all with little hills, their labor covered as a lake with waves, thousands of cities in the desert place built up of life of, and food and means of life. Nor wanting here to entertain the thought, creatures that in communities exist, less as might seem for general guardianship or through dependence upon mutual aid, than by participation of delight and a strict love of fellowship combined. What other spirit can it be that prompts the gilded summer flies to mix and weave their sports together in the solar beam, or in the gloom of twilight hum their joy? More obviously, the selfsame influence rules the feathered kinds, the field fares pensive flock, the cawing rooks, and sea mews from afar, hovering above these inland solitudes, by the rough wind unscattered, at whose call up through the trenches of the long-drawn vales their voyage was begun, nor its power, unfelt among the sedentary fowl that seek yon pool, and there prolong their stay in silent congress, or together roused take flight, while with their clang the air resounds. And over all, in that ethereal vault, is the mute company of changeful clouds. Bright apparition suddenly put forth, the rainbow smiling on the faded storm, the mild assemblage of the starry heavens, and the great sun, earth's universal lord. How bountiful is nature! He shall find who seeks not, and to him who hath not asked large measure shall be dealt. Three Sabbath days are scarcely told since on a service bent of mere humanity you clomb those heights, and what a marvelous and heavenly show was suddenly revealed. The swains moved on and heeded not. You lingered, you perceived and felt deeply as living man could feel. There is a luxury in self-dispraise, and inward self-disparagement affords to meditative spleen a grateful feast. Trust me, pronouncing on your own desert, you judge unthankfully. Distempered nerves infect the thoughts. The languor of the frame depresses the soul's vigor. Quit your couch. Cleave not so fondly to your moody cell, nor let the hallowed powers that shed from heaven stillness and rest with disapproving eye look down upon your taper. Through a watch of midnight hours, unseasonably twinkling in this deep hollow, like a sullen star dimly reflected in a lonely pool. Take courage, and withdraw yourself from ways that run not parallel to nature's course. Rise with the lark, your matins shall obtain grace, be their composition what it may, if but with hers performed. Climb once again, climb every day those ramparts, meet the breeze upon their tops, adventurous as a bee that from your garden thither soars to feed on new-blown heath. Let yon commanding rock be your frequented watchtower, roll the stone in thunder down the mountains, with all your might chase the wild goat, and if the bold red deer fly to those harbors, driven by hound and horn, loud echoing, add your speed to the pursuit. So wearied to your hut shall you return, and sink at evening into sound repose. The solitary lifted toward the hills a kindling eye. Accordant feelings rushed into my bosom, whence these words broke forth. 
Oh, what a joy it were in vigorous health to have a body, this our vital frame with shrinking sensibility endued in all the nice regards of flesh and blood, and to the end elements surrender it as if it were a spirit. How divine the liberty for frail, for mortal man, to roam at large among unpeopled glens and mountainous retreats, only trod by devious footsteps, regions consecrate to oldest time, and reckless of the storm that keeps the raven quiet in her nest, be as a presence or a motion, one among the many there. And while the mists flying and rainy vapors call out shapes and phantoms from the crags and solid earth as fast as a musician scatters sounds out of an instrument, and while the streams, as at a first creation, and in haste to exercise their untried faculties, descending from the region of the clouds and starting from the hollows of the earth, more multitudinous every moment, rend their way before them. What a joy to roam an unequal among mightiest energies, and haply sometimes with articulate voice amid the deafening tumults scarcely heard by him that utters it, exclaim aloud rage on ye elements let moon and stars their aspects lend and mingle in their turn with this commotion ruinous though it be from day to night from night to day prolonged yes said the wanderer taking from my lips the strain of transport Whosoe'er in youth has through ambition of his soul given way to such desires and grasped at such delight shall feel congenial stirrings late and long in spite of all the weakness that life brings, its cares and sorrows. He, though taught to own the tranquilizing power of time, shall wake, wake sometimes to a noble restlessness, loving the sports which once he gloried in. Compatriot friend, remote are Gary's hills, the streams far distant of your native glen. Yet it is their form and image here expressed with brotherly resemblance. Turn your steps wherever fancy leads. By day, by night, are various engines working, not the same as those with which your soul in youth was moved, but by the great artificer endowed with no inferior power. You dwell alone, you walk, you live, you speculate alone. Yet doth remembrance like a sovereign prince for you a stately gallery maintain of gay or tragic pictures. You have seen, have acted, suffered, traveled far, observed with no incurious eye, and books are yours within whose silent chambers treasure lies preserved from age to age, more precious far than that accumulated store of gold and orient gems, which for a day of need the sultan hides deep in ancestral tombs. These hordes of truth you cannot lock at will, and music waits upon your skillful touch, sounds which the wandering shepherd from these heights hears and forgets his purpose. Furnished thus, how can you droop if willing to be upraised? End of Book 4, Part 1 of The Excursion by William Wordsworth Book 4, Part 2 of The Excursion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Excursion by William Wordsworth. Book 4, Part 2. A piteous lot it were to flee from man, yet not rejoice in nature. He whose hours are by domestic pleasures uncaressed and unenlivened, who exists whole years apart from benefits received or done mid the transactions of the bustling crowd, who neither hears nor feels a wish to hear of the world's interests, such a one hath need of a quick fancy and an active heart, that for the day's consumption books may yield food not unwholesome, earth and air correct his morbid humor with delight supplied or solace, varying as the seasons change. Truth has her pleasure grounds, her haunts of ease and easy contemplation, gay parterres and labyrinthine walks, her sunny glades and shady groves in studied contrast, each for recreation leading into each. These may he range, if willing to partake their soft indulgences, and in due time may issue thence, recruited for the tasks and course of service truth requires from those who tend her altars, wait upon her throne and guard her fortresses. Who thinks and feels and recognizes ever and anon the breeze of nature stirring in his soul? Why need such man go desperately astray and nurse the dreadful appetite of death? 
if tired with systems, each in its degree substantial, and all crumbling in their turn, let him build systems of his own, and smile at the fond work, demolished with a touch. If unreligious, let him be at once among ten thousand innocents, enrolled a pupil in the many-chambered school where superstition weaves her airy dreams. Life's autumn past, I stand on winter's verge, and daily lose what I desire to keep. Yet rather would I instantly decline to the traditionary sympathies of a most rustic ignorance, and take a fearful apprehension from the owl or death watch, and as readily rejoice if two auspicious magpies crossed my way. To this would rather bend than see and hear the repetitious wearisome of sense, where soul is dead and feeling hath no place, where knowledge, ill begun in cold remark on outward things, with formal inference ends, or if the mind turn inward, she recoils at once, or not recoiling is perplexed, lost in a gloom of uninspired research. Meanwhile the heart within the heart, the seat where peace and happy consciousness should dwell, on its own axis restlessly revolving, seeks, yet can nowhere find, the light of truth. Upon the breast of new-created earth man walked, and when and wheresoe'er he moved, alone or mated, solitude was not. He heard, borne on the wind, the articulate voice of God, and angels to his sight appeared crowning the glorious hills of paradise, or through the groves gliding like morning mist enkindled by the sun. He sat and talked with winged messengers, who daily brought to his small island in the ethereal deep tidings of joy and love. From those pure heights, whether of actual vision, sensible to sight and feeling, or that in this sort have condescendingly been shadowed forth communications spiritually maintained and intuitions moral and divine, fell humankind. To banishment condemned that flowing years repealed not, and distress and grief spread wide, but man escaped the doom of destitution, solitude was not. Jehovah, shapeless power above all powers, single and one, the omnipresent God, by vocal utterance or blaze of light or cloud of darkness localized in heaven, on earth enshrined within the wandering ark, or out of Zion, thundering from his throne between the cherubim, on the chosen race showered miracles, and ceased not to dispense judgment that filled the land from age to age with hope and love and gratitude and fear, and with amazement smote, thereby to assert his scorned or unacknowledged sovereignty. And when the one ineffable of name, of nature indivisible, withdrew from mortal adoration or regard, not then was deity engulfed, nor man, the rational creature, left to feel the weight of his own reason without sense or thought of higher reason and a purer will to benefit and bless through mightier power. Whether the Persian, zealous to reject altar and image and the inclusive walls and roofs of temples built by human hands, to loftiest heights ascending from their tops, with myrtle-wreathed tiara on his brow, presented sacrifice to moon and stars and to the winds and mother elements, and the whole circle of the heavens for him a sensitive existence and a God with lifted hands invoked and songs of praise, or less reluctantly to bonds of sense yielding his soul, the Babylonian framed for influence undefined a personal shape, and from the plain with toil immense, upreared tower eight times planted on the top of tower, that Bellus, nightly to his splendid couch descending, there might rest, upon that height pure and serene, diffused to overlook winding Euphrates and the city vast of his devoted worshippers far stretched, with their grove and field and garden interspersed, their town and fruitful region for support against the pressure of beleaguering war. Chaldean shepherds, Ranging trackless fields beneath the concave of unclouded skies spread like a sea in boundless solitude, looked on the polar star as on a guide and guardian of their course that never closed his steadfast eye. The planetary five, with a submissive reverence they beheld, watched from the center of their sleeping flocks those radiant mercuries that seemed to move carrying through ether, in perpetual round, decrees and resolutions of the gods and by their aspects signifying works of dim futurity to man revealed. The imaginative faculty was lord of observations natural, 
and thus led on those shepherds made report of stars and set rotation passing to and fro between the orbs of our apparent sphere and its invisible counterpart adorned with answering constellations under earth removed from all approach of living sight but present to the dead who so they deemed like those celestial messengers beheld all accidents and judges were of all the lively grecian in a land of hills rivers and fertile plains and sounding shores under a cope of sky more variable could find commodious space for every god promptly received as prodigally brought from the surrounding countries at the choice of all adventures with unrivaled skill as nicest observation furnished hints for studious fancy his quick hand bestowed on fluent operations a fixed shape metal or stone idolatrously served and yet triumphant o'er this pompous show of art this palpable array of sense on every side encountered in despite of the gross fictions chanted in the streets by wandering rhapsodists and in contempt of doubt and bold denial hourly urged amid the wrangling schools a spirit hung beautiful region or thy towns and farms statues and temples and memorial tombs and emanations were perceived and acts of immortality in nature's course exemplified by mysteries that were felt as bonds on grave philosopher imposed and armed warrior and in every grove a gay or pensive tenderness prevailed when piety more awful had relaxed take running river take these locks of mine thus would the votary say this severed hair my vow fulfilling do i here present thankful for my beloved child's return thy banks cephasus he again hath trod thy murmurs heard and drunk the crystal lymph with which thou dost refresh the thirsty lip and all day long moisten these flowery fields and doubtless sometimes when the hair was shed upon the flowing stream a thought arose of life continuous being unimpaired that hath been is and where it was and is there shall endure existence unexposed to the blind walk of mortal accident from diminution safe and weakening age while man grows old and dwindles and decays and countless generations of mankind depart and leave no vestige where they trod we live by admiration hope and love and even as these are well and wisely fixed in dignity of being we ascend but what is error answer he who can the skeptic someone haughtily exclaimed love hope and admiration are they not mad fancy's favorite vassals does not life use them full oft as pioneers to ruin guides to destruction is it well to trust imagination's light when reason fails the unguarded taper where the guarded faints stoop from those heights and soberly declare what error is and of our errors which doth most debase the mind the genuine seats of power where are they who shall regulate with truth the scale of intellectual rank methinks persuasively the sage replied that for this arduous office you possess some rare advantages your early days a grateful recollection must supply of much exalted good by heaven vouchsafed to dignify the humblest state your voice hath in my hearing often testified that poor men's children they and they alone by their condition taught can understand the wisdom of the prayer that daily asks for daily bread a consciousness is yours how feelingly religion may be learned in smoky cabins from a mother's tongue heard while the dwelling vibrates to the din of the contiguous torrent gathering strength at every moment and with strength increase of fury or while snow is at the door assaulting and defending and the wind a sightless laborer whistles at his work fearful but resignation tempers fear and piety is sweet to infant minds the shepherd lad that in the sunshine carves on the green turf a dial to divide the silent hours and who to that report can portion out his pleasures and adapt throughout a long and lonely summer's day his round of pastoral duties is not left with less intelligence for moral things of gravest import early he perceives within himself a measure and a rule which to the sun of truth he can apply that shines for him and shines for all mankind experience daily fixing his regards on nature's wants he knows how few they are and where they lie how answered and appeased 
This knowledge ample recompense affords for manifold privations. He refers his notions to this standard. On this rock rests his desires. And hence, in after life, soul-strengthening patience and sublime content. Imagination not permitted here to waste her powers as in the worldling's mind. On fickle pleasures and superfluous cares and trivial ostentation is left free and puissant to range the solemn walks of time and nature girded by a zone that, while it binds, invigorates and supports. Acknowledge, then, that whether by the side of his poor hut or on the mountain top, or in the cultured field, a man so bred, take from him what you will upon the score of ignorance or illusion, lives and breathes for noble purposes of mind. His heart beats to the heroic song of ancient days. His eye distinguishes, his soul creates. And those illusions which excite the scorn or move the pity of unthinking minds, are they not mainly outward ministers of inward conscience? with whose service charged they come and go, appeared and disappear, diverting evil purposes, remorse awakening, chastening an intemperate grief or pride of heart abating. And when e'er for less important ends those phantoms move, who would forbid them if their presence serve on thinly peopled mountains and wild heaths, filling a space else vacant to exalt the forms of nature and enlarge her powers? Once more to distant ages of the world let us revert, and place before our thoughts the face which rural solitude might wear to the unenlightened swains of pagan Greece. In that fair clime the lonely herdsman, stretched on the soft grass through half a summer's day, with music lulled his indolent repose. And in some fit of weariness, if he, when his own breath was silent, chanced to hear a distant strain far sweeter than the sounds which his poor skill could make, his fancy fetched, even from the blazing chariot of the sun, a beardless youth who touched a golden lute and filled the illumined groves with ravishment. The knightly hunter, lifting a bright eye up towards the crescent moon with grateful heart, called on the lovely wanderer who bestowed that timely light to share his joyous sport. And hence, a beaming goddess with her nymphs, across the lawn and through the darksome grove, not unaccompanied with tuneful notes by echo multiplied from rock or cave swept in the storm of chase, as moon and stars glance rapidly along the clouded heaven when winds are blowing strong. The traveler slaked his thirst from rill or gushing fount and thanked the naiad. Sunbeams upon distant hills gliding apace with shadows in their train might, with a small help from fancy, be transformed into fleet oreads sporting visibly. The zephyrs fanning as they passed their wings lacked not for love fair objects whom they wooed with gentle whisper. Withered boughs grotesque, stripped of their leaves and twigs by hoary age, from death of shaggy covert peeping forth in the low vale or on steep mountainside, and sometimes intermixed with stirring horns of the live deer or goat's depending beard, these were the lurking satyrs, a wild brood of gamesome deities, or Pan himself, the shim simple shepherd's awe-inspiring god. The strain was aptly chosen, and I could mark its kindly influence o'er the yielding brow of our companion gradually diffused. While listening, he had paced the noiseless turf like one whose untired ear a murmuring stream detains. But tempted now to interpose, he with a smile exclaimed, "'Tis well you speak at a safe distance from our native land and from the mansions where our youth was taught. The true descendants of those godly men who swept from Scotland in a flame of zeal, shrine, altar, image, and the massy piles that harbored them, the souls retaining yet the churlish features of that after-race who fled to woods, caverns, and jutting rocks in deadly scorn of superstitious rites, or what their scruples construed to be such. How, think you, would they tolerate this scheme of fine propensities that tends, if urged, far as it might be urged, to sow afresh the weeds of Romish fantasy, in vain uprooted? would re-consecrate our wells to good St. Philan and to fair St. Anne, and from long banishment recall St. Giles to watch again with tutelary love or stately Edinburgh throned on crags. A blessed restoration to behold the patron on the shoulders of his priests once more parading through her crowded streets, now simply guarded by the sober powers of science and philosophy and sense. This answer followed. 
you have turned my thoughts upon our brave progenitors, who rose against idolatry with a warlike mind and shrunk from vain observances to lurk in woods and dwell under impending rocks ill-sheltered and oft wanting fire and food. Why? For this very reason that they felt and did acknowledge wheresoe'er they moved a spiritual presence, oft times misconceived, but still a high dependence, a divine bounty and government that filled their hearts with joy and gratitude and fear and love. And from their fervent lips drew hymns of praise that through the desert rang. Though favored less, far less than these, yet such in their degree were those bewildered pagans of old time. Beyond their own poor natures and above they looked, were humbly thankful for the good which the warm sun solicited and earth bestowed, were gladsome, and their moral sense they fortified with reverence for the gods, and they had hopes that overstepped the grave. Now shall our great discoverers, he exclaimed, raising his voice triumphantly, obtain from sense and reason less than these obtained, though far misled? Shall men for whom our age unbaffled powers of vision hath prepared to explore the world without and world within be joyless as the blind? Ambitious spirits whom earth at this late season hath produced to regulate the moving spheres and weigh the planets in the hollow of their hand. And they who rather dive than soar, whose pains have solved the elements or analyzed the thinking principle, shall they in fact prove a degraded race? And what avails renown if their presumption make them such? Oh, there is laughter at their work in heaven. Inquire of ancient wisdom. Go, demand of mighty nature. If t'was ever meant that we should pry far off yet be unraised. That we should pour and dwindle as we pour. Viewing all objects unremittingly in disconnection dead and spiritless, and still dividing and dividing still, break down all grandeur, still unsatisfied with a perverse attempt, while littleness may yet become more little, waging thus an impious warfare with the very life of our own souls. And if indeed there be an all-pervading spirit upon whom our dark foundations rest, could he design that this magnificent effect of power the earth we tread, the sky that we behold by day, and all the pomp which night reveals, that these, and that superior mystery our vital frame so fearfully devised, and the dread soul within it, should exist only to be examined, pondered, searched, probed, vexed, and criticized? Accuse me not of arrogance, unknown wanderer as I am, if having walked with nature threescore years, and offered far as frailty would allow, my heart a daily sacrifice to truth. I now affirm of nature and of truth, whom I have served, that their divinity revolts, offended at the ways of men swayed by such motives to such ends employed. Philosophers who, though the human soul be of a thousand faculties composed, and twice ten thousand interests, do yet prize this soul and a transcendent universe, no more than as a mirror that reflects to proud self-love her own intelligence, that one poor finite object in the abyss of infinite being, twinkling restlessly. Nor higher place can be assigned to him and his compeers. The laughing sage of France, crowned he was, if my memory do not err, with laurel planted upon hoary hairs in sight of conquest by his wit achieved, and benefits his wisdom hath conferred. His stooping body tottered with wreaths of flowers, oppressed far less becoming ornaments than spring off twines about a moldering tree. Yet so it pleased a fond, vain old man, and a most frivolous people. Him I mean who penned to ridicule confiding faith this sorry legend, which by chance we found piled in a nook, through malice as might seem among more innocent rubbish. Speaking thus, with a brief notice when and how and where we had espied the book, he drew it forth, and courteously, as if the act removed at once all traces from the good man's heart of unbenign aversion or contempt, restored it to its owner. Gentle friend, herewith he grasped the solitary's hand, you have known lights and guides better than these. Ah, uh, let not aught amiss within dispose a noble mind to practice on herself and tempt opinion to support the wrongs of passion. Whatsoe'er be felt or feared from higher judgment seats, make no appeal to lower. Can you question that the soul inherits an allegiance, not by choice to be cast off upon an oath proposed by each new upstart notion? 
In the ports of levity no refuge can be found, no shelter for a spirit in distress. He who by willful disesteem of life and proud insensibility to hope affronts the eye of solitude shall learn that her mild nature can be terrible, that neither she nor silence lack the power to avenge their own insulted majesty. O oh, blessed seclusion, when the mind admits the law of duty, and can therefore move through each vicissitude of loss and gain, linked in entire complacence within her choice. When youth's presumptuousness is mellowed down, and manhood's vain anxiety dismissed, when wisdom shows her seasonable fruit upon the boughs of sheltering leisure hung in sober plenty, when the spirit stoops to drink with gratitude the crystal stream of unreproved enjoyment, and is pleased to muse and be saluted by the air of meek repentance, wafting wallflower scents from out the crumbling ruins of fallen pride and chambers of transgressions now forlorn. O oh, calm, contented days and peaceful nights, who, when such good can be obtained, would strive to reconcile his manhood to a couch soft as may seem, but under that disguise stuffed with the thorny substance of the past for fixed annoyance, and full oft beset with floating dreams, black and disconsolate, the vapory phantoms of futurity. Within the soul a faculty abides, and with interpositions which would hide and darken so can deal that they become contingencies of pomp and serve to exalt her native brightness. As the ample moon, in the deep stillness of a summer even, rising behind a thick and lofty grove, burns like an unconsuming fire of light in the green trees, and kindling on all sides their leafy umbrage, turns the dusky veil into a substance glorious as her own, yea, with her own incorporated, by power capacious and serene. Like power abides in man's celestial spirit. Virtue thus sets forth and magnifies herself, thus feeds a calm, a beautiful and silent fire, from the encumbrances of mortal life, from error, disappointment, nay, from guilt, and sometimes so relenting justice wills from palpable oppressions of despair. The solitary by these words was touched with manifest emotion and exclaimed, But how begin, and whence? The mind is free. Resolve, the haughty mortalist would say. This single act is all that we demand. Alas, such wisdom bids a creature fly whose very sorrow is that time hath shorn his natural wings. To friendship let him turn for succor. But perhaps he sits alone on stormy waters tossed in a little boat that holds but him and can contain no more. Religion tells of amity sublime which no condition can preclude. Of one who sees all suffering, comprehends all wants, all weakness fathoms, can supply all needs. But is that bounty absolute? His gifts, are they not still in some degree rewards for acts of service? Can his love extend to hearts that own not him? Will showers of grace, when in the sky no promise may be seen, fall to refresh a parched and withered land? Or shall the groaning spirit cast her load at the Redeemer's feet? In rueful tone, with some impatience in his mien, he spake. Back to my mind rushed all that had been urged to calm the sufferer when his story closed. I look for counsel as an unbending now, but a discriminating sympathy stooped to this apt reply. As men from men do in the constitution of their souls differ by mystery not to be explained, and as we fall by various ways and sink one deeper than another, self-condemned through manifold degrees of guilt and shame, so manifold and various are the ways of restoration, fashioned to the steps of all infirmity, and tending all to the same point, attainable by all, peace in ourselves and union with our God. For you, assuredly, a hopeful road lies open. We have heard from you a voice at every moment softened in its course by tenderness of heart, have seen your eye, even like an altar lit by fire from heaven, kindle before us. Your discourse this day that like the fabled Lethe wished to flow in creeping sadness through oblivious shades of death and night, has caught at every turn the colors of the sun. Access for you is yet preserved to principles of truth, which the imaginative will upholds in seats of wisdom, not to be approached by the inferior faculty that molds with her minute and speculative pains opinion ever-changing. I have seen a curious child, 
who dwelt upon a tract of inland ground applying to his ear the convolutions of a smooth-lipped shell, to which in silence hushed his very soul listened intensely, and his countenance soon brightened with joy. For from within were heard murmurings, whereby the monitor expressed mysterious union with its native sea. Even such a shell the universe itself is to the ear of faith. And there are times, I doubt not, when to you it doth impart authentic tidings of invisible things, of ebb and flow and ever-during power, and central peace subsisting at the heart of endless agitation. Here you stand, adore and worship when you know it not, pious beyond the intention of your thought, devout above the meaning of your will. Yes, you have felt, and may not cease to feel, the estate of man would be indeed forlorn if false conclusions of the reasoning power made the eye blind and closed the passages through which the ear converses with the heart. Has not the soul, the being of your life, received a shock of awful consciousness in some calm season, when these lofty rocks at night's approach bring down the unclouded sky to rest upon their circumambient walls, a temple framing of dimensions vast, and yet not too enormous for the sound of human anthems? choral song or burst sublime of instrumental harmony to glorify the eternal. What if these did never break the stillness that prevails here? If the solemn nightingale be mute and the soft woodlark here did never chant her vespers, nature fails not to provide impulse and utterance. The whispering air sends inspiration from the shadowy heights and blind recesses of the caverned rocks. The little rills and waters numberless, inaudible by daylight, blend their notes with the loud streams, and often at the hour when issue forth the first pale stars is heard, within the circuit of this fabric huge, one voice, the solitary raven, flying athwart the concave of the dark blue dome, unseen perchance above all power of sight, an iron knell, with echoes from afar, faint and still fainter as the cry with which the wanderer accompanies her flight through the calm region, fades upon the air, diminishing by distance, till it seemed to expire, yet from the abyss is caught again, and yet again recovered. But descending from these imaginative heights that yield far-stretching views into eternity, acknowledge that to nature's humbler power your cherished sullenness is forced to bend even here where her amenities are sown with sparing hand. Then trust yourself abroad to range her blooming bowers and spacious fields, where on the labors of the happy throng she smiles, including in her wide embrace city and town and tower, and sea with ships sprinkled. Be our companion while we track her rivers populous with gliding life. While free as air, or printless sands we march, or pierce the gloom of her majestic woods, roaming or resting under grateful shade in peace and meditative cheerfulness, where living things and things inanimate do speak at heaven's command to eye and ear, and speak to social reason's inner sense with inarticulate language. For the man who in this spirit communes with the forms of nature, who with understanding heart both knows and loves such objects as excite no morbid passions, no disquietude, no vengeance, and no hatred, needs must feel the joy of that pure principle of love so deeply that unsatisfied with aught less pure and exquisite, he cannot choose but seek for objects of a kindred love and fellow natures and a kindred joy. Accordingly, he by degrees perceives his feelings of aversion softened down. A holy tenderness pervade his frame. His sanity of reason not impaired. Say rather all his thoughts now flowing clear from a clear fountain flowing. He looks round and seeks for good and finds the good he seeks, until abhorrence and contempt are things he only knows by name, and if he hear from other mouths the language which they speak, he is compassionate and has no thought, no feeling which can overcome his love. And further, by contemplating these forms and the relations which they bear to man, he shall discern how through the various means which silently they yield are multiplied the spiritual presences of absent things. Trust me that for the instructed time will come when they shall meet no object but may teach some acceptable lesson to their minds of human suffering or of human joy. 
so shall they learn while all things speak of man their duties from all forms and general laws and local accidents shall tend alike to rouse to urge and with the will confer the ability to spread the blessings wide of true philanthropy the light of love not failing perseverance from their steps departing not for them shall be confirmed the glorious habit by which sense is made subservient still to moral purposes, auxiliar to divine. That change shall clothe the naked spirit, ceasing to deplore the burden of existence. Science then shall be a precious visitant, and then and only then be worthy of her name. For then her heart shall kindle, her dull eye, dull and inanimate, no more shall hang chained to its object in brute slavery but taught with patient interest to watch the processes of things and serve the cause of order and distinctness. Not for this shall it forget that its most noble use, its most illustrious province, must be found in furnishing clear guidance, a support not treacherous to the mind's excursive power. So we build up the being that we are, thus deeply drinking in the soul of things. We shall be wise perforce, and while inspired by choice, and conscious that the will is free, shall move unswerving, even as if impelled by strict necessity along the path of order and of good. Whate'er we see or feel shall tend to quicken and refine, shall fix in calmer seats of moral strength earthly desires, and raise to loftier heights of divine love our intellectual soul. Here closed the sage that eloquent harangue, poured forth with fervor and continuous streams, such as remote mid savage wilderness an indian chief discharges from his breast into the hearing of assembled tribes in open circle seated round and hushed as the unbreathing air when not a leaf stirs in the mighty woods so did he speak the words he uttered shall not pass away dispersed like music that the wind takes up by snatches and lets fall to be forgotten no they sank into me the bounteous gift of one whom time and nature had made wise gracing his doctrine with authority which hostile spirits silently allow, of one accustomed to desires that feed on fruitage gathered from the tree of life, to hopes on knowledge and experience built, of one in whom persuasion and belief had ripened into faith, and faith become a passionate intuition, whence the soul, though bound to earth by ties of pity and love from all injurious servitude, was free. The sun, before his place of rest were reached, had yet to travel far. But unto us, to us who stood low in that hollow dell, he had become invisible. A pomp leaving behind of yellow radiance spread over the mountain sides, in contrast bold with ample shadows seemingly no less than those resplendent lights his rich bequest, a dispensation of his evening power. Adown the path that from the glen had led the funeral train, the shepherd and his mate were seen descending. Forth to greet them ran our little page, the rustic pair approached. And in the matron's countenance may be read plain indication that the words which told how that neglected pensioner was sent before his time into a quiet grave had done to her humanity no wrong. But we are kindly welcomed, promptly served with ostentatious zeal. Along the floor of the small cottage in the lonely dell a grateful couch was spread for our repose. Here in the guise of mountaineers we lay, stretched upon fragrant heath, and lulled by sound of far-off torrents charming the still night, and to tired limbs and over-busy thoughts, inviting sleep and soft forgetfulness. End of Book 4, Part 2 of The Excursion by William Wordsworth Book 5 of The Excursion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Excursion by William Wordsworth. Book 5th The Pastor. Farewell, Deep Valley, with thy one rude house and its small lot of life supporting fields and guardian rocks. 
farewell attractive seat to the still influx of the morning light open and day's pure cheerfulness but veiled from human observation as if yet primeval forests wrapped thee round with dark impenetrable shade once more farewell majestic circuit beautiful abyss by nature destined from the birth of things for quietness profound Upon the side of that brown ridge, sole outlet of the veil which foot of boldest stranger would attempt, lingering behind my comrades, thus I breathed a parting tribute to a spot that seemed like the fixed center of a troubled world. Again I halted with reverted eyes. The chain that would not slacken was at length snapped, and, pursuing leisurely my way, how vain, thought I, is it by chance of place to seek that comfort which the mind denies. Yet trial and temptation oft are shunned wisely, and by such tenure do we hold frail life's possessions, that even they whose fate yields no peculiar reason of complaint might, by the promise that is here, be one to steal from active duties and embrace obscurity and undisturbed repose." Knowledge, methinks, in these disordered times, should be allowed a privilege to have her anchorites like piety of old, men who from factions sacred and unstained by war might, if so minded, turn aside uncensured and subsist a scattered few living to God and nature and content with that communion. Consecrated be the spots where such abide." But happier still the man whom furthermore a hope attends that meditation and research may guide his privacy to principles and powers discovered or invented, or set forth through his acquaintance with the ways of truth in lucid order, so that when his course is run, some faithful eulogist may say, he sought not praise, and praise did overlook his unobtrusive merit, but his life, sweet to himself, was exercised in good, that shall survive his name and memory. Acknowledgments of gratitude sincere accompanied these musings. Fervent thanks for my own peaceful lot and happy choice, a choice that from the passions of the world withdrew and fixed me in a still retreat, sheltered but not to social duties lost, secluded but not buried, and with song cheering my days and with industrious thought, with the ever-welcome company of books, with virtuous friendship's soul-sustaining aid, and with the blessings of domestic love. Thus occupied in mind, I paced along, following the rugged road, by sledge or wheel worn in the moorland, till I overtook my two associates, in the morning sunshine halting together on a rocky knoll, from which the road descended rapidly to the green meadows of another vale. Here did our pensive host put forth his hand in sign of farewell. Nay, the old man said, the fragrant air its coolness still retains. The herds and flocks are yet abroad to crop the dewy grass. You cannot leave us now. We must not part at this inviting hour. He yielded, though reluctant, for his mind instinctively disposed him to retire to his own covert, as a billow heaved upon the beach rolls back into the sea. So we descend, and winding around a rock, attain a point that showed the valley stretched in length before us, and not distant far upon a rising ground a gray church tower whose battlements were screened by tufted trees, and towards a crystal mirror that lay beyond among steep hills and woods embosomed flowed a copious stream with boldly winding course, here traceable, there hidden, there again to sight restored, and glittering in the sun." On the stream's bank and everywhere appeared fair dwellings, single or in social knots, some scattered o'er the level, others perched on the hillsides, a cheerful quiet scene now in its morning purity arrayed. As mid some happy valley of the Alps, said I, once happy ere tyrannic power wantonly breaking in upon the Swiss destroyed their unoffending commonwealth, a popular equality reigns here, save for yon stately house, beneath whose roof a rural lord might dwell. No feudal pomp or power, replied the wanderer, to that house belongs. But there in his allotted home abides from year to year a genuine priest, the shepherd of his flock, or, as a king is styled when most affectionately praised, the father of his people. 
Such is he, and rich and poor, and young and old, rejoice under his spiritual sway. He hath vouchsafed to me some portion of a kind regard, and something also of his inner mind hath he imparted, but I speak of him as he is known to all. The calm delights of unambitious piety he chose, and learning's solid dignity, though born of knightly race, nor wanting powerful friends. Hither in prime of manhood he withdrew from academic bowers. He loved the spot. Who does not love his native soil? He prized the ancient rural character, composed of simple manners, feelings unsuppressed and undisguised, and strong and serious thought, a character reflected in himself with such embellishments as well beseems his rank and sacred function. This deep veil winds far in reaches hidden from our sight, and one a turreted manorial hall adorns, in which the good man's ancestors have dwelt through ages, patrons of this cure. To them, and to his own judicious pains, the vicar's dwelling and the whole domain owes that presiding aspect which might well attract your notice, statelier than could else have been bestowed through course of common chance on an unwealthy mountain benefice. This said, oft pausing, we pursued our way, nor reached the village churchyard till the sun traveling at steadier pace than ours had risen above the summits of the highest hills and round our path darted oppressive beams. As chanced, the portals of the sacred pile stood open, and we entered. On my frame, at such transition from the fervid air, a grateful coolness fell that seemed to strike the heart, in concert with that temperate awe and natural reverence which the place inspired. Not raised in nice proportions was the pile, but large and massy, for duration built, with pillars crowded and the roof upheld by naked rafters intricately crossed like leafless underboughs in some thick wood, all withered by the depth of shade above. Admonitory texts inscribed the walls, each in its ornamental scroll enclosed, each also crowned with winged heads, a pair of rudely painted cherubim. The floor of Naven Isle, in unpretending guise, was occupied by oaken benches, ranged in seemly rows. The chancel only showed some vain distinctions, marks of earthly state by immemorial privilege allowed, though with the incincture's special sanctity but ill according. An heraldic shield, varying its tincture with the changeful light, imbued the altar window, fixed aloft, a faded hatchment hung, and one by time yet undiscolored. A capacious pew of sculptured oak stood here, with drapery lined, and marble monuments were here displayed thronging the walls, and on the floor beneath sepulchral stones appeared with emblems graven and foot-worn epitaphs, and some with small and shining effigies of brass inlaid. The tribute by these various records claimed duly we paid, each after each, and read the ordinary chronicle of birth, office, alliance, and promotion, all ending in dust, of upright magistrates, grave doctors strenuous for the mother church, and uncorrupted senators alike to king and people true. A brazen plate, not easily deciphered, told of one whose course of earthly honor was begun in quality of page among the train of the eighth Henry, when he crossed the seas his royal state to show and prove his strength in tournament upon the fields of France. Another tablet registered the death and praised the gallant bearing of a knight tried in the sea fights of the second Charles. Near this brave knight his father lay entombed, and to the silent language giving voice I read how in his manhood's earlier day he, mid the afflictions of intestine war and rightful government subverted, found one only solace, that he had espoused a virtuous lady tenderly beloved for her benign perfections. And yet more endeared to him for this, that in her state of wedlock richly crowned with heaven's regard, she with a numerous issue filled his house, who throve like plants, uninjured by the storm that laid their country waste. No need to speak of less particular notices assigned to youth or maiden gone before their time, and matrons and unwedded sisters old, whose charity and goodness were rehearsed in modest panegyric. 
These dim lines, what would they tell, said I, but from the task of puzzling out that faded narrative. With whisper soft, my venerable friend called me, and looking down the darksome aisle, I saw the tenant of the lovely veil standing apart, with curved arm reclined on the baptismal font, his pallid face upturned as if his mind were wrapped or lost in some abstraction. Gracefully he stood, the semblance bearing of a sculptured form that leans upon a monumental urn in peace from morn to night, from year to year. Him from that posture did the sexton rouse, who entered, humming carelessly a tune, continuation haply of the notes that had beguiled the work from which he came with spade and mattock o'er his shoulder hung, to be deposited for future need in their appointed place. The pale recluse withdrew, and straight we followed to a spot where sun and shade were intermixed. For there a broad oak, stretching forth its leafy arms from an adjoining pasture, overhung small space of that green churchyard with a light and pleasant awning. On the moss-grown wall my ancient friend and I together took our seats, and thus the solitary spake standing before us. Did you note the mean of that self-solaced easy-hearted churl, death's hireling, who scoops out his neighbor's grave or wraps an old acquaintance up in clay, all unconcerned as he would bind a sheaf or plant a tree? And did you hear his voice? I was abruptly summoned by the sound from some affecting images and thoughts, which then were silent, but crave utterance now. Much, he continued with dejected looks, much yesterday was said in glowing phrase of our sublime dependencies and hopes for future states of being, and the wings of speculation joyfully outspread hovered above our destiny on earth. But stoop and place the prospect of the soul in sober contrast with reality and man's substantial life. If this mute earth of what it holds could speak and every grave were as a volume shut, yet capable of yielding its contents to eye and ear, we should recoil, stricken with sorrow and shame, to see disclosed by such dread proof how ill that which is done accords with what is known to reason and by conscience is enjoined. How idly, how perversely, life's whole course to this conclusion deviates from the line or if the end stops short, propose to all at her aspiring outset. Mark the babe, not long accustomed to this breathing world, one that hath barely learned to shape a smile, though yet irrational of soul to grasp with tiny finger, to let fall a tear. And as the heavy cloud of sleep dissolves to stretch his limbs, bemocking, as might seem, the outward functions of intelligent man, a grave proficient in amusive feats of puppetry, that from the lap declare his expectations and announce his claims to that inheritance which millions rue that they were ever born to. In due time a day of solemn ceremonial comes, when they, who for this minor hold in trust rights that transcend the loftiest heritage of mere humanity, present their charge, for this occasion daintily adorned at the baptismal font. And when the pure and consecrating element hath cleansed the original stain, the child is there received into the second ark, Christ's church, with trust that he from wrath redeemed, therein shall float over the billows of this troublesome world to the fair land of everlasting life. Corrupt affections, covetous desires are all renounced. High as the thought of man can carry virtue, virtue is professed. A dedication made, a promise given for due provision to control and guide, and unremitting progress to ensure in holiness and truth. You cannot blame, here interposing fervently, I said, rights which attest that man by nature lies bedded for good and evil in a gulf fearfully low. Nor will your judgment scorn those services, whereby attempt is made to lift the creature toward that eminence, on which, now fallen, erewhile in majesty he stood. Or if not so, whose top serene, at least, he feels tis given to him to descry. Nor without aspirations, evermore returning, and injunctions from within, doubt to cast off and weariness. In trust, 
that what the soul perceives, if glory lost, may be, through pains and persevering hope, recovered, or, if hitherto unknown, lies within reach, and one day shall be gained. I blame them not, he calmly answered. No, the outward ritual and established forms with which communities of men invest these inward feelings and the aspiring vows to which the lips give public utterance are both a natural process and by me shall pass uncensured. Though the issue prove, bringing from age to age its own reproach, incongruous, impotent, and blank. But, oh, if to be weak is to be wretched, miserable, as the lost angel by a human voice hath mournfully pronounced, then in my mind far better not to move at all than move by impulse sent from such elusive power that finds and cannot fasten down, that grasps and is rejoiced and loses while it grasps, that tempts, emboldens, for a time sustains and then betrays, accuses and inflicts remorseless punishment, and so retreads the inevitable circle. Better far than this, to graze the herb in thoughtless peace, by foresight or remembrance undisturbed. Philosophy, and thou vaunted name religion, with thy statelier retinue, faith, hope, and charity, from the visible world choose for your emblems whatsoe'er ye find of safest guidance or firmest trust, the torch, the star, the anchor, nor accept the cross itself, at whose unconscious feet the generations of mankind have knelt ruefully seized, and shedding bitter tears, and through that conflict seeking rest, of you, high-titled powers, am I constrained to ask, here standing, with the unvoyageable sky and faint reflection of infinitude stretched overhead, and at my pensive feet a subterraneous magazine of bones, in whose dark vaults my own shall soon be laid, where are your triumphs, your dominion where, and in what age admitted and confirmed? Not for a happy land do I inquire, Ireland or Grove, that hides a blessed few who with obedience willing and sincere to your serene authorities conform, but whom, I ask, of individual souls have ye withdrawn from passion's crooked ways, inspired and thoroughly fortified? If the heart could be inspected to its inmost folds, by sight undazzled with the glare of praise, who shall be named in the resplendent line of sages, martyrs, confessors, the man whom the best might of faith, wherever fixed, for one day's little compass has preserved from painful and discreditable shocks of contradiction, from some vague desire culpably cherished, or corrupt relapse, to some unsanctioned fear? If this be so, and man, said I, be in his noblest shape thus pitiably infirm, then he who made and who shall judge the creature will forgive. Yet in its general tenor your complaint is all too true, and surely not misplaced. For from this pregnant spot of ground such thoughts rise to the notice of a serious mind by natural exhalation. With the dead in their repose, the living in their mirth, who can reflect unmoved upon the round of smooth and solemnized complacencies, by which on Christian lands, from age to age, profession mocks performance. Earth is sick, and heaven is weary, of the hollow words which states and kingdoms utter when they talk of truth and justice. Turn to private life and social neighborhood. Look we to ourselves. A light of duty shines on every day for all. And yet how few are warmed or cheered. How few who mingle with their fellow men and still remain self-governed and apart like this our honored friend, and thence acquire right to expect his vigorous decline that promises to the end a blessed old age. Yet with a smile of triumph thus exclaimed the solitary, In the life of man, if to the poetry of common speech faith may be given, we see as in a glass a true reflection of the circling year with all its seasons. Grant that spring is there, in spite of many a rough, untoward blast, hopeful and promising with buds and flowers. Yet where is glowing summer's long, rich day that ought to follow faithfully expressed? And mellow autumn, charged with bounteous fruit, where is she imaged? 
in what favored clime her lavish pomp and ripe magnificence. Yet while the better part is missed, the worse in man's autumnal season is set forth with a resemblance not to be denied, and that contents him. Bowers that hear no more the voice of gladness, less and less supply of outward sunshine and internal warmth. And with this change, sharp air and falling leaves foretelling aged winter's desolate sway. How gay the habitations that bedeck this fertile valley! Not a house but seems to give assurance of content within, embosomed happiness and placid love, as if the sunshine of the day were met with answering brightness in the hearts of all who walk this favored ground. But chance regards, and notice forced upon incurious ears, these, if these only, acting in despite of the encomiums by my friend pronounced on humble life, Forbid the judging mind to trust the smiling aspect of this fair and noiseless commonwealth. The simple race of mountaineers, by nature's self removed from foul temptations and by constant care of a good shepherd tended as themselves do tend their flocks, partake man's general lot with little mitigation. They escape perchance the heavier woes of guilt, feel not the tedium of fantastic idleness, yet life as with the multitude, with them is fashioned like an ill-constructed tale, that on the outset wastes its gay desires, its fair adventures, its enlivening hopes and pleasant interests, for the sequel leaving old things repeated with diminished grace, and all the labored novelties at best imperfect substitutes, whose use and power evince the want and weakness whence they spring." While in this serious mood we held discourse, the reverend pastor toward the churchyard gate approached, and with a mild respectful air of native cordiality, our friend advanced to greet him. With a gracious mien was he perceived, and mutual joy prevailed. A while they stood in conference, and I guessed that he, who now upon the mossy wall sat by my side, had vanished. If a wish could have transferred him to the flying clouds, or the least penetrable hiding place in his own valley's rocky guardianship. For me, I looked upon the pair well pleased. Nature had framed them both, and both were marked by circumstance, with intermixture fine of contrast and resemblance. To an oak hardy and grand, a weather-beaten oak, fresh in the strength and majesty of age, one might be likened, Flourishing appeared, though somewhat past the fullness of his prime the other, like a stately sycamore that spreads in gentle pomp its honeyed shade. A general greeting was exchanged, and soon the pastor learned that his approach had given a welcome interruption to discourse grave, and in truth too often sad. Is man a child of hope? Do generations press on generations without progress made? Halts the individual ere his hairs be gray perforce? Are we a creature in whom good preponderates, or evil? Doth the will acknowledge reason's law, a living power as virtue, or no better than a name, fleeting as health or beauty and unsound? So that the only substance which remains, for thus the tenor of complaint hath run, among so many shadows are the pains and penalties of miserable life, doomed to decay and then expire in dust. Our cogitations this way have been drawn. These are the points, the wanderer said, on which our inquest turns. Accord, good sir, the light of your experience to dispel this gloom. By your persuasive wisdom shall the heart that frets or languishes be stilled and cheered. Our nature, said the priest in mild reply, angels may weigh and fathom. They perceive with undistempered and unclouded spirit the object as it is. But for ourselves, that speculative height we may not reach. The good and evil are our own, and we are that which we would contemplate from far. Knowledge for us is difficult to gain, is difficult to gain and hard to keep as virtue's self. Like virtue is beset with snares, tried, tempted, subject to decay. Love, admiration, fear, desire, and hate. Blind were we without these, though these alone are capable to notice or discern or to record. 
We judge but cannot be indifferent judges. Spite of proudest boast, reason, best reason, is to imperfect man an effort only and a noble aim, a crown, an attribute of sovereign power still to be courted, never to be won. Look forth, or each man dive into himself. What sees he but a creature too perturbed that is transported to excess, that yearns, regrets, or trembles wrongly or too much? hopes rashly, in disgust as rash recoils, battens on spleen or moulders in despair. Thus comprehension fails, and truth is missed, thus darkness and delusion round our path spread from disease whose subtle injury lurks within the very faculty of sight. Yet for the general purposes of faith in providence, for solace and support, we may not doubt that who can best subject the will to reason's law, can strictliest live and act in that obedience, he shall gain the clearest apprehension of those truths which unassisted reason's utmost power is too infirm to reach. But waiving this, and our regards confining within bounds of less exalted consciousness, through which the very multitude are free to range, we safely may affirm that human life is either fair and tempting, a soft scene grateful to sight, refreshing to the soul, or a forbidding tract of cheerless view, even as the same is looked at or approached. Thus, when in changeful April fields are white with new-fallen snow, if from the sullen north your walk conduct you hither, ere the sun hath gained his noontide height, this churchyard, filled with mounds transversely lying side by side from east to west, before you will appear an unillumined, blank and dreary plain, with more than wintry cheerlessness and gloom saddening the heart. Go forward and look back. Look from the quarter whence the Lord of light, of life, of love, and gladness doth dispense his beams, which, unexcluded in their fall, upon the southern side of every grave, have gently exercised a melting power. Then will a vernal prospect greet your eye, all fresh and beautiful, and green and bright, hopeful and cheerful. Vanished is the pall that overspread and chilled the sacred turf, vanished or hidden, and the whole domain to some too lightly minded might appear a meadow carpet for the dancing hours. This contrast, not unsuitable to life, is to that other state more apposite, death and its twofold aspect. Wintry, one, cold, sullen, blank, from hope and joy shut out. The other, which the ray divine hath touched, replete with vivid promise, bright as spring. We see, then, as we feel, the wanderer thus, with a complacent animation spake. And in your judgment, sir, the mind's repose on evidence is not to be ensured by act of naked reason. Moral truth is no mechanic structure built by rule, and which once built retains a steadfast shape and undisturbed proportions, but a thing subject you deem to vital accidents, and like the water lily lives and thrives whose root is fixed in stable earth, whose head floats on the tossing waves. With joy sincere I resalute these sentiments confirmed by your authority. But how acquire the inward principle that gives effect to outward argument, the passive will meek to admit, the active energy strong and unbounded to embrace, and firm to keep and cherish? How shall man unite with self-forgetting tenderness of heart and earth-despising dignity of soul, wise in that union and without it blind? The way, said I, to court, if not obtain, the ingenuous mind, apt to be set aright. This, in the lonely dell discoursing, you declared at large, and by what exercise from visible nature or the inner self-power may be trained, and renovation brought to those who need the gift. But, after all, is aught so certain as that man is doomed to breathe beneath a vault of ignorance, the natural roof of that dark house in which his soul is pent? How little can be known. This is the wise man's sigh. How far we err. This is the good man's not unfrequent pang. And they perhaps err least, the lowly class whom a benign necessity compels to follow reason's least ambitious course. 
Such do I mean who, unperplexed by doubt, and unincited by a wish to look into high objects farther than they may, pace to and fro from morn till eventide, the narrow avenue of daily toil for daily bread. Yes, buoyantly exclaimed the pale recluse, praise to the sturdy plough and patient spade, praise to the simple crook and ponderous loom, resounding while it holds body and mind in one captivity, and let the light mechanic tool be hailed with honor, which encasing by the power of long companionship the artist's hand, cuts off that hand with all its world of nerves from a too busy commerce with the heart. Inglorious implements of craft and toil, both ye that shape and build, and ye that force by slow solicitation earth to yield her annual bounties, sparingly dealt forth with wise reluctance. You would I extol, not for gross good alone which ye produce, but for the impertinent and ceaseless strife of proofs and reasons ye preclude in those who to your dull society are born and with their humble birthright rest content. Would I had ne'er renounced it! A slight flush of moral anger previously had tinged the old man's cheek, but at this closing turn of self-reproach it passed away. Said he, That which we feel we utter, as we think, so have we argued, reaping for our pains no visible recompense. For our relief you, to the pastor turning thus he spake, have kindly interposed. May I entreat your further help? The mine of real life dig for us, and present us in the shape of virgin ore that gold which we, by pains fruitless as those of airy alchemists, seek from the torturing crucible. There lies around us a domain where you have long watched both the outward course and inner heart. Give us, for our abstractions, solid facts, for our disputes plain pictures. Say what man he is who cultivates yon hanging field, what qualities of mind she bears who comes for morn and evening service with her pail to that green pasture. Place before our sight the family who dwell within yon house, fenced round with glittering laurel, or in that below from which the curling smoke ascends. Or rather, as we stand on holy earth and have the dead around us, take from them your instances. For they are both best known and by frail man most equitably judged. Epitomize the life, pronounce, you can, authentic epitaphs on some of these who from their lowly mansions hither brought, beneath this turf lie moldering at our feet. So by your records may our doubts be solved. And so, not searching higher, we may learn to prize the breath we share with humankind and look upon the dust of man with awe. The priest replied, An office you impose, for which peculiar requisites are mine. Yet much I feel is wanting, else the task would be most grateful. True indeed it is that they whom death has hidden from our sight are worthiest of the mind's regard, with these the future cannot contradict the past. Mortality's last exercise and proof is undergone. The transit made that shows the very soul revealed as she departs. Yet on your first suggestion will I give, ere we descend into these silent vaults, one picture from the living. You behold, high on the breast of yon dark mountain, dark with stony barrenness, a shining speck, bright as a sunbeam, sleeping till a shower brush it away, or cloud pass over it. And such it might be deemed, a sleeping sunbeam. But tis a plot of cultivated ground, cut off an island in the dusky waste, and that attractive brightness is its own. The lofty site by nature framed to tempt amid a wilderness of rocks and stones the tiller's hand, a hermit might have chosen, for opportunity presented, thence far forth to send his wandering eye o'er land and ocean, and look down upon the works, the habitations, and the ways of men, himself unseen. But no tradition tells that ever hermit dipped his maple dish in the sweet spring that lurks mid yon green fields, and no such visionary views belong to those who occupy and till the ground high on that mountain where they long have dwelt, 
a wedded pair in childless solitude. A house of stones collected on the spot by rude hands built with rocky knolls in front, backed also by a ledge of rock whose crest of birch trees waves over the chimney top, a rough abode in color, shape, and size, such as in unsafe times of border war might have been wished for and contrived to elude the eye of roving plunderer. For their need suffices, and unshaken bears the assault of their most dreaded foe, the strong southwest, in anger blowing from the distant sea. Alone within her solitary hut, there, or within the compass of her fields, at any moment may the dame be found, true as the stock dove to her shallow nest and to the grove that holds it. She beguiles by intermingled work of house and field the summer's day and winter's, with success not equal, but sufficient to maintain, even at the worst, a smooth stream of content, until the expected hour at which her mate from the far distant quarry's vault returns, and by his converse crowns a silent day with evening cheerfulness. In powers of mind and scale of culture, few among my flock hold lower rank than this sequestered pair. But true humility descends from heaven, and that best gift of heaven hath fallen on them, abundant recompense for every want. Stoop from your height, ye proud, and copy these, who in their noiseless dwelling place can hear the voice of wisdom whispering scripture texts for the mind's government or temper's peace, and recommending for their mutual need forgiveness, patience, hope, and charity. Much was I pleased, the gray-eyed wanderer said, when to those shining fields our notice first you turned. And yet more pleased have from your lips gathered this fair report of them who dwell in that retirement, whither by such course of evil hap and good as oft awaits a tired wayfaring man, once I was brought while traversing alone yon mountain pass. Dark on my road the autumnal evening fell, and night succeeded with unusual gloom, so hazardous that feet and hands became guides better than mine eyes until a light high in the gloom appeared, too high, methought, for human habitation. But I longed to reach it, destitute of other hope. I looked with steadiness as sailors look on the North Star, or watchtower's distant lamp, and saw the light now fixed, and shifting now, not like a dancing meteor, but in line of never varying motion to and fro. It is no night fire of the naked hills, thought I, some friendly covert must be near. With this persuasion, thitherward my steps I turn, and reach at last the guiding light, joy to myself, but to the heart of her who there was standing on the open hill, the same kind matron whom your tongue hath praised, alarm and disappointment. The alarm ceased when she learned through what mishap I came, and by what help had gained those distant fields. Drawn from her cottage, on that airy height, Bearing a lantern in her hand, she stood, or paced the ground, to guide her husband home by that unwearied signal, kenned afar, an anxious duty, which the lofty sight, traversed but by a few irregular paths, imposes, whensoe'er untoward chance detains him after his accustomed hour, till night lies black upon the ground. But come, come, said the matron, to our poor abode. Those dark rocks hide it. Entering, I beheld a blazing fire, beside a cleanly hearth sat down, and to her office, with leave asked, the dame returned. Or ere that glowing pile of mountain turf required the builder's hand its wasted splendor to repair, the door opened, and she re-entered with glad looks, her helpmate following. Hospitable fare, frank conversation, made the evening's treat. Need a bewildered traveler wish for more? but more was given. I studied as we sat by the bright fire the good man's form, and face not less than beautiful, an open brow of undisturbed humanity, a cheek suffused with something of a feminine hue, eyes beaming courtesy and mild regard. But in the quicker turns of the discourse, expressions slowly varying that evinced a tardy apprehension. From a fount lost, thought I, in the obscurities of time, but honored once, those features and that mean may have descended, though I see them here. In such a man, so gentle and subdued, withal so graceful in his gentleness, a race illustrious for heroic deeds, humbled, but not degraded, 
may expire. This pleasing fancy, cherished and upheld by sundry recollections of such fall from high to low, ascent from low to high, as books record, and even the careless mind cannot but notice among men and things, went with me to the place of my repose. Roused by the crowing cock at dawn of day, I yet had risen too late to interchange a morning salutation with my host, gone forth already to the far-off seat of his day's work. Three dark midwinter months pass, said the matron, and I never see, save when the Sabbath brings its kind release, my helpmate's face by light of day. He quits his door in darkness, nor till dusk returns. And through heaven's blessing, thus we gain the bread for which we pray and for the wants provide of sickness, accident, and helpless age. Companions have I many, many friends, dependents, comforters, my wheel, my fire, all day the house clock ticking in mine ear, the cackling hen, the tender chicken brood, and the wild birds that gather round my porch. This honest sheepdog's countenance I read, with him can talk, nor blush to waste a word on creatures less intelligent and shrewd. And if the blustering wind that drives the clouds care not for me, he lingers round my door and makes me pass time when our tempers suit. But above all, my thoughts are my support, my comfort. Would that they were oftener fixed on what for guidance in the way that leads to heaven I know by my Redeemer taught. The matron ended, nor could I forbear to exclaim, O oh, happy, yielding to the law of these privations, richer in the main, while thankless thousands are oppressed and clogged by ease and leisure, by the very wealth and pride of opportunity made poor, while tens of thousands falter in their path and sink through utter want of cheering light. For you the hours of labor do not flag. For you each evening hath its shining star, and every Sabbath day its golden sun. Yes, said the solitary, with a smile that seemed to break from an expanding heart. The untutored bird may found and construct, and with such soft materials line her nest fixed in the center of a prickly break, that the thorns wound her not, they only guard. Powers not unjustly likened to those gifts of happy instinct which the woodland bird shares with her species. Nature's grace sometimes upon the individual doth confer, among her higher creatures born and trained to use of reason. And I own that tired of the ostentatious world, a swelling stage with empty actions and vain passions stuffed, and from the private struggles of mankind, hoping far less than I could wish to hope, far less than once I trusted and believed. I love to hear of those who, not contending nor summoned to contend for virtue's prize, miss not the humbler good at which they aim, blessed with a kindly faculty to blunt the edge of adverse circumstance and turn into their contraries the petty plagues and hindrances with which they stand beset. In early youth among my native hills I knew a Scottish peasant who possessed a few small crofts of stone-encumbered ground, masses of every shape and size that lay scattered about under the moldering walls of a rough precipice, and some apart in quarters unobnoxious to such chance as if the moon had showered them down in spite. But he repined not, though the plough was scared by these obstructions, Round the shady stones a fertilizing moisture, said the swain, gathers and is preserved, and feeding dews and damps, through all the droughty summer day from out their substance issuing, maintain herbage that never fails. No grass springs up so green, so fresh, so plentiful as mine. But thinly sown these natures, rare at least the mutual aptitude of seed and soil that yields such kindly product. He whose bed perhaps yon loose sods cover, the poor pensioner brought yesterday from our sequestered dell here to lie down in lasting quiet, he, if living now, could otherwise report of rustic loneliness. That gray-haired orphan, so call him, for humanity to him no parent was, feelingly could have told in life, in death, what solitude can breed of selfishness and cruelty and vice or if it breed not, hath not power to cure. But your compliance, sir, with our request, my words too long have hindered. 
undeterred, perhaps incited rather by these shocks, in no ungracious opposition, given to the confiding spirit of his own experienced faith. The reverend pastor said around him, looking, Where shall I begin? Who shall be first selected from my flock, gathered together in their peaceful fold? He paused, and having lifted up his eyes to the pure heaven, he cast them down again upon the earth beneath his feet, and spake, to a mysteriously united pair this place is consecrate, to death and life, and to the best affections that proceed from their conjunction. Consecrate to faith in him who bled for man upon the cross, hallowed to revelation, and no less to reason's mandates, and the hopes divine of pure imagination, above all to charity and love, that have provided within these precincts a capacious bed and receptacle, open to the good and evil, to the just and the unjust, in which they find an equal resting place, even as the multitude of kindred brooks and streams whose murmur fills this hollow vale, whether their course be turbulent or smooth, their waters clear or sullied, all are lost within the bosom of yon crystal lake, and end their journey in the same repose." And blessed are they who sleep, and we that know, while in a spot like this we breathe and walk, that all beneath us by the wings are covered of motherly humanity, outspread and gathering all within their tender shade, though loath and slow to come. A battlefield in stillness left when slaughter is no more, with this compared makes a strange spectacle. A dismal prospect yields the wild shore strewn with wrecks and trod by feet of young and old wandering about in miserable search of friends or kindred, whom the angry sea restores not to their prayer. Ah, who would think that all the scattered subjects which compose earth's melancholy vision through the space of all her climes, these wretched, these depraved, to virtue lost, insensible of peace, from the delights of charity cut off, to pity dead, the oppressor and the oppressed, tyrants who utter the destroying word, and slaves who will consent to be destroyed, were of one species with the sheltered few, who with a dutiful and tender hand lodged in a dear appropriated spot this file of infants, some that never breathed the vital air, others which, though allowed that privilege, did yet expire too soon or with too brief a warning to admit administration of the holy rite that lovingly consigns the babe to the arms of Jesus and his everlasting care. These that in trembling hope are laid apart, and the besprinkled nursling, unrequired till he begins to smile upon the breast that feeds him, and the tottering little one taken from air and sunshine when the rose of infancy first blooms upon his cheek, the thinking, thoughtless schoolboy, the bold youth of soul impetuous, and the bashful maid smitten, while all the promises of life are opening round her. Those of middle age, cast down while confident in strength they stand, like pillars fixed more firmly as might seem, and more secure, by very weight of all that for support rests on them, the decayed and burdensome. And lastly, that poor few whose light of reason is with age extinct the hopeful and the hopeless, first and last, the earliest summoned and the longest spared, are here deposited, with tribute paid various, but unto each some tribute paid, as if amid these peaceful hills and groves society were touched with kind concern, and gentle nature grieved that one should die, or if the change demanded no regret, observed the liberating stroke, and blessed. And whence that tribute? Wherefore these regards? Not from the naked heart alone of man, though claiming high distinction upon earth as the sole spring and fountainhead of tears, his own peculiar utterance for distress or gladness. No, the philosophic priest continued, tis not in the vital seat of feeling to produce them without aid from the pure soul, the soul sublime and pure with her two faculties of eye and ear the one by which a creature whom his sins have rendered prone can upward look to heaven, the other that empowers him to perceive the voice of deity on height and plain, whispering those truths in stillness which the word to the four quarters of the winds proclaims. 
Not without such assistance could the use of these benign observances prevail. Thus they are born, thus fostered, thus maintained, and by the care perspective of our wise forefathers, who to guard against the shocks, the fluctuation and decay of things, embodied and established these high truths in solemn institutions. Men convinced that life is love and immortality, the being one and one the element. There lies the channel and original bed from the beginning, hollowed out and scooped for man's affections. Else betrayed and lost and swallowed up mid deserts infinite. This is the genuine course, the aim and end of prescient reason. All conclusions else are abject, vain, presumptuous, and perverse. The faith partaking of those holy times, life, I repeat, is energy of love, divine or human, exercised in pain, in strife and tribulation, and ordained, if so approved and sanctified, to pass through shades and silent rest to endless joy. End of Book 5 of The Excursion by William Wordsworth Book 6, Part 1 of The Excursion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Excursion by William Wordsworth Book Sixth The Churchyard Among the Mountains Hail to the crown by freedom shaped, To gird an English sovereign's brow, And to the throne whereon he sits, Whose deep foundations lie in veneration And the people's love, Whose steps are equity, whose seat is law, Hail to the state of England, and can join with this a salutation as devout, made to the spiritual fabric of her church, founded in truth, by blood of martyrdom cemented, by the hands of wisdom reared in beauty of holiness, with ordered pomp, decent and unreproved. The voice that greets the majesty of both shall pray for both, that mutually protected and sustained, they may endure long as the sea surrounds this favored land, or sunshine warms her soil. And, O oh, ye swelling hills and spacious plains, besprent from shore to shore with steeple towers and spires whose silent finger points to heaven, nor wanting at wide intervals the bulk of ancient minister lifted above the cloud of the dense air which town or city breeds to intercept the sun's glad beams, may ne'er that true succession fail of English hearts, who with ancestral feeling can perceive what in those holy structures ye possess of ornamental interest, and the charm of pious sentiment diffused afar, and human charity, and social love. Thus never shall the indignities of time approach their reverend graces unopposed, nor shall the elements be free to hurt their fair proportions, nor the blinder rage of bigot zeal madly to overturn. And if the desolating hand of war spare them, they shall continue to bestow upon the thronged abodes of busy men, depraved and ever prone to fill the mind exclusively with transitory things, an air and mien of dignified pursuit, of sweet civility on rustic wilds. The poet, fostering for his native land such hope, entreats that servants may abound of those pure altars worthy, Ministers detached from pleasure, to the love of gain superior, insusceptible of pride, and by ambitious longings undisturbed. Men whose delight is where their duty leads or fixes them, whose least distinguished day shines with some portion of that heavenly luster which makes the Sabbath lovely in the sight of blessed angels pitying human cares. And as on earth it is the doom of truth to be perpetually attacked by foes open or covert, be that priesthood still, for her defense, replenished with a band of strenuous champions in scholastic arts thoroughly disciplined. Nor, if in course of the revolving world's disturbances cause should recur which righteous heaven avert to meet such trial, 
from their spiritual sires degenerate, who, constrained to wield the sword of disputation, shrunk not, though assailed with hostile din, and combating in sight of angry umpires partial and unjust, and did thereafter bathe their hands in fire, so to declare the conscience satisfied, nor for their bodies would accept release, but blessing God and praising Him bequeathed with their last breath from out the smoldering flame the faith which they by diligence had earned, or through illuminating grace received for their dear countrymen and all mankind. O high example, constancy divine! Even such a man, inheriting the zeal and from the sanctity of elder times not deviating, a priest the like of whom, if multiplied and in their station set, would o'er the bosom of a joyful land spread true religion and her genuine fruits, before me stood that day, on holy ground, fraught with the relics of mortality, exalting tender themes by just degrees to lofty raised, and to the highest last, the head and mighty paramount of truths, immortal life in never-fading worlds, for mortal creatures conquered and secured. That basis laid, those principles of faith announced as a preparatory act of reverence done to the spirit of the place, the pastor cast his eyes upon the ground not as before like one oppressed with awe, but with a mild and social cheerfulness. Then to the solitary turned and spake, At morn or eve, in your retired domain, perchance you not unfrequently have marked a visitor in quest of herbs and flowers. Two delicate employees would appear for one, who, though of drooping mien, had yet from nature's kindliness received a frame robust as ever rural labor bred. The solitary answered, Such a form full well I recollect. We often crossed each other's path. But as the intruder seemed fondly to prize the silence which he kept, and as I willingly did cherish mine, we met and passed like shadows. I have heard from my good host that being crazed in brain by unrequited love, he scaled the rocks, dived into caves, and pierced the matted woods in hope to find some virtuous herb of power to cure his malady. The vicar smiled. Alas, before tomorrow's sun goes down, his habitation will be here. For him that open grave is destined. Died he then of pain and grief? the solitary asked. Do not believe it. Never could that be. He loved, the vicar answered, deeply loved, loved fondly, truly, fervently, and dared at length to tell his love, but sued in vain, rejected, yea, repelled, and, if with scorn upon the haughty maiden's brow, tis but a high-prized plume which female beauty wears in wantonness of conquest, or puts on to cheat the world, or from herself to hide humiliation when no longer free. That he could brook and glory in. But when the tidings came that she whom he had wooed was wedded to another, and his heart was forced to rend away its only hope, then pity could have scarcely found on earth an object worthier of regard than he in the transition of that bitter hour. Lost was she lost. Nor could the sufferer say that in the act of preference he had been unjustly dealt with. But the maid was gone had vanished from his prospects and desires, not by translation to the heavenly choir who have put off their mortal spoils. Ah, no, she lives another's wishes to complete. Joy be their lot, and happiness, he cried, his lot and hers, as misery, must be mine. Such was that strong concussion, but the man who trembled, trunk and limbs like some huge oak by a fierce tempest shaken, soon resumed the steadfast quiet natural to a mind of composition gentle and sedate, and in its movements circumspect and slow. To books, and to the long forsaken desk, or which enchained by science he had loved to bend, he stoutly readdressed himself, resolved to quell his pain, and search for truth with keener appetite, if that might be, and closer industry. Of what ensued within the heart no outward sign appeared till a betraying sickliness was seen to tinge his cheek, and through his frame it crept with slow mutation unconcealable, 
such universal change as autumn makes in the fair body of a leafy grove discolored then divested tis affirmed by poets skilled in nature's secret ways that love will not submit to be controlled by mastery and the good man lacked not friends who strove to instill this truth into his mind a mind in all heart mysteries unversed go to the hills said one remit awhile this baneful diligence at early morn court the fresh air explore the heaths and woods and leaving it to others to foretell by calculations sage the ebb and flow of tides and when the moon will be eclipsed do you for your own benefit construct a calendar of flowers plucked as they blow where health abides and cheerfulness and peace the attempt was made tis needless to report how hopelessly but innocence is strong and an entire simplicity of mind a thing most sacred in the eye of heaven that opens for such sufferers relief within the soul fountains of grace divine and doth commend their weakness and disease to nature's care assisted in her office by all the elements that round her wait to generate to preserve and to restore and by her beautiful array of forms shedding sweet influence from above or pure delight exhaling from the ground they tread impute it not to impatience if exclaimed the wanderer i infer that he was healed by perseverance in the course prescribed you do not err the powers that had been lost by slow degrees were gradually regained the fluttering nerves composed the beating heart in rest established and the jarring thoughts to harmony restored but yon dark mold will cover him in the fullness of his strength hastily smitten by a fever's force yet not with strokes so sudden as refused time to look back with tenderness on her whom he had loved in passion and to send some farewell words with one but one request that from his dying hand she would accept of his possessions that which most he prized a book upon whose leaves some chosen plants by his own hand disposed with nicest care in undecaying beauty were preserved mute register to him of time and place and various fluctuations in the breast to her a monument of faithful love conquered and in tranquility retained close to his destined habitation lies one who achieved a humbler victory though marvelous in its kind a place there is high in these mountains that allured a band of keen adventurers to unite their pains in search of precious ore they tried were foiled and all desisted all save him alone he taking counsel of his own clear thoughts and trusting only to his own weak hands urged unremittingly the stubborn work unseconded uncountenanced then as time passed on while still his lonely efforts found no recompense derided and at length by many pitied as insane of mind by others dreaded as the luckless thrall of subterranean spirits feeding hope by various mockery of sight and sound hope after hope encouraged and destroyed but when the lord of seasons had matured the fruits of earth through space of twice ten years the mountain's entrails offered to his view and trembling grasp the long deferred reward not with more transport did columbus greet a world his rich discovery but our swain a very hero till his point was gained proved all unable to support the weight of prosperous fortune on the fields he looked with an unsettled liberty of thought wishes and endless schemes by daylight walked giddy and restless ever and anon quaffed in his gratitude immoderate cups and truly might be said to die of joy he vanished but conspicuous to this day the path remains that linked his cottage door to the mine's mouth a long and slanting track upon the rugged mountain's stony side worn by his daily visits to and from the darksome center of a constant hope this vestige neither force of beating rain nor the vicissitudes of frost and thaw shall cause to fade till ages pass away and it is named in memory of the event the path of perseverance thou from whom man has his strength exclaimed the wanderer oh do thou direct it 
To the virtuous grant the penetrative eye which can perceive in this blind world the guiding vein of hope, that like this laborer, such may dig their way unshaken, unseduced, unterrified, grant to the wise his firmness of resolve. That prayer were not superfluous, said the priest. Amid the noblest relics, proudest dust that Westminster for Britain's glory holds within the bosom of her awful pile ambitiously collected. Yet the sigh which wafts that prayer to heaven is due to all, wherever laid, who living fell below their virtue's humbler mark, a sigh of pain if to the opposite extreme they sank. How would you pity her who yonder rests, him farther off, the pair who here are laid? But above all, that mixture of earth's mold whom sight of this green hillock to my mind recalls. He lived not till his locks were nipped by seasonable frost of age, nor died before his temples, prematurely forced to mix the manly ground with silver gray, gave obvious instance of the sad effect produced, when thoughtless folly hath usurped the natural crown that sage experience wears. Gay, volatile, ingenious, quick to learn, and prompt to exhibit all that he possessed or could perform, a zealous actor, hired into the troop of mirth, a soldier sworn into the lists of giddy enterprise. Such was he, yet as if within his frame two several souls alternately had lodged, two sets of manners could the youth put on, and fraught with antics as the Indian bird that writhes and chatters in her wiry cage was graceful when it pleased him, smooth and still as the mute swan that floats adown the stream, or on the waters of the unruffled lake anchors her placid beauty. Not a leaf that flutters on the bough, lighter than he, and not a flower that droops in the green shade more winningly reserved. If ye inquire how such consummate elegance was bred amid these wilds, this answer may suffice. T'was nature's will, who sometimes undertakes, for the reproof of human vanity, art to outstrip in her peculiar walk. Hence, for this favorite, lavishly endowed with personal gifts and bright instinctive wit, while both embellishing each other stood yet farther recommended by the charm of fine demeanor, and by dance and song and skill in letters, every fancy shaped fair expectations. Nor when to the world's capacious field forth went the adventurer, there were he and his attainments overlooked, or scantily rewarded. But all hopes cherished for him he suffered to depart like blighted buds, or clouds that mimicked land before the sailor's eye, or diamond drops that sparkling decked the morning grass, or aught that was attractive and hath ceased to be. Yet when this prodigal returned, the rites of joyful greeting were on him bestowed, who by humiliation undeterred sought for his weariness a place of rest within his father's gates. Whence came he, clothed in tattered garb, from hovels where abides necessity, the stationary host of vagrant poverty, from rifted barns where no one dwells but the wide staring owl and the owl's prey, from these bare haunts to which he had descended from the proud saloon, he came, the ghost of beauty and of health, the wreck of gaiety. But soon revived in strength, in power refitted, he renewed his suit to fortune. And she smiled again upon a fickle ingrate. Thrice he rose, thrice sank as willingly. For he whose nerves were used to thrill with pleasure while his voice softly accompanied the tuneful harp, by the nice finger of fair ladies touched in glittering halls, was able to derive no less enjoyment from an abject choice. Who happier for the moment? Who more blithe than this fallen spirit? In those dreary holds his talents lending to exalt the freaks of merry-making beggars, nor provoke to laughter multiplied in louder peals by his malicious wit, then all enchained with mute astonishment themselves to see in their own arts outdone, their fame eclipsed, as by the very presence of the fiend who dictates and inspires elusive feats for knavish purposes. The city, too, with shame I speak it, to her guilty bowers allured him, sunk so low in self-respect as there to linger, there to eat his bread, hired minstrel of voluptuous blandishment, 
charming the air with skill of hand or voice. Listen who would. Be wrought upon who might, sincerely wretched hearts or falsely gay. Such the too frequent tenor of his boast in ears that relished the report. But all was from his parents happily concealed, who saw enough for blame and pitying love. They also were permitted to receive his last repentant breath, and closed his eyes no more to open on that irksome world, where he had long existed in the state of a young fowl beneath one mother hatched, though from another sprung, different in kind, where he had lived and could not cease to live distracted in propensity, contend with neither element of good or ill, and yet in both rejoicing, man unblessed, of contradictions infinite the slave, till his deliverance when mercy made him one with himself and one with them that sleep. "'Tis strange,' observed the solitary, "'strange it seems, and scarcely less than pitiful, "'that in a land where charity provides for all "'that can no longer feed themselves, "'a man like this should choose to bring his shame "'to the parental door, "'and with his sighs infect the air "'which he had freely breathed in happy infancy. "'He could not pine through lack of converse, no, he must have found abundant exercise for thought and speech in his individual being, self-reviewed, self-catechized, self-punished. Some there are who drawing near their final home, and much and daily longing that the same were reached, would rather shun than seek the fellowship of kindred mold. Such haply here are laid? Yes, said the priest. The genius of our hills, who seems by these stupendous barriers cast round his domain, desirous not alone to keep his own, but also to exclude all other progeny, doth sometimes lure, even by his studied depth of privacy, the unhappy alien hoping to obtain concealment, or seduced by wish to find, in place from outward molestation free, helps to internal ease. Of many such could I discourse, but as their stay was brief, so their departure only left behind fancies and loose conjectures. Other trace survives for worthy mention of a pair who, from the pressure of their several fates, meeting as strangers in a petty town whose blue roofs ornament a distant reach of this far winding vale, remained as friends true to their choice, and gave their bones in trust to this loved cemetery, here to lodge with unescutcheoned privacy interred far from the family vault. A chieftain won by right of birth, within whose spotless breast the fire of ancient Caledonia burned. He with the foremost whose impatience hailed the steward, landing to resume, by force of arms, the crown which bigotry had lost, aroused his clan, and, fighting at their head with his brave sword, endeavored to prevent Culloden's fatal overthrow. Escaped from that disastrous rout, to foreign shores he fled, and when the lenient hand of time those troubles had appeased, he sought and gained from his obscured condition an obscure retreat within this nook of English ground. The other, born in Britain's southern tract, had fixed his milder loyalty and placed his gentler sentiments of love and hate there, where they placed them who in conscience prized the new succession as a line of kings whose oath had virtue to protect the land against the dire assaults of papacy and arbitrary rule. But launch thy bark on the distempered flood of public life, and cause for most rare triumph will be thine, if, spite of keenest eye and steadiest hand, the stream that bears thee forward prove not, soon or late, a perilous master. He who oft beneath the battlements and stately trees that round his mansion cast a sober gloom had moralized on this and other truths of kindred import, pleased and satisfied, was forced to vent his wisdom with a sigh heaved from the heart in fortune's bitterness, when he had crushed a plentiful estate by ruinous contest to obtain a seat in Britain's Senate. Fruitless was the attempt, and while the uproar of that desperate strife continued yet to vibrate on his ear, the vanquished Whig, under a borrowed name, for the mere sound and echo of his own, haunted him with sensations of disgust that he was glad to lose, slunk from the world 
to the deep shade of those untraveled wilds, in which the Scottish laird had long possessed an undisturbed abode. Here, then, they met two doughty champions, flaming Jacobite and sullen Hanoverian. You might think that losses and vexations, less severe than those which they had severally sustained, would have inclined each to abate his zeal for his ungrateful cause. No, I have heard my reverend father tell that mid the calm of that small town encountering thus, they filled daily its bowling green with harmless strife plagued with uncharitable thoughts the church, and vexed the marketplace. But in the breasts of these opponents gradually was wrought with little change of general sentiment, such leaning towards each other, that their days by choice were spent in constant fellowship, and if at times they fretted with the yoke, those very bickerings made them love it more. A favorite boundary to their lengthened walks this churchyard was, and whether they had come treading their path in sympathy and linked in social converse, or by some short space discreetly parted to preserve the peace, one spirit seldom failed to extend its sway over both minds. When they a while had marked the visible quiet of this holy ground and breathed its soothing air, the spirit of hope and saintly magnanimity, that spurning the field of selfish difference and dispute and every care which transitory things earth and the kingdoms of the earth create, doth by a rapture of forgetfulness preclude forgiveness from the praise debarred which else the Christian virtue might have claimed. There live who yet remember here to have seen their courtly figures seated on the stump of an old yew, their favorite resting place. But as the remnant of the long-lived tree was disappearing by a swift decay, they, with joint care, determined to erect upon its site a dial that might stand for public use preserved, and thus survive as their own private monument. For this was the particular spot in which they wished, and heaven was pleased to accomplish the desire, that undivided their remains should lie. So where the moldered tree had stood was raised yon structure, framing with the ascent of steps that to the decorated pillar lead, a work of art more sumptuous than might seem to suit this place, yet built in no proud scorn of rustic homeliness. They only aimed to ensure for it respectful guardianship around the margin of the plate, whereon the shadow falls to note the stealthy hours, winds, and inscriptive legend. At these words, thither we turned, and gathered, as we read, the appropriate sense in Latin numbers couched. Time flies. It is his melancholy task to bring and bear away delusive hopes, and reproduce the troubles he destroys. But while his blindness thus is occupied, discerning mortal, do thou serve the will of time's eternal master, and that peace which the world wants shall be for thee confirmed. Smooth verse, inspired by no unlettered muse, exclaimed the skeptic, and the strain of thought accords with nature's language. The soft voice of yon white torrent falling down the rock speaks less distinctly to the same effect. If then their blended influence be not lost upon our hearts, not wholly lost, I grant, even upon mine, the more are we required to feel for those among our fellow men, who offering no obeisance to the world, are yet made desperate by too quick a sense of constant infelicity, cut off from peace like exiles on some barren rock, their life's appointed prison. Not more free than sentinels between two armies set, with nothing better in the chill night air than their own thoughts to comfort them. Say why that ancient story of Prometheus chained to the bare rock on frozen Caucasus, the vulture, the inexhaustible repast drawn from his vitals. Say what meant the woes by Tantalus entailed upon his race and the dark sorrows of the line of Thebes. Fictions in form, but in their substance truths, tremendous truths, familiar to the men of long past times, nor obsolete in ours. Exchange the shepherd's frock of native gray for robes with regal purple tinged. Convert the crook into a scepter, 
Give the pomp of circumstance, and here the tragic muse shall find apt subjects for her highest art. Amid the groves, under the shadowy hills, the generations are prepared. The pangs, the internal pangs are ready. The dread strife of poor humanity's afflicted will struggling in vain with ruthless destiny. Though, said the priest in answer, these be terms which a divine philosophy rejects, we whose established and unfailing trust is in controlling providence admit that through all station human life abounds with mysteries. For if faith were left untried, how could the might that lurks within her then be shown? Her glorious excellence that ranks among the first of powers and virtues proved our system is not fashioned to preclude that sympathy which you for others ask. And I could tell, not traveling for my theme beyond these humble graves, of grievous crimes and strange disasters. But I pass them by, loath to disturb what heaven hath hushed in peace. Still less, far less, am I inclined to treat of man degraded in his maker's sight by the deformities of brutish vice. For in such portraits, though a vulgar face and a coarse outside of repulsive life and unaffecting manners, might at once be recognized by all. Ah, do not think, the wanderer somewhat eagerly exclaimed. Wish could be ours that you, for such poor gain, gain, shall I call it, gain of what, for whom, should breathe a word tending to violate your own pure spirit. Not a step we look for in slight of that forbearance and reserve which common human-heartedness inspires, and mortal ignorance and frailty claim upon this sacred ground, if nowhere else. End of Book 6, Part 1 of The Excursion Book Sixth, Part Two of The Excursion by William Wordsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. True, said the solitary, be it far from us to infringe the laws of charity. Let judgment here in mercy be pronounced. This self respecting nature prompts, and this wisdom enjoins. But if the thing we seek be genuine knowledge, bear we then in mind how from his lofty throne. The sun can fling colors as bright on exultations bred by weedy pool or pestilential swamp, as by the rivulet sparkling where it runs, or the pellucid lake. Small risk, said I, of such illusion do we here incur. Temptation here is none to exceed the truth. No evidence appears that they who rest within this ground were covetous of praise, or of remembrance even, deserved or not. Green is the churchyard, beautiful and green, ridge rising gently by the side of ridge, a heaving surface, almost wholly free from interruption of sepulchral stones, and mantled o'er with aboriginal turf and everlasting flowers. These dalesmen trust the lingering gleam of their departed lives to oral record, and the silent heart. Depositories faithful and more kind than fondest epitaph. For if those fail, what boots the sepulchred tomb? And who can blame, who rather would not envy, men that feel this mutual confidence? If from such source the practice flow, if thence, or from a deep and general humility in death? Nor should I much condemn it, if it spring from disregard of time's destructive power, as only capable to prey on things of earth and human nature's mortal part. Yet. In less simple districts, where we see stone lift its forehead emulous of stone in courting notice, and the ground all paved with commendations of departed worth, reading, where e'er we turn, of innocent lives of each domestic charity fulfilled, and sufferings meekly borne, I, for my part, though with the silence pleased that here prevails, among those fair recitals also range, soothed by the natural spirit which they breathe, and, in the centre of a world whose soil is rank with all unkindness, compassed round with such memorials, I have sometimes felt it was no momentary happiness to have one enclosure where the voice that speaks in envy or detraction is not heard, which malice may not enter, 
where the traces of evil inclinations are unknown, where love and pity tenderly unite with resignation, and no jarring tone intrudes the peaceful concert to disturb of amenity and gratitude. Thus sanctioned, the pastor said, I willingly confine my narratives to subjects that excite feelings with these accordant, love, esteem, and admiration. Lifting up a veil, a sunbeam introducing among hearts retired and covert, so that ye shall have clear images before your gladdened eyes of nature's unambitious underwood, and flowers that prosper in the shade. And when I speak of such among my flock, as swerved or fell, those only shall be singled out upon whose lapse or error something more than brotherly forgiveness may attend. To such will we restrict our notice, else better by my tongue were mute. And yet there are, I feel, good reasons why we should not leave wholly untraced a more forbidding way. For strength to persevere and to support, and energy to conquer and repel, these elements of virtue that declare the native grandeur of the human soul are oft-times not unprofitably shown in the perverseness of a selfish course, truth every day exemplified, no less in the grey cottage by the murmuring stream than in fantastic conqueror's roving camp, or mid the factious senate, unappalled whoe'er may sink or rise, to sink again as merciless proscription ebbs and flows. There, said the vicar, pointing as he spake, a woman rests in peace, surpassed by few in power of mind and eloquent discourse. Tall was her stature, her complexion dark and saturnine, her head not raised to hold converse with heaven, nor yet depressed towards earth, but in projection carried, as she walked for ever musing. Sunken were her eyes, wrinkled and furrowed with habitual thought was her broad forehead, like the brow of one whose visual nerve shrinks from a painful glare of overpowering light. While yet a child, she, mid the humble flowerets of the vale, towered like the imperial thistle, not unfurnished with its appropriate grace, yet rather seeking to be admired than coveted and loved. Even at that age she ruled, a sovereign queen, over her comrades, else their simple sports, wanting all relish for her strenuous mind, had crossed her only to be shunned with scorn. O oh, pang of sorrowful regret for those whom, in their youth, sweet study has enthralled, that they have lived for harsher servitude, whether in soul, in body, or estate. Such doom was hers. Yet nothing could subdue her keen desire of knowledge, nor efface those brighter images by books impressed upon her memory, faithfully as stars that occupy their places, and though oft hidden by clouds and oft bedimmed by haze, are not to be extinguished nor impaired. Two passions, both degenerate, for they both began in honour, gradually obtained rule over her and vexed her daily life, an unremitting avaricious thrift, and a strange thraldom of maternal love, that held her spirit in its own despite, bound, by vexation and regret and scorn, constrained forgiveness, and relenting vows and tears, in pride suppressed, in shame concealed, to a poor dissolute son, her only child. Her wedded days had opened with mishap, whence dire dependence. What could she perform to shake the burthen off? Ah! There was felt indignantly the weakness of her sex. She mused, resolved, adhered to her resolve. The hand grew slack in almsgiving, the heart closed by degrees to charity. Heaven's blessing not seeking from that source, she placed her trust in ceaseless pains, and strictest parsimony, which sternly hoarded all that could be spared, from each day's need, out of each day's least gain. Thus all was re-established, and a pile constructed that sufficed for every end, saved the contentment of the builder's mind, a mind by nature indisposed to aught so placid, so inactive as content, a mind intolerant of lasting peace, and cherishing the pang her heart deplored, dread life of conflict, which I oft compared to the agitation of a brook that runs down a rocky mountain buried now and lost in silent pools, now in strong eddies chained, but never to be charmed to gentleness. Its best attainment fits of such repose as timid eyes might shrink from fathoming. 
A sudden illness seized her in the strength of life's autumnal season. Shall I tell how on her bed of death the matron lay, to providence submissive, so she thought, but fretted, vexed, and wrought upon, almost to anger by the malady that griped her prostrate frame with unrelaxing power, as the fierce eagle fastens on the lamb? She prayed, she moaned, her husband's sister watched her dreary pillow, waited on her needs, and yet the very sound of that kind foot was anguish to her ears. And must she rule? This was the death-doomed woman heard to say in bitterness. And must she rule and reign sole mistress of this house when I am gone, tend what I tended, calling it her own? Enough! I fear too much. One vernal evening, while she was in prime of health and strength, I well remember, while I passed her door alone with loitering step, and upward eye turned towards the planet Jupiter that hung above the centre of the veil, a voice roused me, her voice. It said, That glorious star in its untroubled element will shine as now it shines when we are laid in earth and safe from all our sorrows. With a sigh she spake, yet, I believe, not unsustained by faith and glory that shall far transcend aught by these perishable heavens disclosed to sight or mind, nor less than care divine is divine mercy. She, who had rebelled, was into meekness softened and subdued, did after trials not in vain prolonged with resignation sink into the grave, and her uncharitable acts, I trust, and harsh unkindnesses are all forgiven, though in this vale remembered with deep awe. The vicar paused, and toward a seat advanced, a long stone seat fixed in the churchyard wall, part shaded by cool sycamore, and part offering a sunny resting-place to them who seek the house of worship, while the bells yet ring with all their voices, or before the last hath ceased its solitary knoll. Beneath the shade we all sate down, and there, his office uninvited, he resumed. As on a sunny bank a tender lamb lurks in safe shelter from the winds of March, screened by its parent, so that little mound lies guarded by its neighbor, the small heap speaks for itself, an infant there doth rest. The sheltering hillock is the mother's grave. If mild discourse and manners that conferred a natural dignity on humblest rank, if gladsome spirits and benignant looks that for a face not beautiful did more than beauty for the fairest face can do, and if religious tenderness of heart, grieving for sin, and penitential tears shed when the clouds had gathered and disdained the spotless ether of a maiden life, if these may make a hallowed spot of earth more holy to the sight of God or man, then, or that mould, a sanctity shall brood till the stars sicken at the day of doom. Ah! What a warning for a thoughtless man, could field or grove, could any spot of earth, show to his eye an image of the pangs which it hath witnessed, render back an echo of the sad steps by which it hath been trod. There, by her innocent baby's precious grave, and on the very turf that roofs her own, the mother oft was seen to stand, or kneel in the broad day, a weeping Magdalene. Now she is not. The swelling turf reports of the fresh shower, but of poor Ellen's tears is silent, nor is any vestige left of the path worn by mournful tread of her who, at her heart's light bidding, once had moved in virgin fearlessness, with step that seemed caught from the pressure of elastic turf upon the mountains gemmed with morning dew, in the prime hour of sweetest scents and airs. Serious and thoughtful was her mind, and yet, by reconcilement exquisite and rare, the form, port, motions of this cottage girl were such as might have quickened and inspired a Titian's hand, addressed to picture forth Oread or Dryad, glancing through the shade, what time the hunter's earliest horn is heard startling the golden hills. A widespread elm stands in our valley, named the Joyful Tree. From dateless usage, which our peasants hold of giving welcome to the first of May by dances round its trunk. And if the sky permit, like honours, dance and song are paid to the twelfth night, beneath the frosty stars or the clear moon. The queen of these gay sports, if not in beauty, yet in sprightly air, was hapless Ellen. 
No one touched the ground so deftly, and the nicest maiden's locks less gracefully were braided. But this praise, methinks, would better suit another place. She loved, and fondly deemed herself beloved. The road is dim, the current unperceived, the weakness painful and most pitiful, by which a virtuous woman in pure youth may be delivered to distress and shame. Such fate was hers. The last time Ellen danced among her equals, round the joyful tree, she bore a secret burthen, and full soon was left to tremble for a breaking vow, then to bewail a sternly broken vow, alone, within her widowed mother's house. It was the season of unfolding leaves, of days advancing toward their utmost length, and small birds singing happily to mates happy as they. With spirit-saddening power winds pipe through fading woods, but those blithe notes strike the deserted to the heart. I speak of what I know, and what we feel within. Beside the cottage in which Ellen dwelt stands a tall ash-tree, to whose topmost twig a thrush resorts, and annually chants at morn and evening from that naked perch, while all the undergrove is thick with leaves, a time-beguiling ditty, for delight of his fond partner silent in the nest. "'Ah, why,' said Ellen, sighing to herself, "'why do not words and kiss and solemn pledge, and nature that is kind in woman's breast, and reason that in man is wise and good, and fear of him who is a righteous judge, why do not these prevail for human life, to keep two hearts together, that began their springtime with one love, and that have need of mutual pity and forgiveness, sweet to grant or be received? While that poor bird, O oh, come and hear him, thou who hast to me been faithless, hear him, though a lowly creature, one of God's simple children, that yet know not the universal parent, how he sings as if he wished the firmament of heaven should listen, and give back to him the voice of his triumphant constancy and love, the proclamation that he makes, how far his darkness doth transcend our fickle light. Such was the tender passage, not by me repeated without loss of simple phrase, which I perused, even as the words had been committed by forsaken Ellen's hand to the blank margin of a valentine, be dropped with tears. Twill please you to be told that, studiously withdrawing from the eye of all companionship, the sufferer yet in lonely reading found a meek resource. How thankful for the warmth of summer days, when she could slip into the cottage barn, and find a secret oratory there! Or in the garden, under friendly veil of their long twilight, pour upon her book, by the last lingering help of the open sky, until dark night dismissed her to bed. Thus did a waking fancy sometimes lose the unconquerable pang of despised love. A kindlier passion opened on her soul when that poor child was born. Upon its face she gazed as on a pure and spotless gift of unexpected promise, where a grief or dread was all that had been thought of. Joy far livelier than bewildered traveller feels, amid a perilous waste that all night long hath harassed him toiling through fearful storm when he beholds the first pale speck serene of day-spring in the gloomy east, revealed, and greets it with thanksgiving. Till this hour, thus in her mother's hearing, Ellen spake, There was a stony region in my heart, but he, at whose command the parched rock was smitten, and poured forth a quenching stream, hath softened that obduracy, and made unlooked-for gladness in the desert place. To save the perishing, and henceforth I breathe the air with cheerful spirit, for thy sake, my infant, and for that good mother dear who bore me, and hath prayed for me in vain. Yet not in vain, it shall not be in vain. She spake, nor was the assurance unfulfilled. And if heart-rending thoughts would oft return, they stayed not long. The blameless infant grew, the child whom Ellen and her mother loved, they soon were proud of, tended it, and nursed, a soothing comforter, although forlorn, like a poor singing-bird from distant lands, or a choice shrub, which he, who passes by with vacant mind, not seldom may observe fair flowering in a thinly peopled house, whose window, somewhat sadly, it adorns. Through four months' space the infant drew its food from the maternal breast, then scruples rose, thoughts which the rich are free from, 
came and crossed the fond affection. She no more could bear by her offence to lay a twofold weight on a kind parent willing to forget their slender means. So, to that parent's care, trusting her child, she left their common home, and undertook with dutiful content a foster-mother's office. "'Tis perchance unknown to you that in these simple veils the natural feeling of equality is by domestic service unimpaired. Yet though such service be, with us, removed from sense of degradation, not the less the ungentle mind can easily find means to impose severe restraints and laws unjust, which hapless Ellen now was doomed to feel. For, blinded by an over-anxious dread of such excitement and divided thought as with her office would but ill accord, the pair, whose infant she was bound to nurse, forbade her all communion with her own. Week after week the mandate they enforced so near, yet not allowed upon that sight to fix her eyes. Alas, t'was hard to bear. But worse affliction must be borne, far worse, for tis heaven's will that, after a disease begun and ended within three days' space, her child should die. As Ellen now exclaimed, her own deserted child, once, only once, she saw it in that mortal malady and on the burial day could scarcely gain permission to attend its obsequies. She reached the house, last of the funeral train, and some one, as she entered, having chanced to urge unthinkingly their prompt departure, nay, she said with commanding look, a spirit of anger never seen in her before, nay, ye must wait my time, and down she sate and by the unclosed coffin kept her seat, weeping and looking, looking on and weeping, upon the last sweet slumber of her child, until at length her soul was satisfied. You see the infant's grave, and to this spot the mother, oft as she was sent abroad on whatsoever errand, urged her steps. Hither she came, here stood, and sometimes knelt in the broad day, a rueful Magdalene. So call her, for not only she bewailed a mother's loss, but mourned in bitterness her own transgression. Penitent sincere as ever raised to heaven a streaming eye. At length the parents of the foster-child, noting that, in despite of their commands, she still renewed and could not but renew those visitations, ceased to send her forth, or to the garden's narrow bounds confined. I failed not to remind them that they erred for holy nature might not thus be crossed, thus wronged in woman's breast. In vain I pleaded, but the green stalk of Ellen's life was snapped, and the flower drooped. As every eye could see, it hung its head in mortal languishment. Aided by this appearance I at length prevailed, and from those bonds released she went home to her mother's house. The youth was fled. The rash betrayer could not face the shame or sorrow which his senseless guilt had caused, and little would his presence or proof given of a relenting soul have now availed, for, like a shadow, he was passed away from Ellen's thoughts, had perished to her mind for all concerns of fear, or hope, or love, save only those which to their common shame and to his moral being appertained, hope from that quarter would, I know, have brought a heavenly comfort. There she recognized an unrelaxing bond, a mutual need, there and, as it seemed, there only. She had built, her fond maternal heart had built, a nest, in blindness all too near the river's edge. That work a summer flood with hasty swell had swept away, and now her spirit longed for its last flight to heaven's security. The bodily frame wasted from day to day. Meanwhile, relinquishing all other cares, her mind she strictly tutored to find peace and pleasure in endurance. Much she thought, and much she read, and brooded feelingly upon her own unworthiness. To me, as to a spiritual comforter and friend, her heart she opened, and no pains were spared to mitigate, as gently as I could, the sting of self-reproach, with healing words. Meek saint, through patience glorified on earth, in whom, as by her lonely hearth she sate, the ghastly face of cold decay put on a sun-like beauty, and appeared divine. May I not mention, 
that within those walls, in due observance of her pious wish, the congregation joined with me in prayer for her soul's good? Nor was that office vain. Much did she suffer. But, if any friend, beholding her condition, at the sight gave way to words of pity or complaint, she stilled them with a prompt reproof, and said, He who afflicts me knows what I can bear, and when I fail, and can endure no more, will mercifully take me to himself. So through the cloud of death her spirit passed into that pure and unknown world of love, where injury cannot come, and here is laid the mortal body by her infant's side. The vicar ceased, and downcast looks made known that each had listened with his inmost heart. For me, the emotion scarcely was less strong or less benign than that which I had felt when seated near my venerable friend, under those shady elms, from him I heard the story that retraced the slow decline of Margaret, sinking on the lonely heath with the neglected house to which she clung. I noted that the solitary's cheek confessed the power of nature. Pleased, though sad, more pleased than sad, the grey-haired wanderer sate. Thanks to his pure imaginative soul, capacious and serene, his blameless life, his knowledge, wisdom, love of truth, and love of humankind. He was it who first broke the pensive silence, saying, Blessed are they whose sorrow rather is to suffer wrong than to do wrong, albeit themselves have erred. This tale gives proof that heaven most gently deals with such in their affliction. Ellen's fate, her tender spirit, and her contrite heart call to my mind dark hints which I have heard of one who died within this vale by doom heavier as his offence was heavier far. Where, sir, I pray you, where are laid the bones of Wilfred Armthwaite? The vicar answered, In that green nook, close by the churchyard wall, beneath yon hawthorn, planted by myself in memory and for warning, and in sign of sweetness where dire anguish had been known, of reconcilement after deep offence, there doth he rest. No theme his fate supplies for the smooth glozings of the indulgent world nor need the windings of his devious course be here retraced. Enough that, by mishap and venial error, robbed of competence, and her obsequious shadow, peace of mind, he craved a substitute in troubled joy. Against his conscience, rose in arms, and braving divine displeasure, broke the marriage vow. That which he had been weak enough to do was misery in remembrance. He was stung, stung by his inward thoughts, and by the smiles of wife and children stung to agony, wretched at home, he gained no peace abroad. Ranged through the mountains, slept upon the earth, asked comfort of the open air, and found no quiet in the darkness of the night, no pleasure in the beauty of the day. His flock he slighted. His paternal fields became a clog to him, whose spirit wished to fly. But whither? and this gracious church that wears a look so full of peace and hope and love, benignant mother of the vale, how fair amid her brood of cottages! She was to him a sickness and reproach, much to the last remained unknown. But this is sure, that through remorse and grief he died. Though pitied among men, absolved by God, he could not find forgiveness in himself, nor could endure the weight of his own shame. Here rests a mother but from her I turn and from her grave. Behold, upon that ridge, that stretching boldly from the mountain-side carries into the centre of the vale its rocks and woods. The cottage where she dwelt, and where yet dwells her faithful partner, left, full eight years past, the solitary prop of many helpless children. I begin with words that might be prelude to a tale of sorrow and dejection but I feel no sadness when I think of what mine eyes see daily in that happy family. Bright garland form they for the pensive brow of their undrooping father's widowhood, those six fair daughters, budding yet, not one, not one of all the band, a full-blown flower, depressed and desolate of soul, as once that father was, and filled with anxious fear, now, by experience taught, he stands assured that God, who takes away, yet takes not half of what he seems to take, or gives it back. Not to our prayer, but far beyond our prayer, he gives it, the boon produce of a soil which our endeavours have refused to till, 
and hope hath never watered. The abode, whose grateful owner can attest these truths, even were the object nearer to our sight, would seem in no distinction to surpass the rudest habitations. Ye might think that it had sprung self-raised from earth, or grown out of the living rock, to be adorned by nature only. But if thither led, ye would discover, then, a studious work of many fancies, prompting many hands. Brought from the woods the honeysuckle twines round the porch, and seems in that trim place a plant no longer wild. The cultured rose there blossoms, strong in health, and will be soon roof-high. The wild pink crowns the garden wall, and with the flowers are intermingled stones sparry and bright, rough scatterings of the hills. These ornaments, that fade not with the year, a hardy girl continues to provide, who, mounting fearlessly the rocky heights, her father's prompt attendant, does for him all that a boy could do, but with delight more keen and prouder daring. Yet hath she, within the garden, like the rest, a bed for her own flowers and favorite herbs, a space, by sacred charter, holden for her use. These, and whatever else the garden bears of fruit or flower, permission asked or not, I freely gather, and my leisure draws a not unfrequent pastime from the hum of bees round their sacred, sheltered hives busy in that enclosure, while the rill that sparkling thrids the rocks attunes his voice to the pure course of human life which there flows on in solitude. But, when the gloom of night is falling round my steps, then most this dwelling charms me. I often stop short, who could refrain, and feed by stealth my sight with prospect of the company within, laid open through the blazing window. There I see the eldest daughter at her wheel spinning amain, as if to overtake the never-halting time, or, in her turn, teaching some novice of the sisterhood that skill in this or other household work, which from her father's honored hand herself, while she was yet a little one, had learned. Mild man! He is not gay, but they are gay, and the whole house seems filled with gaiety. Thrice happy, then, the mother may be deemed, the wife, from whose consolatory grave I turned, that in ye mind might witness where, and how, her spirit yet survives on earth. End of Book Sixth, Part Two Recording by Bill Borst Book Seventh, Part One of the excursion by william wordsworth the churchyard among the mountains continued this librivox recording is in the public domain while thus from theme to theme the historian passed the words he uttered and the scene that lay before our eyes awakened in my mind vivid remembrance of those long past hours when in the hollow of some shadowy vale what time the splendor of the setting sun lay beautiful on Snowdon's sovereign brow, on Cater Idris, or huge Penmanmoor, a wandering youth, I listened with delight to pastoral melody or warlike air, drawn from the chords of the ancient British harp by some accomplished master, while he sate amid the quiet of the green recess, and there did inexhaustibly dispense an interchange of soft or solemn tunes tender or blithe, now as the varying mood of his own spirit urged, now as a voice from youth or maiden, or some honored chief of his compatriot villagers, that hung around him drinking in the impassioned notes of the time-hallowed minstrelsy, required for their heart's ease or pleasure. Strains of power were they, to seize and occupy the sense. But to a higher mark than song can reach rose this pure eloquence and when the stream which overflowed the soul was passed away, a consciousness remained that it had left, deposited upon the silent shore of memory, images and precious thoughts, that shall not die, and cannot be destroyed. "'These grassy heaps lie amicably close,' said I, like surges heaving in the wind along the surface of a mountain pool. Whence comes it, then, that yonder we behold five graves, and only five, that rise together unsociably sequestered, and encroaching on the smooth playground of the village school. The vicar answered, 
no disdainful pride in them who rest beneath, nor any course of strange or tragic accident hath helped to place those hillocks in that lonely guise. Once more look forth and follow with your sight the length of road that from yon mountain's base through bare enclosures stretches, till its line is lost within a little tuft of trees, then, reappearing in a moment, quits the cultivated fields, and up the heathy waste mounts, as you see, in mazes serpentine, led towards an easy outlet of the vale. That little shady spot, that sylvan tuft, by which the road is hidden, also hides a cottage from our view, though I discern, ye scarcely can, amid its sheltering trees the smokeless chimney-top. All unembowered and naked stood that lowly parsonage, for such in truth it is, and appertains to a small chapel in the vale beyond, when hither came its last inhabitant. Rough and forbidding were the choicest roads by which our northern wilds could then be crossed, and into most of these secluded vales was no access for wane, heavy or light. So at his dwelling-place the priest arrived with store of household goods, in panniers slung on sturdy horses graced with jingling bells, and on the back of more ignoble beast, that, with like burthen of effects most prized or easiest carried, closed the motley train. Young was I then, a schoolboy of eight years, but still, methinks, I see them as they passed in order, drawing toward their wished-for home. Rocked by the motion of a trusty ass, two ruddy children hung, a well-poised freight, each in his basket nodding drowsily. Their bonnets, I remember, wreathed with flowers, which told it was the pleasant month of June, and, close behind the comely matron rode, a woman of soft speech and gracious smile, and with a lady's mien. From far they came, even from Northumbrian hills. Yet theirs had been a merry journey, rich in pastime, cheered by music, prank, and laughter-stirring jest, and freak put on, and arch-word dropped, to swell the cloud of fancy and uncouth surmise that gathered round the slowly moving train. Whence do they come, and with what errand charged? Belong they to the fortune-telling tribe who pitch their tents under the greenwood tree? Or strollers are they, furnished to enact fair Rosamond? and the children of the wood, and by that whiskered tabby's aid set forth the lucky venture of sage Whittington, when the next village hears the show announced by blast of trumpet. Plenteous was the growth of such conjectures, overheard, or seen on many a staring countenance portrayed of boor or burgher, as they marched along, and more than once their steadiness of face was put to proof, and exercise supplied to their inventive humour by stern looks and questions in authoritative tone, from some staid guardian of the public peace, checking the sober steed on which he rode, in his suspicious wisdom. Oftener still, by notice indirect or blunt demand from traveller halting in his own despite, a simple curiosity to ease, of which adventures that beguiled and cheered their grave migration the good pair would tell, with undiminished glee in hoary age. A priest he was by function but his course from his youth up, and high as manhood's noon, the hour of life to which he was then brought, had been irregular, I might say, wild. By books unstudied, by his pastoral care too little checked, an active ardent mind, a fancy pregnant with resource and scheme, to cheat the sadness of a rainy day, hands apt for all ingenious arts and games, a generous spirit, and a body strong to cope with stoutest champions of the bowl had earned for him sure welcome, and the rights of a prized visitant in the jolly hall of country squire, or at the statelier board of duke or earl from scenes of courtly pomp withdrawn, to while away the summer hours in condescension among rural guests. With these high comrades he had revelled long, frolicked industriously, a simple clerk by hopes of coming patronage beguiled, till the heart sickened. So, each loftier aim abandoning, and all his showy friends for a life's stay, slender it was, but sure, he turned to this secluded chapelry, that had been offered to his doubtful choice by an unthought-of patron. Bleak and bare they found the cottage, their allotted home, naked without and rude within, a spot with which the cure not long had been endowed, and far remote the chapel stood, remote, and from his dwelling unapproachable, 
save through a gap high in the hills, an opening shadeless and shelterless by driving showers frequented, and beset with howling winds. Yet cause was none, whate'er regret might hang on his own mind, to quarrel with the choice or the necessity that fixed him here apart from old temptations, and constrained to punctual labor in his sacred charge. See him a constant preacher to the poor, and visiting, though not with saintly zeal, yet, when need was, with no reluctant will, the sick in body or distressed in mind, and, by a salutary change, compelled to rise from timely sleep, and meet the day with no engagement, in his thoughts, more proud or splendid than his garden could afford, his fields or mountains by the heathcock ranged o'er the wild brooks. From which he now returned contented to partake the quiet meal of his own board, where sat his gentle mate and three fair children, plentifully fed, though simply, from their little household farm, nor wanted timely treat of fish or fowl by nature yielded to his practised hand, to help the small but certain comings in of that spare benefice yet not the less theirs was a hospitable board, and theirs a charitable door. So days and years passed on. The inside of that rugged house was trimmed and brightened by the matron's care, and gradually enriched with things of price which might be lacked for use or ornament. What, though no soft and costly sofa there insidiously stretched out its lazy length, and no vain mirror glittered upon the walls, yet were the windows of the low abode by shutters weather-fended, which at once repelled the storm and deadened its loud roar. There snow-white curtains hung in decent folds, tough moss, and long-enduring mountain-plants, that creep along the ground with sinuous trail, were nicely braided, and composed a work like Indian mats that with appropriate grace lay at the threshold and the inner doors, and a fair carpet, woven of homespun wool, but tinctured daintily with florid hues, for seemliness and warmth on festal days, covered the smooth blue slabs of mountain stone with which the parlour floor, in simplest guise of pastoral homesteads, had been long inlaid. Those pleasing works the housewife's skill produced. Meanwhile, the unsedentary master's hand was busier with his task, to rid, to plant, to rear for food, for shelter and delight, a thriving covert. And when wishes formed in youth and sanctioned by the riper mind restored me to my native valley, here to end my days, well pleased was I to see the once bare cottage on the mountain-side, screened from assault of every bitter blast, while the dark shadows of the summer leaves danced in the breeze, checkering its mossy roof. Time which had thus afforded willing help to beautify with nature's fairest growths this rustic tenement, had gently shed upon its master's frame a wintry grace, the comeliness of unenfeebled age. But how could I say, gently, for he still retained a flashing eye, a burning palm, a stirring foot, a head which beat at nights upon its pillow with a thousand schemes. Few likings had he dropped, few pleasures lost, generous and charitable, prompt to serve, and still his harsher passions kept their hold, anger and indignation. Still he loved the sound of titled names, and talked in glee of long-past banquetings with high-born friends. Then, from those lulling fits of vain delight uproused by recollected injury, railed at their false ways disdainfully, and oft in bitterness, and with a threatening eye of fire, incensed beneath its hoary brow. Those transports with staid looks of pure good-will, and with soft smile, his consort would reprove. She, far behind him in the race of years, yet keeping her first mildness, was advanced far nearer in the habit of her soul, to that still region whither all are bound. Him might we liken to the setting sun as seen not seldom on some gusty day, struggling and bold, and shining from the west with an inconstant and unmellowed light. She was a soft attendant cloud, that hung as if with wish to veil the restless orb, from which it did itself imbibe a ray of pleasing lustre. But no more of this. I bet her love to sprinkle on the sod that now divides the pair, or rather say that still unites them, praises like heaven's dew, without reserve descending upon both. 
Our very first in eminence of years this old man stood, the patriarch of the Vale, and to his unmolested mansion death had never come, through space of forty years, sparing both old and young in that abode. Suddenly, then they disappeared. Not twice had summer scorched the fields, not twice had fallen, on those high peaks, the first autumnal snow, before the greedy visiting was closed, and the long-privileged house left empty, swept as by a plague. Yet no rapacious plague had been among them. All was gentle death, one after one, with intervals of peace. A happy consummation, an accord sweet, perfect, to be wished for, save that here was something which to mortal sense might sound like harshness, that the old grey-headed sire, the oldest, he was taken last, survived when the meek partner of his age, his son, his daughter, and that late and high-prized gift, his little smiling grandchild, were no more. All gone, all vanished, he deprived and bare, how will he face the remnant of his life? What will become of him, we said, and mused in sad conjectures? Shall we meet him now haunting with rod and line the craggy brooks? Or shall we overhear him as we pass, striving to entertain the lonely hours with music? For he had not ceased to touch the harp or viol which himself had framed for their sweet purposes with perfect skill. What titles will he keep? Will he remain musician, gardener, builder, mechanist, a planter, and a rearer from the seed? A man of hope and forward-looking mind even to the last, such was he, unsubdued. But heaven was gracious, yet a little while, and this survivor with his cheerful throng of open projects, and his inward hoard of unsunned griefs, too many and too keen, was overcome by unexpected sleep, in one blessed moment. Like a shadow thrown softly and lightly from a passing cloud, death fell upon him, while reclined he lay for noontide solace on the summer grass, the warm lap of his mother earth. And so, their lenient term of separation past, that family whose graves you there behold, by yet a higher privilege, once more were gathered to each other. Calm of mind and silence waited on these closing words until the wanderer, whether moved by fear lest in those passages of life were some that might have touched the sick heart of his friend too nearly, or intent to reinforce his own firm spirit in degree depressed by tender sorrow for our mortal state, thus silence broke. Behold, a thoughtless man from vice and premature decay preserved by useful habits, to a fitter soil transplanted ere too late, the hermit, lodged amid the untrodden desert, tells his beads, with each repeating its allotted prayer, and thus divides and thus relieves the time, smooth task, with his compared, whose mind could string not scantily bright minutes on the thread of keen domestic anguish, and beguile a solitude, unchosen, unprofessed, till gentlest death released him. Far from us be the desire, too curiously to ask how much of this is but the blind result of cordial spirits and vital temperament, and what to higher powers is justly due. But you, sir, know that in a neighboring vale a priest abides before whose life such doubts fall to the ground, whose gifts of nature lie retired from notice, lost in attributes of reason, honorably effaced by debts which her poor treasure-house is content to owe and conquest over her dominion gained, to which her forwardness must needs submit. In this one man is shown a temperance, proof against all trials, industry severe and constant as the motion of the day, stern self-denial round him spread, with shade that might be deemed forbidding, did not there all generous feelings flourish and rejoice. Forbearance, charity indeed and thought, and resolution competent to take out of the bosom of simplicity all that her holy customs recommend, and the best ages of the world would prescribe. Preaching, administering, in every work of his sublime vocation, in the walks of worldly intercourse between man and man, and in his humble dwelling, he appears a laborer, with moral virtue girt, with spiritual graces like a glory crowned. Doubt can be none, the pastor said for whom this portraiture is sketched. The great, the good, the well-beloved, the fortunate, the wise, these titles emperors and chiefs have borne, honor assumed or given. And him, the wonderful, 
our simple shepherds, speaking from the heart, deservedly have styled. From his abode in a dependent chapelry that lies behind yon hill, a poor and rugged wild, which in his soul he lovingly embraced, and, having once espoused, would never quit, into its graveyard will ere long be borne that lowly great good man. A simple stone may cover him, and by its help, perchance, a century shall hear his name pronounced, with images attendant on the sound. Then shall the slowly gathering twilight close in utter night, and of his course remain no cognizable vestiges, no more than of this breath which shapes itself in words to speak of him, and instantly dissolves. The pastor, pressed by thoughts which round his theme still lingered, after a brief pause, resumed. Noise is there not enough in doleful war, but that the heaven-born poet must stand forth and lend the echoes of his sacred shell, to multiply and aggravate the din? Pangs are there not enough in hopeless love, and, in requited passion, all too much of turbulence, anxiety, and fear, but that the minstrel of the rural shade must tune his pipe, insidiously to nurse the perturbation in the suffering breast, and propagate its kind far as he may? Ah, who, and with such rapture as befits the hallowed theme, will rise and celebrate the good man's purposes and deeds, retrace his struggles, his discomfitures, deplore, his triumphs, hail, and glorify his end? That virtue, like the fumes and vapory clouds through fancy's heat rebounding in the brain, and like the soft infections of the heart, by charm of measured words may spread o'er the field, hamlet, and town and piety survive upon the lips of men in hall or bower, not for reproof, but high and warm delight, and grave encouragement, by song inspired? Vain thought! But wherefore murmur or repine? The memory of the just survives in heaven, and, without sorrow, will the ground receive that venerable clay. Meanwhile the best of what lies here confines us to degrees in excellence less difficult to reach, and milder worth nor need we travel far from those to whom our last regards were paid for such example. Almost at the root of that tall pine, the shadow of whose bare and slender stem, while here I sit at eve, oft stretches towards me, like a long straight path traced faintly in the greensward. There, beneath the plain blue stone, a gentle dalesman lies, from whom, in early childhood, was withdrawn the precious gift of hearing. He grew up from year to year in loneliness of soul and this deep mountain-valley was to him soundless, with all its streams. The bird of dawn did never rouse this cottager from sleep with startling summons. Not for his delight the vernal cuckoo shouted, not for him murmured the laboring bee. When stormy winds were working the broad bosom of the lake into a thousand thousand sparkling waves, rocking the trees or driving cloud on cloud along the sharp edge of yon lofty crags, the agitated scene before his eye was silent as a picture. Evermore were all things silent, wheresoe'er he moved. Yet, by the solace of his own pure thoughts upheld, he duteously pursued the round of rural labours. The steep mountain-side ascended, with his staff and faithful dog, the plough he guided, and the scythe he swayed, and the ripe corn before his sickle fell among the jocund reapers. For himself, all watchful and industrious as he was, he wrought on. Neither field nor flock he owned, no wish for wealth had place within his mind, nor husband's love, nor father's hope or care. Though born a younger brother, need was none that from the floor of his paternal home he should depart, to plant himself anew. And when, mature in manhood, he beheld his parents laid in earth, no loss ensued of rights to him, but he remained well pleased, by the pure bond of independent love an inmate of a second family, the fellow labourer and friend of him to whom the small inheritance had fallen. Nor deem that his mild presence was a weight that pressed upon his brother's house, for books were ready comrades whom he could not tire, of whose society the blameless man was never satiate. Their familiar voice, even to old age with unabated charm, beguiled his leisure hours, refreshed his thoughts beyond its natural elevation raised his introverted spirit, and bestowed upon his life an outward dignity which all acknowledged. The dark winter night, the stormy day, 
Each had its own resource. Song of the Muses, sage, historic tale, science severe, or word of holy writ announcing immortality and joy to the assembled spirits of just men made perfect, and from injury secure. Thus soothed at home, thus busy in the field, to no perverse suspicion he gave way, no languor, peevishness, nor vain complaint. And they who were about him did not fail in reverence, or in courtesy. They prized his gentle manners, and his peaceful smiles, the gleams of his slow-bearing countenance, were met with answering sympathy and love. At length, when sixty years and five were told, a slow disease insensibly consumed the powers of nature, and a few short steps of friends and kindred bore him from his home, yon cottage, shaded by the woody crags, to the profounder stillness of the grave. Nor was his funeral denied the grace of many tears, virtuous and thoughtful grief. Heart-sorrow rendered sweet by gratitude, and now that monumental stone preserves his name and unambitiously relates how long, and by what kindly outward aids, and in what pure contentedness of mind, the sad privation was by him endured. And yon tall pine-tree, whose composing sound was wasted on the good man's living ear, hath now its own peculiar sanctity, and at the touch of every wandering breeze murmurs not idly o'er his peaceful grave. Soul-cheering light, most bountiful of things, guide of our way, mysterious comforter, whose sacred influence spread through earth and heaven we all too thanklessly participate. Thy gifts were utterly withheld from him, whose place of rest is near yon ivied porch. Yet, of the wild brooks, ask if he complained. Ask of the channeled rivers if they held a safer, easier, more determined course. What terror doth it strike into the mind to think of one, blind and alone, advancing straight toward some precipice's airy brink? But timely warned, he would have stayed his steps, protected, say enlightened, by his ear and on the very edge of vacancy not more endangered than a man whose eye beholds the gulf beneath. No floweret blooms throughout the lofty range of these rough hills, nor in the woods, that could from him conceal its birthplace. None whose figure did not live upon his touch. The bowels of the earth enriched with knowledge his industrious mind. The ocean paid him tribute from the stores lodged in her bosom, and, by science led, his genius mounted to the plains of heaven. Methinks I see him, how his eyeballs rolled beneath his ample brow, in darkness paired, but each instinct with spirit, and the frame of the whole countenance alive with thought, fancy, and understanding, while the voice discoursed of natural or moral truth with eloquence, and such authentic power, that, in his presence, humbler knowledge stood abashed, and tender pity overawed. A noble, and, to unreflecting minds, a marvellous spectacle, the wanderer said, beings like these present. But proof abounds upon the earth that faculties which seem extinguished do not, therefore, cease to be. And to the mind among her powers of sense this transfer is permitted, not alone that the bereft their recompense may win, but for remoter purposes of love and charity, nor last nor least for this, that to the imagination may be given a type and shadow of an awful truth. How likewise, under sufferance divine, darkness is banished from the realms of death, by man's imperishable spirit, quelled. Unto the men who see not as we see, futurity was thought, in ancient times, to be laid open, and they prophesied. And know we not that from the blind have flowed the highest, holiest raptures of the lyre, and wisdom married to immortal verse? End of Book 7, Part 1 Recording by Bill Borst Book 7, Part 2 Of The Excursion by William Wordsworth The Churchyard Among the Mountains Continued This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Among the humbler worthies, at our feet, lying insensible to human praise, love, or regret, whose lineaments would next have been portrayed, I guess not. But it chanced that, near the quiet churchyard where we sate, a team of horses, with a ponderous freight pressing behind, adown a rugged slope, whose sharp descent confounded their array, came at that moment ringing noisily. 
Here, said the pastor, do we muse and mourn the waste of death. And lo, the giant oak stretched on his bier, that massy timber wane, nor fail to note the man who guides the team. He was a peasant of the lowest class. Gray locks profusely round his temples hung in clustering curls, like ivy, which the bite of winter cannot thin. The fresh air lodged within his cheek as light within a cloud, and he returned our greeting with a smile. When he had passed, the solitary spake. A man he seems of cheerful yesterdays and confident to-morrows, with a face not worldly-minded, for it bears too much of nature's impress, gaiety and health, freedom and hope, but keen withal and shrewd. His gestures note and hark, his tones of voice are all vivacious, as his mien and looks. The pastor answered, You have read him well. Year after year is added to his store with silent increase. Summers, winters, past, past or to come. Yea, boldly might I say, ten summers and ten winters of a space that lies beyond life's ordinary bounds, upon his sprightly vigor cannot fix the obligation of an anxious mind, a pride in having or a fear to lose, possessed like outskirts of some large domain, by any one more thought of than by him who holds the land in fee, its careless lord. Yet is the creature rational, endowed with foresight, hears too every Sabbath day the Christian promise with attentive ear, nor will, I trust, the majesty of heaven reject the incense offered up by him, though of the kind which beasts and birds present in grove or pasture, cheerfulness of soul from trepidation and repining free. How many scrupulous worshippers fall down upon their knees, and daily homage pay less worthy, less religious even, than his! This qualified respect, the old man's due, is paid without reluctance. But in truth, said the good vicar with a fond half-smile, I feel at times a motion of despite towards one, whose bold contrivances and skill, as you have seen, bear such conspicuous part in works of havoc taking from these veils, one after one, their proudest ornaments. Full oft his doings leave me to deplore tall ash-tree, sown by winds, by vapours nursed, in the dry crannies of the pendant rocks. Light birch, aloft upon the horizon's edge, a veil of glory for the ascending moon, and oak whose roots by noontide dew were damped, and on whose forehead inaccessible the raven lodged in safety. Many a ship launched into Morecambe Bay, to him hath owed her strong knee-timbers, and the mast that bears the loftiest of her pendants. He, from park or forest, fetched the enormous axle-tree that whirls, how slow itself, ten thousand spindles, and the vast engine laboring in the mine, content with meaner prowess, must have lacked the trunk and body of its marvellous strength, if his undaunted enterprise had failed among the mountain coves. Yon household fir, a guardian planted to fence off the blast, but towering high the roof above, as if its humble destination were forgot, that sycamore, which annually holds within its shade as in a stately tent on all sides open to the fanning breeze, a grave assemblage, seated while they shear the fleece-encumbered flock, the joyful elm, around whose trunk the maidens dance in May, and the Lord's oak would plead their several rights in vain if he were master of their fate. His sentence to the axe would doom them all. But, green in age and lusty as he is, and promising to keep his hold on earth less, as might seem, in rivalship with men than with the forest's more enduring growth, his own appointed hour will come at last. And, like the haughty spoilers of the world, this keen destroyer, in his turn, must fall. Now from the living pass we once again. From age, the priest continued, turn your thoughts. From age, that often unlamented drops, and mark that daisied hillock three spans long. Seven lusty suns sate daily round the board of Goldrill's side. And when the hope had ceased of other progeny, a daughter then was given, the crowning bounty of the whole. 
and so acknowledged with a tremulous joy felt to the centre of that heavenly calm with which by nature every mother's soul is stricken in the moment when her throes are ended, and her ears have heard the cry which tells her that a living child is born. And she lies conscious, in a blissful rest, that the dread storm is weathered by them both. The father, him at this unlooked-for gift a bolder transport seizes. From the side of his bright hearth, and from his open door, day after day the gladness is diffused to all that come, almost to all that pass. Invited, summoned, to partake the cheer spread on the never-empty board, and drink health and good wishes to his new-born girl, from cups replenished by his joyous hand. Those seven fair brothers variously were moved, each by the thoughts best suited to his years. But most of all, and with most thankful mind, the hoary grandsire felt himself enriched. A happiness that ebbed not, but remained to fill the total measure of his soul. From the low tenement, his own abode, whither, as to a little private cell, he had withdrawn from bustle, care, and noise, to spend the Sabbath of old age in peace, once every day he duteously repaired to rock the cradle of the slumbering babe. For in that female infant's name he heard the silent name of his departed wife. Heart-stirring music! Hourly heard that name. Full blessed he was, another Margaret Green, oft did he say, was come to Goldrill's side. O oh, pang unthought of, as the precious boon itself had been unlooked for! O oh, dire stroke of desolating anguish for them all! Just as the child could totter on the floor, and by some friendly finger's help upstayed, range round the garden walk, while she perchance was catching at some novelty of spring, ground-flower, or glossy insect from its cell drawn by the sunshine, at that hopeful season the winds of March, smiting insidiously, raised in the tender passage of the throat viewless obstruction, whence all unforewarned the household lost their pride and soul's delight. But time hath power to soften all regrets, and prayer and thought can bring to worst distress due resignation. Therefore, though some tears fail not to spring from either parent's eye oft as they hear of sorrow like their own, yet this departed little one, too long the innocent troubler of their quiet, sleeps in what may now be called a peaceful bed. On a bright day, so calm and bright, it seemed to us with our sad spirits, heavenly fair, these mountains echoed to an unknown sound. A volley, thrice repeated o'er the course let down into the hollow of that grave, while shelving sides are red with naked mould. Ye rains of April, duly wet this earth. Spare, burning sun of midsummer, these sods, that they may knit together and therewith our thoughts unite in kindred quietness. Nor so the valley shall forget her loss, dear youth, by young and old alike beloved, as to me as precious as my own. Green herbs may creep, I wish that they would softly creep, over thy last abode, and we may pass reminded less imperiously of thee. The ridge itself may sink into the breast of earth, the great abyss, and be no more. Yet shall not thy remembrance leave our hearts, thy image disappear. The mountain ash no eye can overlook, when mid a grove of yet unfaded trees she lifts her head, decked with autumnal berries, that outshine spring's richest blossoms. And ye may have marked, by a brookside or solitary tarn, how she her station doth adorn. The pool glows at her feet, and all the gloomy rocks are brightened round her. In his native vale such and so glorious did this youth appear, a sight that kindled pleasure in all hearts by his ingenuous beauty, by the gleam of his fair eyes, by his capacious brow, by all the graces with which nature's hand had lavishly arrayed him. As old bards tell in their idle songs of wandering gods, Pan or Apollo, veiled in human form, Yet, like the sweet-breathed violet of the shade discovered in their own despite to sense of mortals, if such fables without blame may find chance mention on this sacred ground, so, 
through a simple rustic garb's disguise, and through the impediment of rural cares, in him revealed a scholar's genius shown. And so, not wholly hidden from men's sight, in him the spirit of a hero walked our unpretending valley. How the quoit whizzed from the stripling's arm! If touched by him, the inglorious football mounted to the pitch of the lark's flight, or shaped a rainbow curve, aloft, in prospect of the shouting field. The indefatigable fox had learned to dread his perseverance in the chase. With admiration would he lift his eyes to the wide ruling eagle, and his head was loath to assault the majesty he loved. Else had the strongest fastnesses prove weak to guard the royal brood, the sailing gleed, the wheeling swallow, and the darting snipe. The sportive seagull dancing with the waves and cautious waterfowl from distant climes fixed at their seat, the centre of the mere, were subject to young Oswald's steady aim, and lived by his forbearance. From the coast of France a boastful tyrant hurled his threats. Our country marked the preparation vast of hostile forces, and she called, with voice that filled her plains, that reached her utmost shores, and in remotest vales was heard to arms. Then, for the first time, here you might have seen the shepherd's grey to martial scarlet changed, that flashed uncouthly through the woods and fields. Ten hardy striplings, all in bright attire, and graced with shining weapons, weakly marched. From this lone valley to a central spot where, in assemblage with the flower and choice of the surrounding district, they might learn the rudiments of war. Ten, hardy, strong, and valiant, but young Oswald, like a chief and yet a modest comrade, led them forth from their shy solitude, to face the world, with a gay confidence and seemly pride. Measuring the soil beneath their happy feet like youths released from labour, and yet bound to most laborious service, though to them a festival of unencumbered ease, the inner spirit keeping holiday like vernal ground to Sabbath sunshine left. Oft have I marked him at some leisure hour, stretched on the grass, or seated in the shade, among his fellows, while an ample map before their eyes lay carefully outspread. From the gallant teacher would discourse, now pointing this way and now that, here flows, thus would he say, the Rhine, that famous stream, eastward the Danube toward this inland sea, a mightier river winds from realm to realm, and like a serpent shows his glittering back bespotted, with innumerable isles. Here reigns the Russian, there the Turk, observe his capital city. Thence, along a tract of livelier interest to his hopes and fears, his finger moved, distinguishing the spots where widespread conflict then most fiercely raged, nor left unstigmatized those fatal fields on which the sons of mighty Germany were taught a base submission. Here behold a nobler race, the Switzers, and their land, vales deeper far than these of ours, huge woods, and mountains white with everlasting snow. And surely he that spake with kindling brow was a true patriot, hopeful as the best of that young peasantry who, in our days, have fought and perished for Helvetia's rights. Ah, not in vain! Or those who, in old time, for work of happier issue, to the side of Tell came trooping from a thousand huts, when he had risen alone. No braver youth descended from Judean heights to march with righteous Joshua, nor appeared in arms when grove was felled, and altar was cast down, and Gideon blew the trumpet, soul inflamed, and strong in hatred of idolatry. The pastor, even as if by these last words raised from his seat within the chosen shade, moved toward the grave. Instinctively his steps we followed, and my voice with joy exclaimed, Power to the oppressors of the world is given, a might of which they dream not. O oh, the curse, to be the awakener of divinest thoughts, father and founder of exalted deeds, and, to whole nations bound in servile straits, the liberal donor of capacities more than heroic. This to be, 
nor yet have sense of one connatural wish, nor yet deserve the least return of human thanks, winning no recompense but deadly hate, with pity mixed, astonishment with scorn. When this involuntary strain had ceased, the pastor said, So providence is served. The forked weapon of the skies can send illumination into deep, dark holds, which the mild sunbeam hath not power to pierce. Ye thrones that have defied remorse, and cast pity away, soon shall ye quake with fear. For, not unconscious of the mighty debt which to outrageous wrong the sufferer owes, Europe, through all her habitable bounds, is thirsting for their overthrow, who yet survive, as pagan temples stood of yore, by horror of their impious rites preserved, are still permitted to extend their pride, like cedars on the top of Lebanon darkening the sun. But less impatient thoughts, and love all hoping and expecting all, this hallowed grave demands, where rests in peace a humble champion of the better cause, a peasant youth, so call him, for he asked no higher name, in whom our country showed, as in a favourite son, most beautiful, in spite of vice and misery and disease, spread with the spreading of her wealthy arts, England, the ancient and the free, appeared in him to stand before my swimming eyes, unconquerably virtuous and secure. No more of this, lest I offend his dust. Short was his life, and a brief tale remains. One day, a summer's day of annual pomp and solemn chase, from morn to sultry noon, his steps had followed, fleetest of the fleet, the red deer driven along its native heights, with cry of hound and horn. And from that toil returned with sinews weakened and relaxed, this generous youth, too negligent of self, plunged, mid a gay and busy throng convened to wash the fleeces of his father's flock, into the chilling flood. Convulsions dire seized him, that self-same night and through the space of twelve ensuing days his frame was wrenched, till nature rested from her work in death. To him, thus snatched away, his comrades paid a soldier's honours. At his funeral hour bright was the sun, the sky a cloudless blue. A golden lustre slept upon the hills, and if by chance a stranger wandering there from some commanding eminence had looked down on this spot, well pleased would he have seen a glittering spectacle. But every face was pallid. Seldom hath that eye been moist with tears, that wept not then. Nor were the few, who from their dwellings came not forth to join in this sad service, less disturbed than we. They started at the tributary peal of instantaneous thunder, which announced, through the still air, the closing of the grave. And distant mountains echoed with a sound of lamentation, never heard before. The pastor ceased. My venerable friend victoriously upraised his clear bright eye, and when that eulogy was ended, stood and rapt, as if his inward sense perceived the prolongation of some still response, sent by the ancient soul of this wide land, the spirit of its mountains and its seas, its cities, temples, fields, its awful power, its rights and virtues, by that deity descending and supporting his pure heart with patriotic confidence and joy. And at the last of those memorial words, the pining solitary turned aside. Whether through manly instinct to conceal tender emotions spreading from the heart to his worn cheek, or with uneasy shame for those cold humours of habitual spleen that fondly seeking in dispraise of man solace and self-excuse, had sometimes urged to self-abuse a not ineloquent tongue. Right toward the sacred edifice his steps had been directed, and we saw him now intent upon a monumental stone, whose uncouth form was grafted on the wall, or rather seemed to have grown into the side of the rude pile, as oft-times trunks of trees, where nature works in wild and craggy spots, are seen incorporate with the living rock, to endure for aye. The vicar, taking note of his employment, with a courteous smile, exclaimed, The sagest antiquarian's eye that task would foil. Then, 
letting fall his voice while he advanced, thus spake. Tradition tells that, in Eliza's golden days, a knight came on a war-horse sumptuously attired, and fixed his home on this sequestered vale. Tis left untold if here he first drew breath, or as a stranger reached this deep recess, unknowing and unknown. A pleasing thought I sometimes entertain, that haply bound to Scotland's court in service of his queen, or sent on mission to some northern chief of England's realm, this veil he might have seen with transient observation, and thence caught an image fair which brightening in his soul when joy of war and pride of chivalry languished beneath accumulated years, had power to draw him from the world, resolved to make that paradise his chosen home to which his peaceful fancy oft had turned. Vague thoughts are these. But if belief may rest upon unwritten story fondly traced from sire to son, in this obscure retreat the knight arrived with spear and shield, and borne upon a charger gorgeously bedecked with broidered housings, and the lofty steed, his sole companion, and his faithful friend, whom he, in gratitude, let loose to range in fertile pastures, was beheld with eyes of admiration and delightful awe, by those untravelled dalesmen with less pride, yet free from touch of envious discontent, they saw a mansion at his bidding rise, like a bright star, amid the lowly band of their rude homesteads. Here the warrior dwelt. And in that mansion children of his own or kindred gathered round him. As a tree that falls and disappears the house is gone, and, through improvidence or want of love for ancient worth and honourable things, the spear and shield are vanished which the knight hung in his rustic hall. One ivied arch myself have seen, a gateway, last remains of that foundation in domestic care raised by his hands. And now no trace is left of the mild-hearted champion save this stone, faithless memorial, and his family name borne by yon clustering cottages that sprang from out the ruins of his stately lodge. These, and the name and title at full length, Sir Alfred Irthing, with appropriate words accompanied, still extant, in a wreath or posy, girding round the several fronts of three clear-sounding and harmonious bells, that in the steeple hang, his pious gift. So fails, so languishes, grows dim, and dies, the grey-haired wanderer pensively exclaimed. All that this world is proud of! From their spheres the stars of human glory are cast down. Perish the roses and the flowers of kings, princes, and emperors, and the crowns and palms of all the mighty, withered and consumed. Nor is power given to lowliest innocence long to protect her own. The man himself departs, and soon is spent the line of those who, in the bodily image, in the mind, in heart or soul, in station or pursuit, did most resemble him. Degrees and ranks, fraternities and orders, heaping high new wealth upon the burthen of the old, and placing trust in privilege confirmed and reconfirmed, are scoffed at with a smile of greedy foretaste, from the secret stand of desolation, aimed, to slow decline these yield, and these to sudden overthrow. Their virtue, service, happiness, and state expire, and nature's pleasant robe of green humanity's appointed shroud, and wraps their monuments and their memory. The vast frame of social nature changes evermore her organs and her members, with decay restless, and restless generation, powers and functions dying and produced at need. And by this law the mighty whole subsists, with an ascent and progress in the main. Yet, oh, how disproportioned to the hopes and expectations of self-flattering minds. The courteous knight, whose bones are here interred, lived in an age conspicuous as our own for strife and ferment in the minds of men. Whence alteration in the forms of things, various and vast, a memorable age, which did to him assign a pensive lot, to linger mid the last of those bright clouds that on the steady breeze of honour sailed in long procession calm and beautiful. He who had seen his own bright order fade, 
and its devotion gradually decline, while war, relinquishing the lance and shield, her temper changed, and bowed to other laws, had also witnessed, in his morn of life, that violent commotion which o'erthrew in town and city and sequestered glen, altar and cross, and church of solemn roof, and old religious house, pile after pile, and shook their tenants out into the fields, like wild beasts without home. Their hour was come. But why no softening thought of gratitude, no just remembrance, scruple, or wise doubt? Benevolence is mild, nor borrows help, save at worst need, from bold impetuous force, fitliest allied to anger and revenge. But humankind rejoices in the might of mutability, and airy hopes, dancing around her, hinder and disturb those meditations of the soul that feed the retrospective virtues. Festive songs break from the maddened nations at the sight of sudden overthrow, and cold neglect is the sure consequence of slow decay. Even, said the wanderer, as that courteous knight, bound by his vow to labour for redress of all who suffer wrong, and to enact by sword and lance the law of gentleness, if I may venture of myself to speak, trusting that not incongruously I blend low things with lofty, I too shall be doomed to outlive the kindly use and fair esteem of the poor calling which my youth embraced with no unworthy prospect. But enough! Thoughts crowd upon me, and twere seemlier now to stop, and yield our gracious teacher thanks for the pathetic records which his voice hath here delivered, words of heartfelt truth, tending to patience when affliction strikes, to hope and love, to confident repose in God and reverence for the dust of man. End of Book Seventh, Part Two Recording by Bill Borst Book Eighth of The Excursion by William Wordsworth The Parsonage This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The pensive skeptic of the lonely vale to those acknowledgments subscribed his own with a sedate compliance which the priest failed not to notice, inly pleased, and said, If ye by whom invited I began these narratives of calm and humble life, be satisfied, tis well, the end is gained. And, in return for sympathy bestowed and patient listening, thanks accept from me. Life, death, eternity, momentous themes are they and might demand a seraph's tongue, were they not equal to their own support. And therefore no incompetence of mine could do them wrong. The universal forms of human nature in a spot like this present themselves at once to all men's view. Ye wished for act and circumstance that make the individual known and understood, and such as my best judgment could select from what the place afforded have been given though apprehensions crossed me that my zeal to his might be well likened, who unlocks a cabinet stored with gems and pictures, draws his treasures forth, soliciting regard to this and this as worthier than the last, till the spectator who a while was pleased more than the exhibitor himself becomes weary and faint, and longs to be released. But let us hence, my dwelling is in sight, and there— at this the solitary shrunk with backward will, but, wanting not address that inward motion to disguise, he said to his compatriot, smiling as he spake, The peaceable remains of this good knight would be disturbed, I fear, with wrathful scorn if consciousness could reach him where he lies, that one, albeit of these degenerate times deploring changes past or dreading change foreseen, had dared to couple, even in thought, the fine vocation of the sword and lance, with the gross aims and body-bending toil of a poor brotherhood who walked the earth pitied, and, where they are not known, despised. Yet, by the good knight's leave, the two estates are graced with some resemblance. Errant those, exiles and wanderers, and the like are these, who, with their burthen, traverse hill and dale, carrying relief for nature's simple wants. 
what though no higher recompense be sought than honest maintenance by irksome toil full oft procured yet may they claim respect among the intelligent for what this course enables them to be and to perform their tardy steps give leisure to observe while solitude permits the mind to feel instructs and prompts her to supply defects by the division of her inward self for grateful converse and to these poor men nature i but repeat your favorite boast is bountiful go wheresoe'er they may kind nature's various wealth is all their own versed in the characters of men and bound by ties of daily interest to maintain conciliatory manners and smooth speech such have been and still are in their degree examples efficacious to refine rude intercourse apt agents to expel by importation of unlooked-for arts barbarian torpor and blind prejudice raising through just gradation savage life to rustic and the rustic to urbane within their moving magazines is lodged power that comes forth to quicken and exalt affections seated in the mother's breast and in the lover's fancy and to feed the sober sympathies of long-tried friends by these itinerants as experienced men counsel is given contention they appease with gentle language in remotest wilds tears wipe away and pleasant tidings bring could the proud quest of chivalry do more happy rejoined the wanderer they who gain a panegyric from your generous tongue but if to these wayfarers once pertained aught of romantic interest it is gone their purer service in this realm at least is past for ever an inventive age has wrought if not with speed of magic yet to most strange issues i have lived to mark a new and unforeseen creation rise from out the labors of a peaceful land wielding her potent enginery to frame and to produce with appetite as keen as that of war which rests not night or day industrious to destroy with fruitless pains might one like me now visit many a tract which in his youth he trod and trod again a lone pedestrian with a scanty freight wished for or welcome wheresoe'er he came among the tenantry of thorpe and vill or straggling burg of ancient charter proud and dignified by battlements and towers of some stern castle mouldering on the brow of a green hill or bank of rugged stream the footpath faintly marked the horse-track wild and formidable length of plashy lane prized avenues ere others had been shaped or easier links connecting place with place have vanished swallowed up by stately roads easy and bold that penetrate the gloom of britain's farthest glens the earth has lent her waters air her breezes and the sail of traffic glides with ceaseless intercourse glistening along the low and woody dale or in its progress on the lofty side of some bare hill with wonder kenned from far meanwhile at social industry's command how quick how vast an increase from the germ of some poor hamlet rapidly produced here a huge town continuous and compact hiding the face of earth for leagues and there where not a habitation stood before abodes of men irregularly massed like trees and forests spread through spacious tracts o'er which the smoke of unremitting fires hangs permanent and plentiful as wreaths of vapour glittering in the morning sun and wheresoe'er the traveller turns his steps he sees the barren wilderness erased or disappearing triumph that proclaims how much the mild directress of the plough owes to alliance with these new-born arts hence is the wide sea peopled hence the shores of britain are resorted to by ships freighted from every climate of the world with the world's choicest produce hence that sum of keels that rest within her crowded ports or ride at anchor in her sounds and bays that animating spectacle of sails that through her inland regions to and fro pass with the respirations of the tide perpetual multitudinous finally hence a dread arm of floating power a voice of thunder daunting those who would approach with hostile purposes the blessed isle 
truth's consecrated residence, the seat impregnable of liberty and peace. And yet, O oh happy pastor of a flock faithfully watched, and by that loving care and heaven's good providence preserved from taint, with you I grieve, when on the darker side of this great change I look, and there behold such outrage done to nature as compels the indignant power to justify herself, yea, to avenge her violated rights for England's bane. When soothing darkness spreads o'er hill and vale, the wanderer thus expressed his recollections, and the punctual stars, while all things else are gathering to their homes, advance, and in the firmament of heaven glitter, but undisturbing, undisturbed, as if their silent company were charged with peaceful admonitions for the heart of all beholding man, earth's thoughtful lord. Then, in full many a region, once like this the assured domain of calm simplicity and pensive quiet, an unnatural light prepared for never-resting labor's eyes breaks from a many-windowed fabric huge, and at the appointed hour a bell is heard of harsher import than the curfew knoll that spake the Norman conqueror's stern behest, a local summons to unceasing toil. Disgorged are now the ministers of day, and as they issue from the illumined pile, a fresh band meets them at the crowded door, and in the courts, and where the rumbling stream that turns the multitude of dizzy wheels glares like a troubled spirit in its bed among the rocks below. Men, maidens, youths, mother and little children, boys and girls, enter, and each the wanted task resumes within this temple, where is offered up to gain the master idol of the realm, perpetual sacrifice. Even thus of old our ancestors, within the still domain of vast cathedral or conventual church, their vigils kept, where tapers day and night on the dim altar burned continually, in token that the house was evermore watching to God. Religious men were they, nor would their reason, tutored to or spire above this transitory world, allow that there should pass a moment of the year when in their land the Almighty's service ceased. Triumph who will in these profaner rites which we, a generation self-extolled, as zealously perform. I cannot share his proud complacency. Yet do I exult casting reserve away, exult to see an intellectual mastery exercised o'er the blind elements, a purpose given, a perseverance fed, almost a soul imparted to brute matter. I rejoice, measuring the force of those gigantic powers that, by the thinking mind, have been compelled to serve the will of feeble-bodied man. For with the sense of admiration blends the animating hope that time may come when strengthened yet not dazzled by the might of this dominion over nature gained, men of all lands shall exercise the same in due proportion to their country's need. Learning, though late, that all true glory rests, all praise, all safety, and all happiness, upon the moral law. Egyptian Thebes, Tyre, by the margin of the sounding waves, Palmyra, central in the desert, fell, and the arts died by which they had been raised. Call Archimedes from his buried tomb upon the grave of vanished Syracuse, and feelingly the sage shall make report how insecure, how baseless in itself, is the philosophy whose sway depends on mere material instruments, how weak those arts, and high inventions, if unpropped by virtue. He, sighing with pensive grief, amid his calm abstractions, would admit that not the slender privilege is theirs to save themselves from blank forgetfulness. When, from the wanderer's lips, these words had fallen, I said, And did in truth those vaunted arts possess such privilege? How could we escape sadness and keen regret? we who revere, and who would preserve as things above all price, the old domestic morals of the land, her simple manners, and the stable worth that dignified and cheered a low estate. Oh, where is now the character of peace, sobriety, and order, and chaste love, and honest dealing, and untainted speech, and pure good will, and hospitable cheer, that made the very thought of country life a thought of refuge for a mind detained reluctantly amid the bustling crowd? Where now the beauty of the Sabbath kept with conscientious reverence, as a day by the Almighty Lawgiver pronounced holy and blessed? 
and where the winning grace of all the lighter ornaments attached to time and season as the year rolled round? Fled, was the wanderer's passionate response, fled utterly, or only to be traced in a few fortunate retreats like this, which I behold with trembling when I think what lamentable change a year, a month, may bring, that brook converting as it runs into an instrument of deadly bane for those who yet, untempted to forsake the simple occupations of their sires, drink the pure water of its innocent stream with lip almost as pure domestic bliss, or call it comfort, by a humbler name. How art thou blighted for the poor man's heart! Lo, in such neighbourhood, from morn to eve, the habitation's empty, or perchance the mother left alone, no helping hand, to rock the cradle of her peevish babe. No daughters round her, busy at the wheel, or in dispatch of each day's little growth of household occupation. No nice arts of needlework, no bustle at the fire, where once the dinner was prepared with pride, nothing to speed the day or cheer the mind, nothing to praise, to teach, or to command. The father, if perchance he still retain his old employments, goes to field or wood, no longer led or followed by the sons. Idlers perchance they were, but in his sight, breathing fresh air and treading the green earth till their short holiday of childhood ceased, ne'er to return. That birthright now is lost. Economists will tell you that the State thrives by the forfeiture, unfeeling thought and faults as monstrous. Can the mother thrive by the destruction of her innocent sons in whom a premature necessity blocks out the forms of nature, preconsumes the reason, famishes the heart, shuts up the infant being in itself, and makes its very spring a season of decay? The lot is wretched, the condition sad, whether a pining discontent survive and thirst for change, or habit hath subdued the soul depressed, dejected, even to love of her close tasks and long captivity. O oh, banish far such wisdom as condemns a native Briton to these inward chains! fixed in his soul, so early and so deep, without his own consent or knowledge fixed. He is a slave to whom release comes not, and cannot come. The boy, where'er he turns, is still a prisoner. When the wind is up among the clouds and roars through the ancient woods, or when the sun is shining in the east, quiet and calm, behold him, in the school of his attainments? No, but with the air fanning his temples under heaven's blue arch his raiment, whitened o'er with cotton flakes or locks of wool, announces whence he comes, creeping his gait and cowering, his lip pale, his respiration quick and audible. And scarcely could you fancy that a gleam could break from out those languid eyes or a blush mantle upon his cheek. Is this the form? Is that the countenance and such the port of no mean being? One who should be clothed with dignity befitting his proud hope? who, in his very childhood, should appear sublime from present purity and joy. The limbs increase, but liberty of mind is gone for ever, and this organic frame, so joyful in its motions, is become dull to the joy of her own motions dead. And even the touch, so exquisitely poured through the whole body with a languid will, performs its functions, rarely competent to impress a vivid feeling on the mind of what there is delightful in the breeze the gentle visitations of the sun, or lapse of liquid element, by hand, or foot, or lip, in summer's warmth, perceived. Can hope look forward to a manhood raised on such foundations? Hope is none for him, the pale recluse indignantly exclaimed, and tens of thousands suffer wrong as deep. Yet be it asked, in justice to our age, if there were not, before those arts appeared, these structures rose, commingling old and young, and unripe sex with sex, for mutual taint. If there were not, then, in our far-famed isle, multitudes, who from infancy had breathed air unimprisoned, and had lived at large, yet walked beneath the sun in human shape, as abject as degraded? At this day, who shall enumerate the crazy huts and tottering hovels whence do issue forth a ragged offspring? with their upright hair crowned like the image of fantastic fear, 
or wearing, shall we say, in that white growth an ill-adjusted turban for defence or fierceness, wreathed around their sunburnt brows by savage nature? Shriveled are their lips, naked and coloured like the soil, the feet on which they stand. As if thereby they drew some nourishment, as trees do by their roots, from earth, the common mother of us all. Figure and mien, complexion and attire, are leagued to strike dismay, but outstretched hand and whining voice denote them supplicants for the least boon that pity can bestow. Such on the breast of darksome heaths are found and with their parents occupy the skirts of furs-clad commons. Such are born and reared at the mine's mouth under impending rocks, or dwell in chambers of some natural cave, or where their ancestors erected huts for the convenience of unlawful gain in forest purlieus, and the like are bred, all England through, where nooks and slips of ground purloined, in times less jealous than our own, from the green margin of the public way, a residence afford them mid the bloom and gaiety of cultivated fields. Such we will hope the lowest in the scale do I remember oft times to have seen mid Buxton's dreary heights. In earnest watch, till the swift vehicle approach they stand, then following closely with the cloud of dust, and uncouth feet exhibit, and are gone, heels overhead, like tumblers on a stage. Up from the ground they snatch the copper coin, and, on the freight of merry passengers, fixing a steady eye, maintain their speed, and spin, and pant, and overhead again wild perseverance, until their breath is lost, or bounty tires, and every face that smiled encouragement hath ceased to look that way. But, like the vagrants of the gypsy tribe, these, bred to little pleasure in themselves, are profitless to others. Turn we then to Britons born and bred within the pale of civil polity, and early trained to earn by wholesome labour in the field the bread they eat. A sample should I give of what this stock hath long produced, to enrich the tender age of life, ye would exclaim, is this the whistling ploughboy whose shrill notes impart now gladness to the morning air? Forgive me if I venture to suspect that many, sweet to hear of in soft verse, are of no finer frame. Stiff are his joints, beneath a cumbrous frock, that to the knees invests the thriving churl, his legs appear, fellows to those that lustily upheld the wooden stools for everlasting use, whereon our fathers sate. And mark his brow, under whose shaggy canopy are set two eyes, not dim, but of a healthy stare, wide, sluggish, blank, and ignorant, and strange proclaiming boldly that they never drew a look or motion of intelligence from infant conning of the Christ-cross row, or puzzling through a primer, line by line, till perfect mastery crown the pains at last. What kindly warmth from touch of fostering hand, what penetrating power of sun or breeze, shall e'er dissolve the crust wherein his soul sleeps, like a caterpillar sheathed in ice? This torpor is no pitiable work of modern ingenuity. No town nor crowded city can be taxed with aught of Scottish vice or desperate breach of law, to which, and who can tell where or how soon, he may be roused. This boy the fields produce, his spade and hoe, mattock and glittering scythe, the carter's whip that on his shoulder rests in air high towering with a boorish pomp, the sceptre of his sway, his country's name, her equal rights, her churches and her schools, what have they done for him? And let me ask, for tens of thousands, uninformed as he. In brief, what liberty of mind is here? This ardent sally pleased the mild good man, to whom the appeal couched in its closing words was pointedly addressed, and to the thoughts that, in assent or opposition, rose within his mind, he seemed prepared to give prompt utterance. But the vicar interposed, with invitation urgently renewed. We followed, taking as he led, a path along a hedge of hollies dark and tall, whose flexile boughs, low bending with a weight of leafy spray, concealed the stems and roots that gave them nourishment. When frosty winds howl from the north, what kindly warmth, methought, is here! How grateful this impervious screen! Not shaped by simple wearing of the foot on rural business passing to and fro was the commodious walk, 
a careful hand had marked the line and strewn its surface o'er with pure cerulean gravel from the heights fetched by a neighboring brook across the vale the stately fence accompanied our steps and thus the pathway by perennial green guarded and graced seemed fashioned to unite as by a beautiful yet solemn chain the pastor's mansion with the house of prayer like image of solemnity conjoined with feminine allurement soft and fair the mansion's self displayed a reverend pile with bold projections and recesses deep shadowy yet gay and lightsome as it stood fronting the noontide sun we paused to admire the pillared porch elaborately embossed the low wide windows with their millions old the cornice richly fretted of gray stone and that smooth slope from which the dwelling rose by beds and banks arcadian of gay flowers and flowering shrubs protected and adorned profusion bright and every flower assuming a more than natural vividness of hue from unaffected contrast with the gloom of sober cypress and the darker foil of yew in which survived some traces here not unbecoming of grotesque device and uncouth fancy from behind the roof rose the slim ash and massy sycamore blending their diverse foliage with the green of ivy flourishing and thick that clasped the huge round chimneys harbor of delight for wren and redbreast where they sit and sing their slender ditties when the trees are bare nor must i leave untouched the picture else were incomplete a relic of old times happily spared a little gothic niche of nicest workmanship that once had held the sculptured image of some patron saint or of the blessed virgin looking down on all who entered those religious doors but lo where from the rocky garden mount crowned by its antique summer-house descends light as the silver fawn a radiant girl for she hath recognized her honored friend the wanderer ever welcome a prompt kiss the gladsome child bestows at his request and up the flowery lawn as we advance hangs on the old man with a happy look and with a pretty restless hand of love we enter by the lady of the place cordially greeted graceful was her port a lofty stature undepressed by time whose visitation had not wholly spared the finer lineaments of form and face to that complexion brought which prudence trusts in and wisdom loves but when a stately ship sails in smooth weather by the placid coast on homeward voyage what if wind and wave and hardship undergone in various climes have caused her to abate the virgin pride and that full trim of inexperienced hope with which she left her haven not for this should the sun strike her and the impartial breeze play on her streamers fails she to assume brightness and touching beauty of her own that charm all eyes so bright so fair appeared this goodly matron shining in the beams of unexpected pleasure soon the board was spread and we partook a plain repast here resting in cool shelter we beguiled the midday hours with desultory talk from trivial themes to general argument passing as accident or fancy led or courtesy prescribed while question rose and answer flowed the fetters of reserve dropping from every mind the solitary resumed the manners of his happier days and in the various conversation bore a willing nay at times a forward part yet with the grace of one who in the world had learned the art of pleasing and had now occasion given him to display his skill upon the steadfast vantage ground of truth he gazed with admiration unsuppressed upon the landscape of the sun-bright vale seen from the shady room in which we sate in softened perspective and more than once praised the consummate harmony serene of gravity and elegance diffused around the mansion and its whole domain not doubtless without help of female taste and female care a blessed lot is yours the words escaped his lip with a tender sigh breathed over them but suddenly the door flew open and a pair of lusty boys appeared confusion checking their delight not brothers they in feature or attire but fond companions so i guessed in field and by the river's margin whence they come keen anglers with unusual spoil elated one bears a willow pannier on his back 
the boy of plainer garb, whose blush survives more deeply tinged, twin might the other be to that fair girl who from the garden mount bounded. Triumphant entry this for him. Between his hands he holds a smooth blue stone, on whose capacious surface see outspread large store of gleaming crimson-spotted trouts, ranged side by side, and lessening by degrees up to the dwarf that tops the pinnacle. Upon the board he lays the sky-blue stone with its rich freight. Their number he proclaims, tells from what pool the noblest had been dragged, and where the very monarch of the brook after long struggle had escaped at last, stealing alternately at them and us, as doth his comrades, too, a look of pride, and verily the silent creatures made a splendid sight together thus exposed, dead, but not sullied or deformed by death, that seemed to pity what he could not spare. But, oh, the animation in the mien of those two boys, yea, in the very words with which the young narrator was inspired, when, as our questions led, he told at large of that day's prowess, him might I compare his looks, tones, gestures, eager eloquence, to a bold brook that splits for better speed, and at the selfsame moment works its way through many channels, ever and anon parted and reunited. His compare to the still lake, whose stillness is to sight as beautiful as grateful to the mind. But to what object shall the lovely girl be likened? She whose countenance and air unite the graceful qualities of both, even as she shares the pride and joy of both. My gray-haired friend was moved. His vivid eye glistened with tenderness. His mind, I knew, was full, and had, I doubted not, returned upon this impulse to the theme erewhile abruptly broken off. The ruddy boys withdrew on summons to their well-earned meal, and he, to whom all tongues resigned their rights with willingness to whom the general ear listened with readier patience than to strain of music, lute, or harp, a long delight that ceased not when his voice had ceased, as one who from truth's central point serenely views the compass of his argument, began mildly, and with a clear, and steady tone. End of Book Eighth. Recording by Bill Borst. Book Ninth of the Excursion by William Wordsworth. Discourse of the Wanderer and an Evening Visit to the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Ninth, Discourse of the Wanderer, and an Evening Visit to the Lake To every form of being is assigned, thus calmly spake the venerable sage, an active principle. Howe'er removed from sense and observation, it subsists in all things, in all natures. In the stars of azure heaven, the unenduring clouds, in flower and tree, in every pebbly stone that paves the brooks, the stationary rocks, the moving waters, and the invisible air. Whate'er exists hath properties that spread beyond itself, communicating good, a simple blessing, or with evil mixed. Spirit that knows no insulated spot, no chasm, no solitude. From link to link it circulates, the soul of all the worlds. This is the freedom of the universe. Unfolded still the more, more visible, the more we know, and yet is reverenced least, and least respected in the human mind, its most apparent home. The food of hope is meditated action. Robbed of this her sole support, she languishes and dies. We perish also, for we live by hope and by desire. We see by the glad light and breathe the sweet air of futurity. And so we live, or else we have no life. Tomorrow, nay, perchance this very hour, for every moment hath its own tomorrow, those blooming boys, whose hearts are almost sick with present triumph, will be sure to find a field before them freshened with the dew of other expectations, in which course their happy year spins round. The youth obeys a like glad impulse and so moves the man mid all his apprehensions, cares, and fears, or so he ought to move. Ah! why in age do we revert so fondly to the walks of childhood? 
but that there the soul discerns the dear memorial footsteps unimpaired of her own native vigor. Thence can hear reverberations, and a choral song commingling with the incense that ascends undaunted toward the imperishable heavens from her own lonely altar. Do not think that good and wise ever will be allowed, though strength decay, to breathe in such a state as shall divide them wholly from the stir of hopeful nature. Rightly it is said that man descends into the veil of years. Yet have I thought that we might also speak, and not presumptuously, I trust, of age, as of a final eminence. Though bare in aspect and forbidding, yet a point on which tis not impossible to sit in awful sovereignty. A place of power, a throne, that may be likened unto his, who in some placid day of summer looks down from a mountain top, say one of those high peaks that bound the vale where now we are, faint and diminished to the gazing eye, forest and field, and hill and dale appear, with all the shapes over their surface spread. But, while the gross and visible frame of things relinquishes its hold upon the sense, yea, almost on the mind herself, and seems all unsubstantialized, how loud the voice of waters with invigorated peal from the full river in the vale below, ascending! For on that superior height who sits, is disencumbered from the press of near obstructions, and is privileged to breathe in solitude above the host of ever-humming insects, mid thin air that suits not them. The murmur of the leaves many and idle visits not his ear. This he is freed from, and from thousand notes, not less unceasing, not less vain than these, by which the finer passages of sense are occupied, and the soul, that would incline to listen, is prevented or deterred. And may it not be hoped that, placed by age and like removal, tranquil though severe, we are not so removed for utter loss. But for some favour suited to our need, what more than that the severing should confer fresh power to commune with the invisible world, and hear the mighty stream of tendency uttering for elevation of our thought a clear sonorous voice, inaudible to the vast multitude whose doom it is to run the giddy round of vain delight, or fret and labour on the plain below. But if to such sublime ascent the hopes of man may rise as to a welcome close and termination of his mortal course, them only can such hope inspire whose minds have not been starved by absolute neglect, nor bodies crushed by unremitting toil, to whom kind nature therefore may afford proof of the sacred love she bears for all whose birthright reason therefore may ensure. For me, consulting what I feel within in times when most existence with herself is satisfied, I cannot but believe that, far as kindly nature hath free scope and reason's sway predominates, even so far, country, society, and time itself, that saps the individual's bodily frame, and lays the generations low in dust, do, by the Almighty Ruler's grace partake of one maternal spirit, bringing forth and cherishing with ever-constant love that tires not, nor betrays. Our life is turned out of her course, wherever man is made an offering or a sacrifice, a tool or implement, a passive thing employed as a brute mean, without acknowledgment of common right or interest in the end. Used or abused, as selfishness may prompt, Say, what can follow for a rational soul perverted thus, but weakness in all good, and strength in evil? Hence an after-call for chastisement, and custody, and bonds, and oft-times death, avenger of the past, and the sole guardian in whose hands we dare and trust the future, not for these sad issues was man created, but to obey the law of life and hope and action. And tis known that when we stand upon our native soil, unelbowed by such objects as oppress our active powers, those powers themselves become strong to subvert our noxious qualities. They sweep distemper from the busy day, and make the chalice of the big round year run o'er with gladness, whence the being moves in beauty through the world, and all who see bless him, rejoicing in his neighbourhood. Then, said the solitary, by what force of language shall a feeling heart express her sorrow for that multitude in whom we look for health from seeds 
that have been sown in sickness and for increase in a power that works but by extinction. On themselves they cannot lean, nor turn to their own hearts to know what they must do. Their wisdom is to look into the eyes of others, thence to be instructed what they must avoid. Or rather, let us say, how least observed, how with most quiet and most silent death, with the least taint and injury to the air, the oppressor breathes their human form divine, and their immortal soul may waste away. The sage rejoined, I thank you. You have spared my voice the utterance of a keen regret, a wide compassion which with you I share. When heretofore I placed before your sight a little one subjected to the arts of modern ingenuity, and made the senseless member of a vast machine serving as doth a spindle or a wheel, think not that pitying him I could forget the rustic boy who walks the fields untaught, the slave of ignorance, and oft of want and miserable hunger. Much too much of this unhappy lot in early youth we both have witnessed, lot which I myself shared, though in mild and merciful degree. Yet was the mind to hindrances exposed, through which I struggled, not without distress and sometimes injury, like a lamb enthralled mid thorns and brambles, or a bird that breaks through a strong net and mounts upon the wind, though with her plumes impaired. If they, whose souls should open while they range the richer fields of merry England, are obstructed less by indigence, their ignorance is not less, nor less to be deplored. For who can doubt that tens of thousands at this day exist, such as the boy you painted, lineal heirs of those who once were vassals of her soil, following its fortunes like the beasts or trees which it sustained? But no one takes delight in this oppression, none are proud of it. It bears no sounding name, nor ever bore. A standing grievance, an indigenous vice of every country under heaven. My thoughts were turned to evils that are new and chosen, a bondage lurking under shape of good, arts in themselves beneficent and kind, but all too fondly followed and too far, to victims which the merciful can see nor think that they are victims turned to wrongs by women who have children of their own, beheld without compassion, yea, with praise. I spake of mischief by the wise diffused with gladness, thinking that the more it spreads, the healthier, the securer we become delusion which a moment may destroy. Lastly, I mourn for those whom I had seen corrupted and cast down, on favoured ground, where circumstance and nature had combined to shelter innocence and cherish love. Who but for this intrusion would have lived, possessed of health and strength and peace of mind, thus would have lived or never have been born? Alas! What differs more than man from man? And whence that difference? whence but from himself. For see the universal race endowed with the same upright form. The sun is fixed, and the infinite magnificence of heaven fixed, within reach of every human eye. The sleepless ocean murmurs for all ears. The vernal field infuses fresh delight into all hearts. Throughout the world of sense, even as an object is sublime or fair, that object is laid open to the view without reserve or veil and as a power is salutary, or an influence sweet, are each and all enabled to perceive that power, that influence, by impartial law. Gifts nobler are vouchsafed alike to all. Reason, and with that reason, smiles and tears. Imagination, freedom in the will, conscience to guide and check, and death to be foretasted, immortality conceived by all, a blissful immortality to them whose holiness on earth shall make the spirit capable of heaven assured. Strange, then, nor less than monstrous might be deemed the failure if the Almighty to this point liberal and undistinguishing should hide the excellence of moral qualities from common understanding, leaving truth and virtue difficult, abstruse, and dark, hard to be won, and only by a few. Strange, should he deal herein with nice respects, and frustrate all the rest. Believe it not. The primal duties shine aloft, like stars. The charities that soothe and heal and bless are scattered at the feet of man, like flowers. The generous inclination, the just rule, kind wishes and good actions and pure thoughts. No mystery is here. Here is no boon for high, yet not for low. For proudly graced, 
yet not for meek of heart. The smoke ascends to heaven as lightly from the cottage hearth as from the haughtiest palace. He, whose soul ponders this true equality, may walk the fields of earth with gratitude and hope. Yet in that meditation will he find motive to sadder grief, as we have found, lamenting ancient virtues overthrown, and for the injustice grieving that hath made so wide a difference between man and man. Then let us rather fix our gladdened thoughts upon the brighter scene. How blessed that pair of blooming boys, whom we beheld even now, blessed in their several and their common lot! A few short hours of each returning day the thriving prisoners of their village school, and thence let loose to seek their pleasant homes or range the grassy lawn in vacancy, to breathe and to be happy, run and shout idle, but no delay, no harm, no loss. For every genial power of heaven and earth, through all the seasons of the changeful year, obsequiously doth take upon herself to labour for them, bringing each in turn the tribute of enjoyment, knowledge, health, beauty, or strength. Such privilege is theirs, granted alike in the outset of their course, to both. And if that partnership must cease, I grieve not. To the pastor here he turned. Much as I glory in that child of yours, repine not for his cottage comrade, whom belike no higher destiny awaits than the old hereditary wish fulfilled, the wish for liberty to live, content with what heaven grants, and die, in peace of mind, within the bosom of his native vale. At least, whatever fate the noon of life reserves for either, sure it is that both have been permitted to enjoy the dawn, whether regarded as a jocund time that in itself may terminate, or lead in course of nature to a sober eve. Both have been fairly dealt with. Looking back they will allow that justice has in them been shown, alike to body and to mind." He paused, as if revolving in his soul some weighty matter. Then, with fervent voice and an impassioned majesty, exclaimed, Oh, for the coming of that glorious time, when prizing knowledge as her noblest wealth and best protection this imperial realm, while she exacts allegiance, shall admit an obligation on her part to teach them who are born to serve her and obey. Binding herself by statute to secure for all the children whom her soil maintains the rudiments of letters, and inform the mind with moral and religious truth, both understood and practiced, so that none, however destitute, be left to droop by timely culture unsustained, or run into a wild disorder or be forced to drudge through a weary life without the help of intellectual implements and tools, a savage horde among the civilized, a servile band among the lordly free. This sacred rite the lisping babe proclaims to be inherent in him by heaven's will for the protection of his innocence, and the rude boy who having overpassed the sinless age by conscience is enrolled, yet mutinously knits his angry brow and lifts his wilful hand on mischief bent, or turns the godlike faculty of speech to impious use, by process indirect declares his due while he makes known his need. This sacred rite is fruitlessly announced, this universal plea in vain addressed, to the eyes and ears of parents who themselves did, in the time of their necessity, urge it in vain, and therefore, like a prayer that from the humblest floor ascends to heaven, it mounts to reach the state's parental ear, who, if indeed she own a mother's heart, and be not most unfeelingly devoid of gratitude to Providence, will grant the unquestionable good. Which England, safe from interference of external force, may grant at leisure, without risk incurred, that what in wisdom for herself she doth, others shall e'er be able to undo. Look! And behold, from Calp's sunburnt cliffs to the flat margin of the Baltic Sea, long reverenced titles cast away as weeds, laws overturned, and territory split like fields of ice rent by the polar wind, and forced to join in less obnoxious shapes, which, ere they gain consistence by a gust of the same breath, are shattered and destroyed. Meantime, the sovereignty of these fair isles remains entire and indivisible. And, if that ignorance were removed, which breeds within the compass of their several shores dark discontent, or loud commotion, each might still preserve the beautiful repose of heavenly bodies shining in their spheres. 
The discipline of slavery is unknown among us. Hence the more do we require the discipline of virtue. Order else cannot subsist, nor confidence, nor peace. Thus, duties rising out of good possessed and prudent caution needful to avert impending evil, equally require that the whole people should be taught and trained. So shall licentiousness and black resolve be rooted out, and virtuous habits take their place, and genuine piety descend like an inheritance from age to age. With such foundations laid, avaunt the fear of numbers crowded on their native soil, to the prevention of all healthful growth through mutual injury. Rather in the law of increase and the mandate from above rejoice, and ye have special cause for joy. For, as the element of air affords an easy passage to the industrious bees fraught with their burthens, and a way is smooth for those ordained to take their sounding flight from the thronged hive, and settle where they list in fresh abodes, their labor to renew, so the wide waters open to the power, the will, the instincts, and appointed needs of Britain, do invite her to cast off her swarms, and in succession send them forth, bound to establish new communities on every shore whose aspect favors hope or bold adventure, promising to skill and perseverance their deserved reward. Yes, he continued, kindling as he spake, change wide and deep and silently performed, this land shall witness, and as days roll on, earth's universal frame shall feel the effect, even till the smallest habitable rock, beaten by lonely billows, hear the songs of humanized society, and bloom with civil arts that shall breathe forth their fragrance, a grateful tribute to all ruling heaven. From culture, unexclusively bestowed on Albion's noble race in freedom born, expect these mighty issues. From the pains and faithful care of unambitious schools, instructing simple childhood's ready ear, thence look for these magnificent results, vast the circumference of hope. And ye are at its centre, British lawgivers. Ah! sleep not there in shame. Shall wisdom's voice from out the bosom of these troubled times repeat the dictates of her calmer mind, and shall the venerable halls ye fill refuse to echo the sublime decree? Trust not to partial care a general good. Transfer not to futurity a work of urgent need. Your country must complete her glorious destiny. Begin even now, now, when oppression like the Egyptian plague of darkness stretched o'er guilty Europe makes the brightness more conspicuous that invests the happy island where ye think and act. Now, when destruction is a prime pursuit, show to the wretched nations for what end the powers of civil polity were given." Abruptly here, but with a graceful air, the sage broke off. No sooner had he ceased than looking forth, the gentle lady said, "'Behold the shades of afternoon have fallen upon this flowery slope. And see, beyond, the silvery lake is streaked with placid blue, as if preparing for the peace of evening. How temptingly the landscape shines! The air breathes invitation. Easy is the walk to the lake's margin, where a boat lies moored under a sheltering tree. Upon this hint we rose together. All were pleased, but most the beauteous girl, whose cheek was flushed with joy light as a sunbeam glides along the hills. She vanished eager to impart the scheme to her loved brother and his shy compeer. Now was there bustle in the vicar's house and earnest preparation. Forth we went, and down the vale along the streamlet's edge pursued our way. A broken company, mute or conversing, single or in pairs. Thus having reached a bridge that overarched the hasty rivulet where it lay becalmed in a deep pool, by happy chance we saw a twofold image. On a grassy bank a snow-white ram, and in the crystal flood another and the same, most beautiful, on the green turf with his imperial front shaggy and bold, and wreathed horns superb, the breathing creature stood. As beautiful, beneath him, shewed his shadowy counterpart. Each had his glowing mountains, each his sky, and each seemed centre of his own fair world. Antipodes unconscious of each other, yet, in partition, with their several spheres blended in perfect stillness to our sight. Ah! what a pity were it to disperse, 
or to disturb so fair a spectacle, and yet a breath can do it. These few words the lady whispered, while we stood and gazed gathered together all in still delight, not without awe. Thence passing on, she said, in like low voice to my particular ear, I love to hear that eloquent old man pour forth his meditations, and descant on human life from infancy to age. How pure his spirit! In what vivid hues his mind gives back the various forms of things caught in their fairest, happiest attitude! While he is speaking, I have power to see even as he sees. But when his voice hath ceased, then, with a sigh, sometimes I feel, as now, that combinations so serene and bright cannot be lasting in a world like ours, whose highest beauty, beautiful as it is, like that reflected in yon quiet pool, seems but a fleeting sunbeam's gift, whose peace the sufferance only of a breath of air. More had she said, but sportive shouts were heard sent from the jocund hearts of those two boys, who, bearing each a basket on his arm, down the green field came tripping after us. With caution we embarked, and now the pair for prouder service was addressed, but each, wishful to leave an opening for my choice, dropped the light oar his eager hand had seized. Thanks given for that becoming courtesy, their place I took, and for a grateful office pregnant with recollections of the time when, on thy bosom, spacious Windermere, a youth, I practised this delightful art, tossed on the waves alone or mid a crew of joyous comrades. Soon as the reedy marge was cleared, I dipped with arms accordant oars free from obstruction and the boat advanced through crystal water smoothly as a hawk that, disentangled from the shady boughs of some thick wood, her place of covert, cleaves with correspondent wings the abyss of air. Observe, the vicar said, yon rocky isle with birch trees fringed. My hand shall guide the helm, while thitherward we shape our course, or while we seek that other on the western shore where the bare columns of those lofty firs, supporting gracefully a massy dome of sombre foliage, seem to imitate a Grecian temple rising from the deep. "'Turn where we may,' said I, "'we cannot err in this delicious region. Cultured slopes, wild tracts of forest ground, and scattered groves, and mountains bare, or clothed with ancient woods, surrounded us, and, as we held our way along the level of the glassy flood, they ceased not to surround us change of place from kindred features diversely combined, producing change of beauty ever new. Ah, that such beauty varying in the light of living nature cannot be portrayed by words nor by the pencil's silent skill, but is the property of him alone who hath beheld it, noted it with care, and in his mind recorded it with love. Suffice it, therefore, if the rural muse vouchsafe sweet influence while her poet speaks of trivial occupations well devised, and unsought pleasures springing up by chance, as if some friendly genius had ordained that, as the day thus far had been enriched by acquisition of sincere delight, the same should be continued to its close. One spirit animating old and young, a gypsy fire we kindled on the shore of the fair isle with birch trees fringed, and there merrily seated in a ring partook a choice repast served by our young companions with rival earnestness and kindred glee. Launched from our hands the smooth stone skimmed the lake. With shouts we raised the echoes. Stiller sounds the lovely girl supplied, a simple song whose low tones reached not to the distant rocks to be repeated thence, but gently sank into our hearts, and charmed the peaceful flood. Rapaciously we gathered flowery spoils from land and water, lilies of each hue, golden and white that float upon the waves and court the wind, and leaves of that shy plant her flowers were shed, the lily of the vale that loves the ground, and from the sun withholds her pensive beauty, from the breeze her sweets. Such product, and such pastime, did the place and season yield, but, as we re-embarked, leaving in quest of other scenes the shore of that wild spot, the solitary said, in a low voice, yet careless who might hear, The fire, that burns so brightly to our wish, where is it now, deserted on the beach, dying or dead? 
nor shall the fanning breeze revive its ashes. What care we for this, whose ends are gained? Behold an emblem here of one day's pleasure, and all mortal joys. And, in this unpremeditated slight of that which is no longer needed, see the common course of human gratitude. This plaintive note disturbed not the repose of the still evening. Right across the lake our pinnace moves. Then, coasting creek and bay, glades we behold, and into thickets peep, where couch the spotted deer, or raised our eyes to shaggy steeps on which the careless goat browsed by the side of dashing waterfalls. And thus the bark, meandering with the shore, pursued her voyage, till a natural pier of jutting rocks invited us to land. Alert to follow as the pastor led, we clomb a green hill's side, and as we clomb, the valley opening out her bosom, gave fair prospect, intercepted less and less, or the flat meadows and indented coast of the smooth lake, in compass seen. Far off, and yet conspicuous, stood the old church-tower, in majesty presiding over fields and habitations seemingly preserved from all intrusion of the restless world by rocks impassable and mountains huge. Soft heath this elevated spot supplied and choice of moss-clad stones whereon we couched or sate reclined, admiring quietly the general aspect of the scene, but each not seldom over-anxious to make known his own discoveries, or to favorite points directing notice, merely from a wish to impart a joy, imperfect while unshared. That rapturous moment never shall I forget when these particular interests were effaced from every mind, Already had the sun, sinking with less than ordinary state, attained his western bound. But rays of light, now suddenly diverging from the orb retired behind the mountain tops or veiled by the dense air, shot upwards to the crown of the blue firmament, aloft and wide, and multitudes of little floating clouds through their ethereal texture pierced, ere we, who saw, of change were conscious, had become vivid as fire clouds separately poised, innumerable multitude of forms scattered through half the circle of the sky, and giving back, and shedding each on each, with prodigal communion, the bright hues which from the unapparent fount of glory they had imbibed, and ceased not to receive. That which the heavens displayed, the liquid deep repeated, but with unity sublime. While from the grassy mountain's open side we gazed, in silence hushed, with eyes intent on the refulgent spectacle, diffused through earth, sky, water, and all visible space, the priest in holy transport thus exclaimed, Eternal Spirit, Universal God, power inaccessible to human thought, save by degrees and steps which thou hast deigned to furnish, for this effluence of thyself to the infirmity of mortal sense vouchsafed, this local transitory type of thy paternal splendors, and the pomp of those who fill thy courts in highest heaven, the radiant cherubim, accept the thanks which we, thy humble creatures, here convened, presume to offer, we, who, from the breast of the frail earth, permitted to behold the faint reflections only of thy face, are yet exalted, and in soul adore, such as they are who in thy presence stand unsullied, incorruptible, and drink imperishable majesty streamed forth from thy imperial throne, the elect of earth shall be, divested at the appointed hour of all dishonor, cleansed from mortal stain. Accomplish, then, their number, and conclude time's weary course, or, if, by thy decree, the consummation that will come by stealth be yet far distant, let thy word prevail, O oh, let thy word prevail, to take away the sting of human nature. Spread the law, as it is written in thy holy book, throughout all lands. Let every nation hear the high behest, and every heart obey. Both for the love of purity, and hope which it affords, to such as do thy will, and persevere in good, that they shall rise to have a nearer view of thee in heaven. Father of good, this prayer in bounty grant, in mercy grant it, to thy wretched sons. Then, nor till then, shall persecution cease, and cruel wars expire. The way is marked, the guide appointed, and the ransom paid. Alas! the nations who of yore received these tidings, and in Christian temples meet the sacred truth to knowledge, linger still, 
preferring bonds and darkness to a state of holy freedom, by redeeming love proper to all, while yet on earth detained. So fare the many, and the thoughtful few who in the anguish of their souls bewail this dire perverseness, cannot choose but ask, Shall it endure? Shall enmity and strife, falsehood and guile, be left to sow their seed, and the kind never perish? Is the hope fallacious, or shall righteousness obtain a peaceable dominion, wide as earth, and ne'er to fail? Shall that blessed day arrive when they, whose choice or lot it is to dwell in crowded cities, without fear shall live studious of mutual benefit? And he, whom morn awakens among dews and flowers of every clime, to till the lonely field, be happy in himself? The law of faith, working through love, such conquest shall it gain, such triumph over sin and guilt achieve? Almighty Lord, thy further grace impart, and with that help the wonder shall be seen fulfilled, the hope accomplished, and thy praise be sung with transport and unceasing joy. Once, and with mild demeanour as he spake on us, the venerable pastor turned his beaming eye that had been raised to heaven. Once, while the name Jehovah was a sound within the circuit of this sea-girt isle, unheard, the savage nations bowed the head to God's delighting in remorseless deeds. Gods which themselves had fashioned to promote ill purposes and flatter foul desires. Then, in the bosom of yon mountain cove, to those inventions of corrupted man mysterious rites were solemnized, and there, amid impending rocks and gloomy woods, of those terrific idols, some received such dismal service, that the loudest voice of the swollen cataracts, which now are heard soft murmuring, was too weak to overcome, though aided by wild winds, the groans and shrieks of human victims, offered up to appease or to propitiate. And, if living eyes had visionary faculties to see the thing that hath been as the thing that is, aghast we might behold this crystal mirror be dimmed with smoke, in wreaths voluminous, flung from the body of devouring fires, to Tyrannus erected on the heights by priestly hands, for sacrifice performed exultingly, in view of open day and full assemblage of a barbarous host, or to Andate's female power who gave, for so they fancied, glorious victory. A few rude monuments of mountain stones survive, all else is swept away. How bright the appearances of things! From such how changed the existing worship! And with those compared the worshippers how innocent and blessed! So wide the difference a willing mind might almost think at this affecting hour, that paradise, the lost abode of man, was raised again, and to a happy few in its original beauty, here restored. Whence but from thee, the true and only God, and from the faith derived through him who bled upon the cross, this marvellous advance of good from evil? As if one extreme were left, the other gained. O ye, who come to kneel devoutly in yon reverend pile, called to such office by the peaceful sound of Sabbath bells, and ye, who sleep in earth all cares forgotten round its hallowed walls, for you, in presence of this little band gathered together on the green hillside, your pastor is emboldened to prefer vocal thanksgivings to the Eternal King, whose love, whose counsel, whose commands, have made your very poorest rich in peace of thought and in good works, and him, who is endowed with scantiest knowledge, master of all truth, which the salvation of his soul requires. Conscious of that abundant favour showered on you, the children of my humble care, and this dear land, our country, while on earth we sojourn, have I lifted up my soul, joy giving voice to fervent gratitude. These barren rocks, your stern inheritance, these fertile fields that recompense your pains, the shadowy vale, the sunny mountain-top, woods waving in the wind their lofty heads, or hushed, the roaring waters and the still. They see the offering of my lifted hands, they hear my lips present their sacrifice, they know if I be silent, mourn, or even. For, though in whispers speaking, the full heart will find a vent, and thought is praise to him, audible praise to thee, omniscient mind, from whom all gifts descend, 
all blessings flow. This vesper service closed without delay from that exalted station to the plain descending, we pursued our homeward course, in mute composure, o'er the shadowy lake, under a faded sky. No trace remained of those celestial splendors, gray the vault, pure cloudless ether, and the star of eve was wanting, but inferior lights appeared faintly too faint almost for sight, and some above the darkened hills stood boldly forth in twinkling lustre, ere the boat attained her mooring-place, where, to the sheltering tree, our youthful voyagers bound fast her prow, with prompt yet careful hands. This done, we paced the dewy fields, but ere the vicar's door was reached, the solitary checked his steps, then intermingling thanks on each bestowed a farewell salutation, and, the like receiving, took the slender path that leads to the one cottage in the lonely dell but turned not without welcome promise made that he would share the pleasures and pursuits of yet another summer's day, not loath to wander with us through the fertile vales and o'er the mountain wastes. "'Another sun,' said he, "'shall shine upon us ere we